Hello, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear audience. Uh, I'm pleased to greet you at the very first and hopefully not the last Working Context Symposium of Central European Photography. Uh, as we all know, and unfortunately know it too well, that this last year was very cruel to us. Uh, it kept us from being able to meet at festivals, to welcome each other at schools, and to discuss important issues in person. Um, we decided last year to organize a symposium dedicated to Central European photography because, influenced by many recent events, we felt the need to come together and share our thoughts, ambitions, and even fears regarding the prospects of our beloved medium in our beloved region. We are convinced that photography is a medium that's not only influenced by societal, political, economical, or cultural context, it is one of those art forms that are able to make immediate and lasting change. Therefore, its actors, so to say, have great responsibility in looking at and evaluating carefully what this context represents to counteract uniformity and to protect local values. Uh, let me introduce the organizing committee, Judith Geller, curator of Robert Kappa Contemporary Photography Center, George Petrani, art historian, head of the uh, uh, Contemporary Art Collection of the Museum of Fine Arts, Hungarian National Gallery. They were responsible for overseeing the program of the symposium. Gábor Máté, head of the Photography BA program at MOME, and myself, Gábor Arion Kudász, head of the Photography MA program at MOME, uh, we curated an accompanying exhibition which showcases 12 talented young Hungarian photographers, some of them still completing their studies, but all of them MOME graduates. Their work, from one perspective, illustrate the intended focus of the symposium. From another viewpoint, they are affected by or suffer from and by, by our belief tackle the very challenges we are here to discuss. Let me briefly introduce the artists because this is kind of their uh, uh, online op exhibition opening as well. Uh, what you can find and visit from now uh, on, the, on the working context uh, website. So let me introduce the artist. Antal Banhegyesi, his series Orthodoxia investigates the religious political merger driving the current Romanian church building boom. Gabor Baksha, monodirectional dialogue is the photographic comparison of the visual language used by those in power and those outside of it. I, sorry, and those outside of it. Daniel Solai's Stadtluft deals with language in a different way. He compares the ver verbal framing of Jews in pre-war era with the language used to discriminate against urban pigeons in present-day Vienna. Roxa Juhas, in her eerie series Unheimlich, confronts her German and Hungarian identities, ornamented by turn-of-the-century architecture and socialist lifestyle elements. In the poetic collection, there is nothing new under the sun. Kata Gable formulates self-containing intellectual constructs, inspired by the anxiety and mis mistrust towards the hegemony of Western capitalism. Kincső Bebe resorts to theatrical or even forensic reenactments in three colors I know in this world. That's the uh, title of the series and also the uh, first line of the Romanian anthem. She does this in order to understand the insurmountable trench between post and pre-communism generations in her Romanian family. Fanny Mali jumps headfirst into a different trench, one that divides the two extremes of Hungarian society, the poorest, Roma youth and the well-off end of the scale, herself in a remorseful, unsettling and dis divisive uh, uh, cross-dressing experiment, if you want to call it. The work is titled The Wheat Must Ripen. Hannah Riedling appears in the funny and poignant Color TV's Queen Bed's Exotic Dreams series, 
that on, incorporates a documentary catalog of the last 90s hotels around Hungary and her own coming of age monodrama. Zsófia Sivák takes us on a journey around the small village pubs in her home county. These images may seem unimportant. Were they not to record the last days of such long-lived establishments? Our prices are in forints, is the title. Kura Sun Yuting makes a straightforward observation of Chinese singers studying in a Hungarian jewelry box little town. But looking at the images, we cannot disregard the current debate around the growing Chinese, Chinese influence in Hungarian higher education. András Tordulci goes where a photographer in Hungary should not. For two years now, he followed the everydays of COVID-19 hospital vaccination sites to portray the state of our healthcare system. Finally, in Fairyland, a work filled with empathy, András Túrós borrows the title for, the, for his project from a pre-World War I poet, um, Adi Endre, implying that so little has changed here if we take a closer look. Only a century has passed. You can visit the online exhibition by clicking on the exhibition arrow on the landing page of the symposium's website. And let me mention Tima Padri, our new manager at the photography department, whose hard work is behind every detail of the symposium. The symposium is hosted by the Moholina University of Art and Design Budapest, MOME for short. It is organized by the Department of Photography. We appreciate the valuable help and contribution of our respected colleagues who made this event possible. And now let me give the word to Zsolt Pepányi to introduce the program for the following two days. I also would like to welcome everybody in this, this event and I also would like to thank for all of the organizers for their enormous work. And I just wanted to comment a little bit the title of the act of, the, of our symposium and also the structure of, of it. First of all, it was really an exciting period what we went through in the last half year by discussing the different uh, possibilities and different approaches <clears throat> how to organize this event. And one of the main question for us was how to identify ourselves, how to be more precise when we would like to speak about East European photography. And this is how we came to such a title like working context because we came to the solution that every artwork, what we can, um, what we, we do see, and also this exhibition is also about this, cannot be divided from the context it was born in. And um, how to identify it, how to describe it, this was our main question. And this is the reason how we followed up our discussion that we, we came to this, this point that there is three different approaches and three different segments if we would like to speak about this topic. And of course, first is the past, because if we would like to identify how we came here and what we are doing now, this is one of the most interesting thing to speak about, the, speak about the heritage. And this is why we selected for the first afternoon this basic uh, 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 topic, also to present some, some, uh, uh, some earlier projects and, and researches, what, what is about uh, the past of East European photography. And tomorrow we begin the day with, with another discussion of the present because, because we were thinking that there are also a lot of recent projects and also recent problems in what we are sharing like specialists in, you know, of, of photography. And this is very important to discuss this status quo, what we are, here, what, uh, what we are in and to, 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 to find categories and find different opinions about, uh, uh, about how things are. And of course, the third section was about the vision, the future, which is also about the education. And this is how this whole symposium comes to one, one unit, if I can say. And this is how uh, it becomes very important that this is organized by the MOME University and its Department of Photography. And I think that we will have a very exciting three uh, two days with these three different uh, different uh, uh, panels, and uh, and I really hope that on the end of the days and on the end of the panels we will get closer to our topics. And I think that I'm not alone, who is very excited to hear more about the presentation. So I would like to pass back the word to 
Orion and to start the past analysis of East European photography. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I will be the host today. Tomorrow, uh, Judith and 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 Schult will take this uh, uh, role. I uh, hope I will be uh, of help. Our first uh, speaker tonight uh, is Michaela Nagidayova, if I pronounce her name correctly, who will talk uh, about comprehending our past, the remnants of socialism, transgenerational connection to the land, and the post-socialist identity. Um, I would like to ask the audience if uh, you have questions, please go to our uh, YouTube channel and, and you can uh, comment there and uh, ask questions there and we will forward your questions to the speaker at the end. Uh, every talk is 25 minutes and there is a five, six, ten minute question and answer so at the end. And uh, at the end of today's uh, section, session, we are going to have a round table. So uh, if your questions come a little bit late, that's also correct, because we can, uh, we can uh, ask those questions at the end of the session. So Michaela, please uh, start your presentation. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really exciting to be here and uh, the whole program uh, program sounds super amazing. Uh, I hope you can see my screen right now. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. <laughs> so uh, basically, I would like to I titled my presentation as comprehending our past because uh, that's something that I am still trying to do as a photographer. And as a uh, person, individual born uh, in the 90s, uh, I didn't form a presentation about, let's say, the former Central Eastern European photography, uh, but I took it from a more personal point of view, uh, because as I was told during my MA, a lot of times uh, personal is often very political as well. Uh, so I will try to explore, um, let's say, past and present political context, especially within Slovakia, where I am based, through this presentation. Uh, but first, I would like to read out this quote from Susanna Henty uh, that goes like this. The past cannot be examined without first interrogating its implications today. The present exists codependently with the past and the future, past before that and futures to come. And we are obsessed with examining and redefining traumatic experiences to cope, resist, and recover. And I thought this quote, uh, not only it worked really well with the projects and research that I'm exploring, but also I felt that for some reason I could connect it to the topics of this symposium as well. So I separated it into three chapters, uh, as it was mentioned, and I would try to cover a little bit of in each chapter. Um, and I created this visual for <laughs> this symposium uh, because it's, it's basically a combination of two images. And then the first image is a black and white photograph taken by my grandfather, uh, taken from our family archive, which instantly uh, brought me and allowed me to glimpse into the past that I obviously wasn't a part of. And uh, the image on top is an image that I took of him in 2020 by a, a decaying swimming pool in central Slovakia where he grew up. And uh, the reason I wanted to start with, with these images is because uh, I found out last summer that my grandfather was quite the photographer in, in, his, uh, in his time. And he was documenting a lot of events such as for himself, most of all, really for himself and for his family. And uh, this photograph is, for example, from uh, the times of Velvet Revolution. Even though it says 1968, it was photographed in uh, 1989, but uh, it was, I think, a wall by one school that he photographed where they were reminding people of 1968 when uh, obviously Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. And uh, so I thought it would be a nice entry pathway to, to the past. Um, and so uh, discovering this archive led me to discover even a bigger archive and I somehow started archiving the archive and reworking the archive of my family. Um, because 
all of these photographs that I'm showing you right now basically show my parents or my grandparents vacationing in Slovakia uh, during socialism, mostly between 1968 and uh, 1989. And all of these images are images that until last summer to me, I, they were unknown, I have never seen them. And it really got me thinking how I could start working with these images as a, as a photographer as well. And uh, that's where an idea for my project kind of came along. Um, for example, this photograph, it shows my grandfather here with the thick black glasses and my mother underneath. There were, uh, I think it was a march on the day of, on the day of work in Bratislava uh, sometime in 1980s. And this is a photograph, uh, super grainy, but I still really, really love it and connect to it so much. It's a photograph of my mother um, who was protesting quite a lot during the Velvet Revolution, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, my grandfather took it again. And she stands by a poster that says, abolish the lawful monopoly of communist uh, party on power. And the poster next to it here uh, says free elections. And all of this, seeing all of these images, they got me really thinking because there is so much that I don't know about my country's history. There is so much that I haven't been taught at school. Um, so I almost wanted to try to start examining it myself, which is how I started this project. So I moved uh, back to Slovakia from London and uh, I felt that I was very alienated from my own homeland for a very long time and I wanted to reconnect myself with it. So I started having conversations with my family and my grandparents and parents and um, they told me a couple of times that they still have this weird feeling, this chill, whenever they're about to cross the borders, they feel like they're, someone's going to check them, they feel like fugitives and this feeling had stayed with them since socialism. Uh, but instead of, for me, uh, focusing specifically on the borders, I wanted to focus on places within Slovakia, places where my parents were seeking a sanctuary or an escape throughout the past system. So I started documenting, <laughs> in a way, the remnants of socialism, but also trying to look forward and, and past the system. And for example, this image on the right, uh, on, the, on the building, it's written, property of the state. And uh, there is just a parallel image uh, with the empty box of matches with the EU sign that I found on the grass, which I thought could be an interesting metaphor. Um, this is where it was located uh, in the Middle Eastern part of Slovakia, if you would be interested going to look at the building. Um, but to, to also bring up another quote from Sabine Bors from this really wonderful essay, uh, for many Easterners, which I think it applies to Central Europe as well, the present day political contexts are systematically erasing their identity, renewing their loss of the past. Nostalgia is their form of resistance against the social contradictions brought by geopolitical and economic fractures. And I think this erasing of identity had really stayed with me because um, ever since I was quite young, I wanted to leave the country either for work or for studies. I really didn't see myself in Slovakia at all. I didn't see, see my future there. And uh, somehow uh, after living almost for six years in the UK, I started realizing that I really want to know more about the political and historical context uh, that I was really staying away from. And so this really has led me to start this project where I not only try to document the remnants of socialism, but I'm really trying to reconnect with uh, my native environment and try to, to an extent, also comprehend it and comprehend my own, let's say, post-socialist identity as a Slovak woman. Um, and so the core of the work, in a way, are childhood memories, which are always kind of bringing the project into the past, I feel. And I tried exploring the historical and political climate of Slovakia through our completely different youthhoods experienced against the backdrop of socialism and democracy. So, for example, this is a lake where my father would go to almost every summer when they either couldn't afford to travel abroad or they just weren't allowed. They, and they would uh, spend a lot of time here. And uh, my brother kindly <laughs> said that he would come with me for this trip, which not only reconnected our relationship, but also our relationship to this place. So we would write down, um, because each of these archival images had a location at the back. So we would write down all of these location and we like 
mostly myself, I planned a, a trip within Slovakia and I would go to these locations, see the changes, if there were any changes and uh, try, to, try to document them. Um, which brings me to another thing that, another one of the inspiration behind, behind trying, trying out and starting out this project was how my parents were often telling me about illegally tuning into Radio Free Europe or my mother apparently illegally watching Austrian TV channels in Bratislava uh, or how they couldn't cross the border with Austria and visit Vienna as we have been doing since I was born. Um, so all these stories of theirs really bring me back to times that I simply cannot know. Um, but that's why I wanted this project to, um, to serve as a map of utopias, which will also examine the location within Slovakia that they found their escape in. Uh, but also which will allow me to reconnect with the country and go to places that are ingrained in my in my in my mind as my childhood sites too so for example this is one of them <laughs> and this one and so um, the transgenerational connection in the project was very interesting because i found that i really wanted to i really wanted to discover and find out how what was the identity of my of my parents and my grandparents, how they felt about their Slovakness and how they felt about the, the historical context. And uh, I, I wanted to link it with mine as I, I think, uh, especially when I was growing up, I had a very, very complex relationship with, uh, with Slovakia. And I was almost ashamed of, of being Slovak, especially uh, living in the West. Uh, where I think some parts of, of, let's say, Central or Eastern Europe are still portrayed through a very uh, stereotypical lens in some parts, of course. Uh, but through reconnecting with my roots and analyzing my relationship with the native land that I left when I was young, uh, this project is trying to portray a transgenerational connection to our landscape and environment and understand the remnants of socialism that still continue to be present within the country. And so basically um, all of the archival images have kind of inspired me to go and, and revisit all these places and really find out uh, what has happened to them. And uh, some of these places are obviously left in a terrible shape and no one's really trying to take care of them. Some of these places have, have evolved and shifted completely. There were so many valleys that I visited that became tourist hotspots, you know, with uh, investors putting so much money in them to build new hotels and spas and, and, and whatever. Um, yeah. Right. And, uh, this is, uh, uh, this, basically this was photographed in my grandpa grandfather's, uh, flat. And I found this archival image there and it's my great grandfather here and my uncle standing in front of Lenin's head. Uh, and, uh, I just thought I would, I would, uh, include this little, uh, archival image here into the presentation because this is this is the flat and it was very uh, a space that in completely it was like a time machine it has completely brought me back into the past even though I have not experienced uh, anything from what my parents or my grandparents have experienced but this flat is a is a collection of our uh, family archives a collection of uh, you know very old photography book or art books or uh, it just preserves so many, it, to me, it seemed like it preserves so many memories and traditions and, and past systems. And that's also why I wanted to include it into the project because the feeling of the past is really palpable in there. And uh, it was just a very intriguing place to, to see. And I've never been there before until last summer. So uh, yeah, my, my grandfather absolutely loves going there alone. It's his little temple and uh, he has not changed the thing in this flat which I also find uh, quite beautiful but at the same time I don't understand it but he hasn't changed anything in this space for 30 years um, because 30 years ago his mother passed away there and uh, he just didn't really feel like changing anything so it's it's a constant reminder of that past. And so that brings me to the post-socialist identity or the last chapter and uh, really want me to pose questions such as where are we now 
where is Central Europe heading and how can photography assist throughout this process? And I feel that um, there are so many beautiful personal and intimate stories coming out of Central European uh, photography scene. I cannot wait to check out the exhibition you've put on. And I think those are, as I said, to me, personal is also very political. And I think those are the very amazing, uh, beautiful stories that should be definitely highlighted. Um, but to continue with this, this is not necessarily a post-socialist identity poster. Uh, this is a very much socialist identity. It's again, my great grandfather. And I made this collage when I found his passport, which I have no idea how he managed to keep. Uh, because as far as I know, uh, they had to obviously give them back, but he managed to keep his passport. And so I created this, uh, like, let's say a socialist identity out of his photo in his passport and his own passport. And uh, this is me in his office space, uh, which is a, in my way, uh, in my view, a very unsuccessful self-portrait, but I really wanted to include it in, uh, in this presentation. Uh, and since I don't, feel that I'm knowledgeable enough to explain uh, much about the post-socialist identity. I am just going to leave it to a writer, a Romanian writer, uh, Petrica Mogos, which hope I didn't butcher the name. Uh, post-socialism was marked not just by its subject's quest for a lost identity, rather under the guiding principles of the market, post-socialist subjects became part of the self-absorbed enterprise of finding and recreating themselves insofar as the Eastern European psyche has maintained a continual struggle with any sense of self. Onto the ruins of utopia, the production of subjectivity emerged within a new realm, one dominated by the imaginary of consumption. On one hand, neoliberal capitalism engaged in the production of post-socialist subject as a consumer. This process of subjectification based on desire and rebranded identity was induced by capitalism's tools through which post-socialism was colonized controlling the means of desire and harnessing the unconscious realm. Sorry, that was really long, <laughs> but uh, yes. Um, so uh, to continue about Central European photography, I put together, I don't know if this is interesting to you, but I put together a list of different resources uh, based in Central Europe, Eastern Europe. And I think these are amazing resources, either galleries, festivals, initiatives that are really trying to document different movements uh, happening throughout Central and Eastern Europe, uh, either protests or the transformation that these regions are going through right now, uh, or their grants or their just very, very interesting initiatives that are trying to highlight and promote, promote voices of, let's say, emerging photographers or photographers overall. Um, some that I have included are uh, also uh, international resources, but they very much are engaged with Central and Eastern Europe from what I have noticed. And, uh, but mostly I try to uh, actually include a lot of resources from uh, the Visegrad region. Uh, so obviously Hungary, Czech Republic, um, Slovakia and Poland. Uh, and I would like to just highlight one initiative that I'm a part of, which is called In Conversation With here. Uh, terrible name, don't name anything like that. Everything is called In Conversation With. So anyway, we need, we need a rebrand. Uh, but it's a, it's a collaboration that I'm, uh, that I'm doing with my Russian friend who is based in the Middle East. And we created this platform for visual conversations, uh, just to have fun, to be honest, with photographers. But from 2021, we're really starting to focus more and more on Central Europe, uh, Southeast Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Middle East and North Africa, as she's based in the Emirates. Um, so we're trying to get funding right now to create some cool publications and so on. And uh, that was me. And that's my grandmother in the landscape nearby her house to finish off the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michaela. It was a very yeah. interesting, <laughs> interesting <hope> so. <laughs> uh, presentation. I wrote uh, uh, a list of questions. I don't know if five minutes is enough for no. that. Um, <laughs> first, I would like to ask our uh, our uh, 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 guests here in the uh, in the Zoom if you would like to ask a question to Michaela. 
Of course, we will, but maybe I just start on you and then we will. Okay. You see so what you don't ask. I would like to. I would like to connect to your last last slide or last not the last slide but the last thing that you mentioned uh, this collection which is a very interesting um, uh, way of thinking about uh, um, a career or how you are how you are uh, uh, looking at yourself working and my question uh, is that did did your western as i understood you 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 you, you lived uh, in England, right? Uh, so did it affect or did it change the way how you look at uh, or how you approach a career in photography? Yeah, I think... Did it I, make you more effective, actually? That's my question. I think, I think, I think absolutely. When I, I, uh, I graduated in 2019 from an MA in documentary photography in, uh, at LCC, actually, in London, and uh, when I started the MA there, um, I didn't want to do anything related to Slovakia photographically because I felt that the environment uh, was, to me back in the time, uh, uninspiring, which is really bad to say, but I'm just being very blunt and honest. Uh, and then I started the MA and I saw how many Western photographers, not that it's bad, are flocking Central and Eastern Europe, mostly Eastern Europe, mostly Ukraine and Russia, Lithuania, you know, all these different countries. And I saw all of those projects and I was like, oh wait, but you know, I could do something like that, but I could do something like that. And, but there was still so much, I think I was just very uh, frightened about making any work at home. So this is still very un ongoing. It's just something that I patched up uh, since the la since last year. Uh, but it has definitely shifted my way of thinking. And this was made after my MA. Basically during my MA, I wasn't, I was focusing more on our family history in relation to something completely different than really Slovakia itself and my relationship to Slovakia. But uh, it has definitely helped me to, to transform my relationship to my, to my own country, to be honest, living in the West. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joyce? Or you did, you did. You can one. see you did hands in the end. Have you decided to stay in Slovakia or will you go back or go somewhere else in Europe? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, uh, it is still very, it is still very complex. Uh, I mean, I think everywhere in Central and Eastern Europe right now, this, the political situations are very, very complicated. Uh, the same is in Slovakia, of course. Uh, so I think right now I'm there, I'm seeing how long I will last. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to connect more with the creative uh, community and industry there because I think there are so many an interesting and amazing events happening in, in Bratislava or Košice or all, overall in Slovakia as well. Uh, but I think I would still like to undergo a residency somewhere else once in a while or, or, or move somewhere once in a while, but uh, I don't know where that will be. <laughs> I'm wondering that um, it's very interesting for your point of view that you have uh, made your study in, uh, in the United States that um, that is it not an expectations towards East European East Europeans to to somehow reflect on the uh, on the remnants of socialism don't you think that that just because that you were born here so everybody is expecting something something to show of of of, of this past what you what you uh, what you are living in and so I'm, i was very happy to hear your presentation as i see that you are rather young and uh, and i see that your point of view what you also mentioned with this transgenerational connection can be different from the from the earlier ones it was not a question mark on the end of my sentence i just wonder if uh, if uh, if you have felt this expectation, uh, yeah, I, I think I think I did, I think I did. I think uh, it's a very popular, almost uh, fetishized aesthetic in the in the West. It's a it's a very uh, because there is there is this image of 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 the East, you know, that uh, many uh, Western photographers are often perpetuating, uh, and I think. I think I think to an extent I did have it in my brain when I was when I was making this project. I was trying to a little bit steer clear from it, but of course there are some images where it's it's just there uh, and it's very visible. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, I still think it's uh, it's slightly. I think it's slightly different still when a when a local person is referring to his or her environment. Um, so yes. So so basically, our problem here in the conference, I think, for many of us, is the same. That so if we would define ourselves like post-socialist identity, whatever. So the so the general solution should be that we should somehow reflect on the past, maybe, right? I believe personally that it is very, very important to reflect on the past and include it in uh, the contemporary discourse and related uh, to uh, to our contemporary issues. But at the same time, I think it's very important to <laughs> attempt to learn from it and 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 move forward once and for all as well. I don't think it's it's uh, even though I did that with this project, I don't think it's very uh, productive to do it over and over and over again. I think it's also important to move move on. If there are other questions, I think we have time maybe for one or two less questions. Okay, uh, I have one. <laughs> okay. Um, is that I looked at when I looked at your website, I, I, I saw, uh, 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 for example, the Greek connection, uh, the project uh, about your uh, Greek uh, heritage. Um, I, I had the, I had this feeling that all, in all of your projects there is that kind of uh, sadness and nostalgia that you. Uh, that you uh, referred to in the beginning of your of your of your presentation, and I was wondering uh, that uh, does it come from you? So does it does it is it your portrait, or or is it uh, embedded in this mindset that we are sitting here, that we are uh, experiencing in 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 the uh, 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 behind the iron curtain? Right. Um, that's a that's a very a very good question. Uh, I think it's uh, it, it is kind of both, and I think it's also uh, my family. Uh, with the Greek project, I uh, it was uh, it was basically a taboo in our family that uh, we never talked about that my grandmother is a. Uh, uh, she is from a minority in Northern Greece. She's uh, Slavo Macedonian, and uh, she had to um, escape to former Czechoslovakia during the Greek Civil War that happened there. And it was it was a taboo that uh, we started exploring together as a, as a healing process for her, uh, because she never uh, she never really talked about it. She never really discussed it with uh, with any of us. Those projects are still very, very much ongoing as well, uh, because it is very emotionally draining, even even for myself to to be doing them. Uh, so I don't I think it's even more for her because I dragged her into it. Uh, and I think I think that's why I think it's a combination of, of all of that, because and I think that's where also the transgenerational connection comes in. As, and it's really important is that I just really like um, exploring these things that in a way have been uh, to an extent forgotten in the past, but to also bring them up to our contemporary issues and, and discourse. So I don't know if I'm answering your question this way, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a combination of all these three elements of myself, my family, and I think the place where I was, where I'm from. Yeah, of course, <laughs> your answer is the good answer. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, we, or after our time with one minute, but if there is a there is a, a question, I, I don't want to stop it from being asked. Okay, there's no no more questions. I'm pretty sure that later at the end of the session there will be more. So um, thank you, Michaela. And now I would like to uh, uh, continue uh, uh, with Susanna Lapitkova, uh, who's uh, 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 the title of her presentation is Advantage, Disadvantage, Just a Point of View. Uh, Susanna, if you are here. Uh, yes, can you hear yes. me? Yes, uh, hear you. you cannot see me because it doesn't allow me to start the video. 
it says you cannot start. Okay, now I'm I should mm -hmm. be allowed to start the video. Yes. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> so the next thing I will try to do is to share my screen. <laughs> so um, let me start with saying that uh, I'm very excited and curious at the same time to be the part of this symposium. Uh, because for me, it actually uh, de defines uh, two uh, relative concepts. One relative concept is uh, the concept of Central Europe. And uh, because uh, obviously, uh, if you travel, uh, travel across Europe, uh, you can find uh, different notions of, of uh, what Central Europe is. Uh, we can go as far as Scotland. Uh, by the way, uh, if we include all the all the islands uh, that belong to Europe, then we end up in Scotland as in the center of Europe. But of course, we don't want to go there, uh, go that far. If we stay on the continent, uh, then uh, I will name uh, the countries which are usually uh, usually considered uh, uh, among Central European countries, which is uh, given by alphabet alphabetical order, it's uh, Austria, Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Liechtenstein even, surprising for me, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, Switzerland, also might be surprising. Then uh, we come to some historical uh, context and we can name Croatia, Romania, Ukraine, uh, which are sometimes considered to be Central Europe uh, just because, uh, because of their history, maybe unwanted history, being part of the uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, actually uh, makes them uh, uh, or rank them among the countries which might uh, be named as Central European. Then we can uh, come up to the concept of uh, Middle Europa uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and then uh, that gives us Baltic countries as, as a German vision of uh, influence uh, when Germany built their uh, idea of hegemony. Um, might be surprising for you, for me it was. And uh, coming from the Czechoslovakian background, uh, um, I shouldn't uh, shouldn't forget about Kundera, uh, Milan Kundera, the the, the writer, uh, who uh, also built up a concept of Central Europe with uh, kind of um, how shall I say it? Uh, it, it was kind of a bitter definition by him uh, because uh, he defined it as uh, the region which was uh, historically actually belonged to the West but it was uh, kidnapped by Russia, uh, which tried to apply uh, its own Russian own uh, logic of history. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, this logic uh, wasn't really justified by, by the history of this uh, Central European countries. Uh, so uh, when we... Uh, I believe that uh, we listening uh, or listening to this symposium, we understand what he, what Kundera meant. Uh, but the question, if, the question is if that makes us uh, Central Europeans in a way. Uh, by the way, the image, uh, I hope you can see that uh, it's by Slovak photographer Ladislav Bielik. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a documentary series, uh, obviously taken in August 1968. Uh, during the, the Russian occupation. And this image uh, uh, actually was stolen uh, by a German photographer uh, who brought it to Western Germany and uh, claimed it to be his work. And there was, of course, uh, after 1989, there was a big, uh, there was a long process uh, of, um, uh, by the family of Vladislav Bielik uh, to, uh, to get the copyrights for this image. So finally, uh, they succeeded. Um, so uh, starting with this, uh, uh, with this discourse into the, uh, into the idea of Central Europe, uh, I, I, will, I decided to stick to one. 
uh, which for me works more or less uh, at the moment. And that's, that's the idea of the Visegrad group, uh, which uh, is very often uh, linked to the concept of Central Europe and uh, um, more or less successfully is also gaining, uh, gaining uh, some recognition as a cultural and politically powerful uh, group of countries. So uh, uh, if, we, uh, if we consider then this region, which I uh, assume also the organizers of the symposium consider to be the, uh, uh, the region we should speak about, uh, then uh, I have to I have to say that uh, when uh, what I see as a connecting uh, thing uh, within this uh, these countries, uh, it's mostly uh, it's mostly our uh, our past that we when we recall our uh, childhood memories, uh, they are astonishingly uh, uh, astonishingly very common and. Uh, uh, very often uh, marked by by some kind of absurdity uh, from the socialist era uh, and some romantic touch free of commercialism as well. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, also what I think uh, that is uh, very surprisingly common is our uh, present. Uh, even though we now um, of act as independent countries, uh, meaning uh, not being under influence of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, for me, it's really surprising to see that uh, we are somehow cursed to go through the same mistakes politically, socially. Uh, uh, if you take uh, the Czech Republic, if you take Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, uh, for some reason, this. Uh, social and political development is, is uh, uh, really, uh, really similar. Uh, so uh, I think this, this makes us uh, a strong region uh, as well. Uh, but okay, this is not a political meeting <laughs> to agitate for, uh, for the Visegrad, uh, Visegrad group. Uh, my purpose uh, for this long uh, geographical introduction uh, was actually to define uh, uh, to, to, to define the place, and now I'm coming to the second uh, uh, second concept uh, which might be understood as relative, and that's advantage and disadvantage. Uh, I mean, psychologically, I think that's obvious that uh, that can uh, what is advantage for somebody uh, is uh, can be considered a, a disadvantage for for somebody else. And uh, uh, actually, that's, that's kind of my point. Uh, and uh, as a Slovak theorist and a curator, I will try now uh, to guess what the Czech, Hungarian, and Polish photographers uh, might consider as a disadvantage uh, of in, of in breaking through in that, uh, in that world of uh, uh, in the real world of art market and uh, where photography turns. Uh, well, first of all, there is a little awareness of Central European photographic production in Western countries. Why is it so? Because we are isolated culturally. Uh, we were isolated culturally by the Iron Curtain for a long time, during which when the modern structures of the art market and our presentation were being established. The Central European countries do not have enough financial sources to invest in art, photography included. And uh, on top of this, uh, there is a lack of awareness as to why it is important to invest in art from the part of the states and from the part of private investors. Uh, so, even the potential that has already been generated uh, is not used. All in all, uh, Czech, Hungarian, Polish and Slovak uh, photographers uh, not being supported sufficiently on the domestic field and being overlooked by the Western art scene have to overcome far more difficulties to break through as world famous photographers than their Western colleagues. 
well, because I, there is a there is a screen of my, with my presentation in front of me, I cannot see uh, if you are nodding uh, in agreement with that or uh, you are vehemently disagreeing. But uh, I assume you agree. <laughs> so uh, and to support my uh, my arguments, uh, I will recall uh, the times when I worked for the European Month of Photography. Uh, that time we had uh, recurrent disputes about the price of the catalogs uh, we were producing with each exhibition. Uh, France and Luxembourg, uh, they, could, uh, they couldn't sell it for uh, just 15 euros because it would seem uh, suspiciously cheap. But Slovakia always found a brother in arms in Germany uh, for, for a lower price. Uh, and Austria, they could easily sell it for 22 euros. Uh, the solutions uh, we accepted that time uh, wasn't sexy, uh, weren't sexy, but but they worked. Uh, we just uh, we just had two different prices, but this the the borderline was clearly set. Uh, there were uh, countries which could afford uh, investing in art, and there were countries which could not. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, if you look closer. Uh, at one side of this border, uh, even within this border, there are some rivalries. Uh, Luxembourg would always uh, be a smaller br brother to France uh, because France could uh, invest in art far more than Luxembourg. But uh, like, for example, me standing on the other side of this, uh, of this border, uh, it would seem like a pettiness. Uh, and this is this is the point about all the relativity I'm trying to introduce here. Uh, well, what if you look at the whole situation and, and our region from the perspective of uh, of an African photographer? Uh, by the way, how many African photographers you know? Uh, uh, then I, I believe that Central European uh, region would seem uh, seem as one of the best places to be to promote photography. Uh, well, we have already gained so much recognition that even such a populistic instrument as uh, Wikipedia uh, states uh, that such an entity as the Visegrad group uh, uh, exists. Uh, and also uh, it, it's linked to the central uh, European region very often. And uh, so uh, from, from this perspective uh, that uh, uh, this our present times meet entirely the Kundera's goal goal to be recognized as uh, something something else than just an Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, one thing which I also uh, would like to mention, uh, which I uh, consider uh, to be advantage rather than disadvantage is uh, also this kind of uh, uh, sexy mystery. Uh, this region, uh, a region uh, how, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of, I would call it sexy mystery, how this, uh, how this region is very often referred to by Westerners. Uh, and it's, it's just, uh, in effect, it's not because, uh, because uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, quality photography or there is more quality photography produced than in the West, but just because uh, lack of information uh, they have, that's all. And uh, mm, so why do, don't we take it as an as adva advantage, advantage then? Uh, I'm coming to the point that I would like to uh, be a little bit um, more uh, personal <laughs> and share with you one of my uh, uh, experiences I had uh, when I worked uh, for the Central European House of Photography as a curator. Uh, I don't know the year when that happened. It might have been in 2008 or so. Uh, and uh, one day uh, a strange guy walked into my office and uh, he introduced himself as a collector of socialist realism. And in the same breath, he mentioned uh, Martin Martinček. 
uh, here I should uh, should say that uh, Martin Martinček is considered something like uh, uh, like a family silver in Slovakia and ha has nothing to do with socialist realism. So I try to correct the guy and, and explain him uh, his mistake. And then uh, uh, his very American way, he said, yeah, of course, uh, he was wrong. I'm really the, the expert and uh, uh, that um, uh, he just saw the, the book by Martin Martinček downstairs. So that's why he mentioned him. And uh, he continued, uh, to my big surprise, uh, that he was a very successful collector of Romanian costume, national costumes, uh, selling them in the States. And if I helped him to uh, uh, search for the old picture, photographs uh, in, in the attics of uh, for old photographers' videos, this is exactly what he said. Uh, he could bring uh, our photography to the United States and sell them. Uh, sounding like, okay, I will do your country a big favor. Uh, I wasn't able to react uh, that time, uh, which I uh, always felt sorry. Uh, he just he just walked away uh, from my office being very satisfied with himself. And I was le left there uh, with a uh, big frustration that even that was that was something like 20 years uh, after the change of the regime, uh, uh, somebody could think that we do not know our own value. Uh, so, and now uh, with this, uh, I would like to come uh, to some more pictures and uh, probably to uh, what, what you all are uh, waiting for. So uh, some, some, maybe some practical conclusions from uh, all of this I, uh, I have said. Uh, well, uh, and I was also requested to, to talk a little bit about the, uh, our festival of Bratislava. Uh, so I, I will try to squeeze it all in 20, max 25 minutes uh, and do it all in one. Uh, so all in all, uh, what we have uh, is the region, which is already rec internationally re recognized. There is some kind of uh, allure of, uh, of a mystery because of our socialist past. Uh, which we can take uh, as an advantage. And, and another thing which I'm coming to now uh, is that uh, our uh, visuality or our reality we, we can reflect on doesn't really uh, differ very much uh, from, uh, from, from the visuality of Westerners or, or other part, uh, parts of Europe. Uh, so even if we do not... Uh, uh, base our projects on sexy socialist past, uh, just like you see uh, by uh, Gavor Arion Kudas, <laughs> uh, or uh, by other artists uh, I showed, I have shown before, and which found already their customers. Uh, uh, we still, we still have the, we can still uh, have the same. Um, uh, same chances as the Western photographers. Uh, and here I come to the point. This is Soraya Zaman uh, with her project American Boys, uh, which uh, we, we which we which we exhibited at the Off Festival uh, last year. Uh, these are portraits of trans masculine uh, individuals uh, taken across the United States. And uh, she decided to take uh, these portraits in a different stages of their transitions, uh, uh, like stressing the, the ideas of uh, gender and uh, obviously uh, speaking about uh, something which is, uh, which is really uh, very topical across the whole world. Uh, and uh, to add some kind of success story uh, of uh, Soraya, she, uh, they published the project uh, as a book. It was all sold out and they are uh, preparing the second edition now. Uh, the project won a silver award uh, in the Moscow International Photo Awards. Uh, and also the work has been also featured in various uh, publications like ID Magazine, Document uh, Journal, Lens Culture, MTV News, BuzzFeed, The Guardian, Bird in Flight, PDN, Feature Shoot, and many more.
And here we have Slovak photographer, Jana Gombikova, with her work, She, uh, which uh, actually addresses the same, uh, the same uh, subject. And she deliberately uh, stresses this quality of ambivalence uh, in, in her portraits. Uh, just to question uh, uh, question our notions of uh, genders as we traditionally see them. Another subject, uh, British photographer Stephen Barrett, uh, he uses the work by Ovid's poems, uh, Metamorphosis, uh, and links, uh, links it to the contemporary times. Uh, his body, uh, he, he, it's always him on the portraits, and his body is undergoing a drastic change with each, uh, with each image. Uh, really uh, preparing for each, uh, each project, let's say half a year. Mythographies, the project, uh, has been featured in various magazines like uh, Photography Now, Art of Creative Photography. Uh, it won a third place uh, at the platform Lens Culture. Uh, it was exhibited in Prem Arts in Berlin, and we exhibited uh, his work uh, at Off Bratislava last year. Now we have Jan Djurina, Slovak photographer, uh, who uses his body as the main expression as well. And he doesn't spare his body either. Uh, his, uh, this, uh, these images come from uh, different projects, but the main idea behind this project is uh, the portraiture of his inner world. And another subject, uh, youth and a teenage world, uh, another very, very topical subject uh, and universal subject. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, we, uh, we can argue that the youth of Belfast might be, uh, uh, might, might be legendary and a bit more sexy than other teenage uh, groups just because of their uh, troublesome reputation. Uh, uh, and Something like this is also the subject of uh, the German uh, documentary Toby Binder, uh, Wiemacher's uh, Youth of Belfast. Uh, his, his project uh, has been awarded the Sony World Photography Awards, UNICEF Photo of the Year, Philip Jones Griffiths Foundation. And uh, it was also published uh, by Carers in, uh, as a book in 2019. Another project we exhibited at OFF Festival last year. And this is Slovak photographer, Milan Illig, with, he, with his crew teams. Uh, he succeeded to get uh, closer to, to the teenage world uh, than anybody, uh, uh, than almost anybody, let's say. Well, uh, having photographed his son from his childhood uh, and developing rather friendly, uh, friends-like relationship with him, uh, he was accepted uh, among his teenage friends and he traveled with them to their parties, to their trips. Uh, they allowed him to take pictures, uh, and after a while, they uh, almost didn't uh, didn't notice him uh, as uh, uh, as as a photographing element there. Uh, so uh, this project is a result of a unique position of photographer being present and unnoticed at the same time. Uh, these pictures from uh, from this project uh, they won uh, at the Czech Press Photo and Slovak Press Photo in 2013, and we exhibited it also in the same year at uh, of uh, Bratislava. So uh, and uh, I don't know how I'm about the time. I forgot to check it, uh, but. Uh, to conclude my whole presentation, uh, let me just uh, 
put it in all in one sentence. So if you are not succeeding with your unique artistic vision and creativity, I do not think it is the re region of Central Europe uh, that is to blame, but there is rather something wrong with your marketing. So it's, uh, you were almost on time. Uh, it's question time now. Uh, if, if anyone would like to ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it was very interesting how you summarized your lecture and maybe it would be good to speak about this a little bit more. You said, if you are not succeeding, Etc. Etc. There is something wrong with your market. That's what you said. Marketing. Marketing, Marketing strategy. Marketing. Uh -huh. And also, how would you summarize, to be positive, the advantages of being East European? So, so what? What are the? So how, how would you? What would you highlight? What What is good for 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 being an East European uh, photographer? You know. Uh... There is one thing uh, which is very obvious and which I didn't mention uh, uh, or the connection I didn't mention. Uh, we opened a, a private gallery this month uh, in Bratislava uh, focused only on photography and of course doing the, the research uh, in, in this field, I mean in, in the art market, uh, we were told by, uh, by others in this business already uh, that uh, if we uh, if we uh, profile our gallery as a gallery focused on Central Europe, it will have uh, have a certain appeal for the Western market. We, of course, uh, we 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 uh, plan to have this profile of the gallery anyway, but they kind of uh, confirm this. Uh, so um, maybe, uh, of course, th this is kind of a cheap uh, cheap way to win, or uh, it's, it might be seen as cheating. But uh, my, my point is why not to use it? Well, it is there, it is there. There is still some, some, some kind of uh, appeal of, uh, of Eastern Europe, uh, uh, which um, as I said, it's, it's based on uh, lack of, rather lack of information than anything else. Um, maybe I'm putting it a little bit rough, but <laughs> but that's the point. Because if you if you really want to, if if the uh, if the idea is how to break through, then uh, uh, well, the instruments uh, you use must be strong enough. You know, uh, if if the point is just to uh, sort of define Central Europe as. Uh, uh, as a strong region and draw on mm, some kind of uh, uh, pride, then the, then the weapons are a little bit different because uh, you do not you do not uh, necessarily need to break through. You just want to build your position where you are. Uh, so um, I didn't I didn't talk about this. Uh, this building or connecting as a central Europe. I, I left that for others. I was rather focusing and, and, and uh, uh, speaking about how to break through uh, to the best. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. I, I have a, uh, when you were, of course we are aware of this geographical shifting center of Europe. Uh, but it was, <laughs> it was again good to listen to you uh, going through that. Um, and I had this feeling that central has this notion also that being important, okay, like a central station. But uh, this region, uh, from another point of view, it, it, it always feels like the periphery, like always based between east and west and uh, I can really connect to you on the, on the little anecdote of that uh, collector uh, arriving and, 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 and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm to, to make it into a question I, I, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> ask that whether, whether uh, the gallery that you are finding that you just started in, uh, in Bratislava which is focusing 
on this region, wouldn't it be uh, more successful to start it in, uh, in, in, in London or in Paris or in uh, Berlin? Or, or uh, of course, I know that there are many other elements, but uh, I'm trying to um, address or, or, or go towards this colonization and uh, periphery uh, or, or so how do we look at this? You know, uh, for us founders of the gallery, by the way, it's fog, <laughs> uh, finding of this gallery, uh, it, uh, we do not want to be based anywhere else because uh, one of the main goals is also to, um, let's say, um, support the, the art market also in Slovakia in photography. So this cannot happen if uh, if we are based in in Britain or Germany or anywhere else. Anywhere else. And uh, yes, uh, you are right that uh, you have to be somewhere there if you want to break through. Uh, but we just hope because uh, there is still little experience uh, being open for uh, uh, for three three uh, weeks or so. Uh, we just hope that uh, the institutions like art markets, for example, Art Market Budapest uh, this October, but also other uh, other markets, uh, international markets, uh, help this, uh, or or that they they are already established just uh, for these purposes, as you say, that you do not have to be based there to get there. And. Uh, Another another thing is, uh, of course, the the use of of uh, social media. That that that's something so essential, and it appeared to be so uh, so essential uh, during these last two years. That um, that that's something I think that that's something that uh, will even gain on its power, uh, even in in the art market. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's a very, uh, in, from our point of view, it's a very positive uh, prospect. Okay. You have to be, well, if, if you start, uh, start a gallery based on Central European uh, photography, you have to be positive or maybe even naive, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm also looking at the uh, clock uh, and, and I see that we are just a little bit beyond time but there is room for one question, if we want. No. Uh, so then, uh, thank you, Susanna, for the presentation. It was very, very interesting for me. Um, and I would like to um, ask our next presenter, who is uh, who happens to be also our, uh, our uh, colleague, Judith. Thank you, Orion. I share my screen. Okay, I, I just realized that I have to uh, I have to announce the title of your uh, presentation, which is how to influence the future with the past, the Peche Josef Photography Grant Archive. This is what you're going to be talking about. So, hello everyone. My name is Judith Gellir. I'm a curator of Robert Kappa Contemporary Photography Center, as uh, well as a lecturer at the uh, Moment Photography de Department, as uh, Orion just said. And um, the title is my lecture is How to Influence the Future with the Past. And I will try to present the researching method and its uh, results uh, in an exhibition form and as a digital archive as well as a reader. Uh, my managing director at Copper Center invited me to create an exhibition for the 25th anniversary of the Peche Jose Photography Grant in 2016. And uh, my first thought was that uh, this would be a huge and uh, complex work. So I asked for a co-curator colleague and I was very happy that Mikro Jamboki accepted my invitation. So we worked uh, together on this um, project for uh, one year. We began the preparations for the exhibition in January 2016. And uh, already at this stage, it became clear that the documentation of this grant is incomplete 
a little erratic and has not been processed in the last more than two decades. We didn't even know who um, won the grant in the last 25 years, when did they win, how many times did they win, with what projects, and uh, where are the artworks. So we had to start our work with uh, retrieving and compiling um, the full list of the grant fellows. The documentation of the grant materials can be collected from two sources. For the years after 2013, it can be found in the archives of the Hungarian Creative Art Public Benefit nonprofit uh, company, the Monk, while the materials created before 2013 are in the archives of the Hungarian National Gallery. Since uh, the aim of the research was uh, primarily to uh, establish the exhibition concept and uh, form a curatorial vision, it was very important to get to know uh, the photo series of the fellows um, besides exploring the archival materials and uh, compiling the full list of artists. However, the documentation at the gallery's archive consists of text only. One cannot see here the series, um, the photographs uh, created with the support of the grant. On the picture, you can see my colleague, um, Miklos, top of the head, uh, buried under these uh, documents and, um, and papers. Finally, in the documentations, we found that uh, the grant um, was called for 24 times uh, during the 25 years and uh, 124 names of artists who won the grant. So we had to mediate on how we shall make an exhibition out of this list because um, only a small uh, portion of photographs uh, series was available um, as reproductions, mainly in earlier exhibition catalogues. On the slide, you can see the uh, 124 names. And um, now, um, Joat, uh, please uh, close your eyes um, because um, I don't think this is the designated smoking area, uh, but we had to have a break and um, catch a wider perspective. Uh, so we knew that uh, it would be a complex work, uh, but we started to get in touch uh, with the fellows um, one by one via emails and um, telephone and uh, ask them to send their created um, series uh, for the grant uh, in a digital form in, in email. Naturally, we had um, difficulties uh, with this, but um, I will tell you more about it um, later. By definition, uh, photographers under 35 may apply for the grant that involves a 12-month uh, financial support uh, by the government. And they may do you know, this application for maximum three times for the first, the second, and the, the third year. And uh, every year, the grant uh, may be awarded to 10 people altogether. So as a result, several series uh, were created with the support of the grant and it is a, a very complex system. So after counting a um, lot of different options, such as a roll calling uh, salon-like presentation of the grant uh, or the grouping by keywords, uh, rather strict 25 years 25 fellows exhibition concept uh, crystallized that we choose uh, to present uh, in chronological order. In the pictures, you can see the um, opening of the exhibition. So uh, 25 years, uh, 25 uh, fellows. But um, as our aim uh, was to present the 25 years of the grant in its completeness, it came to my mind to create an online archive as well. The primary ambitions 
for creating the archive have been a collection and preservation, uh, while the secondary intention was uh, involved establishing visibility, because with the concept of creating an online archive was also to provide the opportunity for presenting the grant in its totality. So our vision uh, was to pose assumption um, that can be challenged and uh, criticized with the exhibition and uh, to introduce the grant and also to demonstrate uh, through a representative slice of the whole field, the way the grant helps the different artists at the beginning of their careers. Furthermore, to recall changes in the topics and the creative assets of the last 25 years, as well as the diversity of uh, genres uh, represented by the, uh, by the grant. The digital archive uh, was uh, firstly presented on the opening of the exhibition and uh, it took place in the last room um, that you can see on the picture among the catalogues and the full name list on the wall. With the creation of uh, this archive, our most important aim was to present the works of art created with the help of the grant in this period and to make them accessible, visible and researchable. During the creation of the archive, the two most, most important considerations were to include every fellow's work and to have it ready for the opening of the exhibition, which was uh, only a few months um, later in October. As this way, um, we could provide a complete presentation of the grant. In order to realize this vision, we had to set up a um, flexible and sometimes uh, customized rules. One of these rules was that every photographer would be uh, represented by uh, one series, even if they had uh, received the grant uh, multiple times and uh, had created more series uh, during their fellowship. Uh, as you can see on the screenshot, the archive is uh, practically a homepage that consists of the main page with the artist's uh, name in an alphabetical order and the uh, years uh, when they won the grant. You can also search uh, by project uh, with one highlighted picture from the series and uh, you can find the different uh, grant uh, curatorial boards which is uh, changing in every five years. Um, as you can see, on, on your, you and your work is, uh, is very popular, so if you click, click on one uh, on a name or a project, uh, you can read the description in Hungarian and in English, find some pictures from the series, and um, during the exhibition, um, there were no hyperlinks in the archive, avoiding the visitors uh, use it as an internet terminal. But after the finissage, uh, we updated it. And now you can find the artist's uh, contact information. It was important for me to have the viewer to get in touch with the artist directly. So if someone doesn't have a homepage, we used um, his or her email address there. As I mentioned before, um, there were some uh, difficulties with the collection of the materials. Um, one year later, uh, one year after the exhibition opened in, in January 2017 status check, the works of uh, 18 projects were um, unavailable in the archive. And the underlying um, reasons were rather diverse. So these we marked in the, in the archive as um, the follows. The fellowship series is lost or it is uh, unavailable at the moment for technical reasons. It is because there were some artists whom we were unable to connect. 
or who were unable to send us the materials uh, for an indefinite time. The fellowship series is unavailable for technical reasons. Mm, there were some artists whom the display format was uh, not acceptable. And there were some artists uh, who requested uh, to um, give their projects um, be, av be available um, after the exhibition um, close. Um, and the, the fellowship series will not uh, be available in accordance with the request of the artist. I will tell you a bit more about it um, later why uh, what they were doing this. Uh, in some cases, um, with some fellows, we use the scanned pages of the catalog in the archive with appropriate credits. Uh, in these cases, the original series were destroyed or could not be found. Um, that is why the use of the catalog images was uh, authorized. We could not contact or find the artist, um, or there were some cases where the artist has deceased and uh, we were unable to contact um, the here. As a conclusion, I would say that uh, one of the hardest, uh, strangest and uh, most exciting part of this work was to speak and uh, deal with more than 100 artists and explain them uh, what we are doing and uh, why and uh, how they reacted to uh, it. And here, I, um, here come another question. Is this type of archiving and storing is enough or not. When creating a digital archive, our task is easier if the files are created in digital format initially, because digitizing non-digital materials is uh, still ahead of us. This is also true the other way around. Um, it would be important to collect the artworks themselves in one place, which should be a part of a larger scale institutional vision. To save the files on the hardware are necessary uh, because dangers uh, posed by technology can lead to that uh, the data or the database uh, disappear or become overwritten by viruses at any time. Remember, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, so the internet is uh, primarily not for data storage, but for transferring data. After the difficulties, here comes the advantages of why it was worth doing the whole thing. The series created under the aegis of the Pechioja Photography Grant can be considered to be a kind of cultural heritage to preserve. The online archive created uh, for the exhibition page 25 presents the results of a representative state funded grant and introduces the work of more than 100 Hungarian photographers from the past uh, 25 years. The archive is instantly access accessible from almost everywhere and uh, the word that's why it could assist the channeling of contemporary Hungarian photography into the international bloodstream via the public access it provides. Of course, uh, there were some uh, disadvantages and some problematic points in the archive as well as the, in the exhibition. So as a finish program, we organized a conference with uh, five lecturers that came out um, as a reader book as well with more uh, critical thoughts on the topic, topics that the grant and the exhibition offered. Uh, Miklo Zsambuki uh, researched the history of the grant from different angles. Uh, I wrote a more detailed essay on our work on the creation of the archive. And as I said before, there were some artists uh, who refused to give their works um, series for the archive, so we asked Joseph May to keep a lecture on this topic. Uh, Attila Horeni explored the afterlife of the images submitted uh, by the Grant Fellows, while uh, Monica Perenye chose to talk about the exhibition itself in a critical way. So, 
how to influence the future with the past uh, on a collective level. What we did was uh, collecting data and systematize them that, uh, that nobody's done in the past uh, decades. We were getting in touch with the artists and tell them the aim of the creation of the archive and highlight their works, um, sometimes their forgotten uh, series. The archive will uh, probably not only be interesting for researchers, but it can also set an example for future fellows. They can learn from history because from the archive, one can see how did other artists um, deal with a topic. For example, what technique they used or, uh, how much, or if you read the text um, or they read the text, they can see the way they were thinking about it when they were in their age of 30s. And the curators can have inspiration by searching for artists or projects, as well as getting in touch with them. Um, currently, the number of online Hungarian databases um, representing only Hungarian contemporary photographers in one place is um, relatively low. So one of the ways to learn about and uh, present the contemporary art scene is through different um, online platforms which may be regarded as a communication channels of key importance. And um, at last, here is a, a tip uh, on a personal level. Um, tidy up your personal archive and systematize it. Uh, one of my colleagues made a fascinating and very inspirational job during the first wave of pandemic. She put an order her files on her computer. That sounds so simple, but honestly, who has a proper and well-organized file and folder system at home? While you are doing this, it may um, allow you to see the big picture, find forgotten files, pictures, texts that can give you new ideas or just the motivation to finish something up. Oh, thank you for your attention. And um, this link can uh, also goes to uh, Michaela's uh, collection as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, I, I know this. I know the exhibition, and I, <laughs> and I know the uh, archive, and. Uh, and you know, from the beginning, and actually from the archive of MoMA as well, our graduates, I was uh, amazed uh, how that the institution or a, or a, or a, or a, or a government grant uh, forgets to you know to document what it is doing. So for me, it, 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 in the work that you did, it's, of course the work itself is like enormous. I think, like contacting everyone and. Uh, 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 trying to get the pictures from everyone. But what is more shocking is that the uh, institutional, uh, so the institution itself is not doing, you know, just half of the job. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and your work actually pointed at this problem, uh, <laughs> uh, which was, I think, a very, uh, very shocking thing to learn. But um, what I would like to ask is, the, uh, is, what do you think about the continuity? Continuity in terms of, uh, like, there, is, there, there, there are different awards, like the Kappa Award, for example, or the, uh, um, or the future of Pechi, you know, if uh, the internet changes or the use of the devices change, this website might, you know, get out of use after a time or it's uh, or you know what happened with some of the flash uh, you know websites they are inaccessible after a time so like how do you prepare for continuity in in the larger scale like not 25 years but like 50 years is there a concept in your uh, in your head about this well um First thing that documentation, documenting um, even yourself or even in an institutional um, work is, is very, very important. 
And um, after the, the exhibition closed in 2017, we continued this work. So every year when there is a new follower, um, we, we collect materials uh, from them. And um, as I uh, said in the presentation, it is, um, it is very important to save these files uh, in digital formats on uh, to hardware as well, because of um, the disadvantage is of, um, of the internet and, uh, and using um, the internet on this. Um, but I don't, so the Kappa Center is um, um, allow, um, uh, or working together with Monk, who is the organizer of this um, of this grant. So uh, I don't know if um, if they will have um, any further um, uh, opinion about collecting the artworks, artworks, because it would be um, um, a task of a museum to collect uh, the artworks um, itself. I think <clears throat> I think there is one small information what is what is uh, uh, needed to add for the outsiders. I think that it would be very important to 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 describe a little bit just on a personal level why the Josef Pitcher uh, grant is so important for the young artists. Also related to the Derkovich and the and the Cosma um, uh, uh, grant. So so why why it, why there is such a big struggle to get this um, get this prize? Um, it was the first grant that was given to to photographers. Um, so it had um, some um, um, other uh, grants before, but not as uh, well established as the Pechi Ojev grant uh, became. So because the curatorial board is, um, is very strict, only 10 people can get it. So it is very important for the artists or young uh, photographers to, to get this in one hand. On the other hand, uh, that this grant uh, gives um, um, a 12 month um, um, money to, to work with. So it is, a, it is a help for the young artists to create their artworks. Um, and, and, and they can also reapply it, right? After one year. Yes, they can do it for three times. So it was um, um, a hard work uh, because there were some artists, there are some artists who apply for the grant uh, in three different uh, years. And every year they do different uh, series. So they have a three different series. Um, and there were some artists who only got it once um, or two times, or there were five years between one and two series. So um, this is why it was complex. And, and we had to make some rules um, with Miklos um, about the um, creation of the archive. And, and as a side work, are you also interested in the changes of the of the jury? How did that influence the outcome on the end? Because I think that is very interesting part of the story. Yeah, um, our aim was to to give um, um, the whole uh, in, to 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 draw the the whole uh, grant and. Uh, it is very important who is in the in the curatorial board because uh, with different tastes or with different um, goals, um, artists um, can get in or not get in. So it is also interesting by by the by the genres. Um, Judith, and how do you see that the? I, I feel that. We are a little bit landlocked in this. It's like every in Hungary, everyone who is a photographer knows Pécsi József uh, grant. But I think uh, as you step across the border of Hungary, no one knows and why should they know and why should they care about it? Did you experience that people uh, from outside of Hungary who were interested in uh, uh, Central European or uh, Hungarian photography they approached the uh, archive and 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 they actually it's like a it's a post post uh, socialist archive of uh, Hungarian photography, you know, because it's like 
90, what was it, 94, 90, uh, just right after uh, uh, 1990 started. So it's, uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful resource to, to look at Hung contemporary Hungarian photography. Um, I, I, I don't have the access to the statistics, um, mm -hmm. but um, what we thought and what, what the aim was um, to translate all the, all the projects into English. So it is necessary to, to have the descriptions in English, then um, anyone uh, who finds this um, archive can, can read the project. Um, but I, I don't know how, who, who knows about it. Even the the name of the 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 link is um, is in Hungarian, so <laughs> the language barrier lives yeah. forever. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I see that we uh, we are uh, uh, actually uh, holding to our time quite well. Um, and I Susanna Lapitkova has a question. Yeah, please, Susanna, don't hesitate. I cannot unmute my my camera, so maybe without the performance of my <laughs> face expressions. Uh, okay, now I can. No, I still cannot. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't know what's okay, going. so it's just my voice. Uh, the, uh, well, if I understand it right, because yes, I am one of those from across the border who do not know the importance of this grant. But if I understand it well, then uh, what you have put together uh, in this archive is some kind of overview of uh, the best of the best, right? Uh, because uh, well, you say it's very, very much uh, uh, very much uh, wanted uh, by Hungarian photographers, young Hungarian photographers. Uh, so uh, anybody who really feels ambition to uh, produce a project uh, 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 takes this this grant as the, their first choice, right? So I mean, uh, the question, my my question is. Uh, comes from uh, a new gallerist <laughs> and a <clears throat> promoter of Central European photography because, uh, well, uh, you, Judith, for example, uh, uh, might be my uh, counselor if, uh, if I look uh, for a Hungarian photographer with a particular project uh, to present in our gallery or I can consult the, the website and, and uh, perhaps I find, find there something really re representing uh, mm. a modern contemporary uh, Hungarian pho pho photo production. Is it so? Do I understand it right? Uh, well, yes, you can see um, artworks from the 90s uh, of, uh, of artists who are well established now uh, and um, this grant is um, is for uh, people under 35. So after they finish the university, um, usually they apply for this grant because if they are university student, they cannot um, apply for the grant. Um, and um, they they have one year to work on their project, and um, they also can have uh, consultations. Um, with the curatorial board, so um, and they they have to make an exhibition at the end, so they are working very well on their projects and um, and they are so they became important um, artists in the in the scene, those who who received this grant. Um. Thank you. Uh, I just see that we are uh, now we are beyond our time a little bit, but uh, at the end, uh, the, the final uh, panel, uh, uh, we can continue uh, uh, talking about this su uh, subject. But now I would like to uh, give the floor to George Petraini, who is going to be our last presenter tonight. And the title of his 
lecture is effects and side effects, the documentum exhibitions and local photographic identity. Um, thank you very much also for, for, for being the last one, because in a way I think that um, it's a happy coincidence that, um, that through my tropic we can get back to the past. It's interesting that <clears throat> we, will, we will discuss this, uh, this question on the end, but, um, um, but what past means that how far should we go back is, is one, of, uh, one, one of the most crucial question I think. And of course, there's a lot of, lot of uh, possibilities in that. And that's why I choose one which is also overlapping in time. And that is, that is why uh, um, on the subtitle, you can see two different uh, kind of uh, dates. And one is, the, um, one is the first period of time. And the second one in another, in another, is another one that uh, I will explain how it is. So in the first part of my lecture, I will focus on the first period. And it was very interesting what, uh, what you did just said uh, which was um, which was about the problems of documenting the project, and it's very funny that uh, now I was um, I had several phone calls with the with the heart of this documentum project, Dioke Santa, who I will introduce a little bit later, and I was asking him to to send me some um, uh, some um, some images of the actual exhibitions what was uh, what, what happened in uh, 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 under this title and he said to me well this is a very typical fact that every everybody in in such an event are photographers as guests on the opening so nobody is taking photographs so the fact is that there is no any photographs of the spaces or of, of the events of this uh, of this uh, extraordinary exhibitions and it is very meaningful for me as well and for every of us who are curators that that even if it's uh, if it sometimes it seems boring but we also should have uh, we also should take our own photographs just to document what we are doing so getting to the beginning of the story this is a series of exhibitions which was called documentum and which was collecting a special circle of artists. This happened outside Budapest uh, in the city of Vesprim. And uh, this was not by chance how, uh, why it happened uh, like this, but I don't wanna run forward so, so much. Just see these four catalog-like magazines, what I am presenting here, which, which are the, um, which are the um, uh, remaining documents of this, uh, of this exhibition. And, um, and it's, it's a very important uh, um, small detail what I would like to underline here. And what you can notice maybe that after the first two issues on the third one, on the cover of the third one, you can see in small image, the first two covers by added, a couple of names and on the fourth one you can see the cover of the first three ones and 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 the names of the exhibit exhibition this the reason was that 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 the organizers uh, said that they would like to create a project or an exhibition which works like a snowball so namely the after the first the the participants of the first decide who would be interesting to participate in the second one and then after the second, there is a new, new period where they choose the third one and to the third one and to the, to the fourth one. This is the first period of this, this whole, whole story. I also have a proposition, which is, uh, which is the abstract uh, of this whole topic. So I think what I was thinking about what, how should we approach the identity, the photographic identity? And I was thinking that from a historical point of view, and not just from a historical point of view, it can also be important from a present or from a future point of view as well. There is three different important points. One is the institutional frame. What is, is given in a certain moment in time and how does this in, institutional frame and belief in what is official and what is non-official um, influencing the actual uh, photographic products. 
The second is the technical possibilities, which uh, in the moment is maybe not so important, but in the 70s and in the 80s or before, it was a very, very crucial question, namely, what can you do and where and on what cost? And in photography, for example, the possibility in our countries, in Middle Europe, that you could blow up anything you wanted in your own a kitchen or you're in your own bathroom created the possibility of conceptual photography or avant-garde photography as well. So I think that this technical aspect is a very important phenomenon as well. And the third one is, is very interesting also because I think, or I believe, not I believe, but I experience a lot of time that there is a local interest of topics which, is, which are discussed frequently by drinking a beer or something. And this, this interest is not same in another city or in another country or in another part of Europe. So it also defines somehow how the development of photography is, um, um, is, uh, is changing in time. So I think that these three aspects are very important to define photographic identity. And this is uh, uh, this was important to mention in forehand because I think that the, the document to make this in theory is a kind of a case study in that. So from, from one point of view, it's also important to mention that in the end of the 70s or in the 80s, it was um, not without other examples that the experimental or cutting edge photographies exhibitions were not happening in Budapest. But for example, in, um, in Vesprim in this case, or, or in uh, Estergom or in Sombate or whatever, other cities were important spots to, uh, to, to think about how photography have new ways. And, um, and in this case, in Vesprim, a photographer called Anta Jokes uh, started this, this project who, who was um, absolutely outside the official circles. And um, this is a very important point because there's two words what, what, what is also already important to discuss in this, um, in this uh, moment. One is um, what should experimentalism mean? And the other is if we are not using the word experimental, then what else could we use? I have to mention this because ex Antal is fighting against using this word experimental because he says that what, what should be experimental in photography? Any photograph you make is a statement. So there is no, no way to, to distinguish photography from like, like photography, like established photography from ex, ex, experimental photography because both of them are speaking of the, of, the, of the medium itself. And the second, which is very important that he used to say instead of experimentalism that, um, maybe alternative should be used if we would like to, like to distinguish somehow the difference between the, the officially, um, uh, uh, officially accepted definition of what art photography should be with any others which are not within these this circles. You can also imagine, and that's also a very typical question in Middle Europe, that when we were speaking of official photography in that years, that had a very classical black and white uh, flavor of, um, of, um, of beauty, etc., etc. So in that sense, this contradiction between what is official and not, not official is also very important in that sense, in, in these cases. So Antal, after an exhibition in, in Vesprim, was invited by the local, local cultural uh, uh, government to, to make another other solo exhibition. And then he decided to, to invite two other artists, Gabor Kerekes and Jano Serencic, to take part in this exhibition. And this is what started uh, this documentum uh, series of, uh, of, uh, of projects in which they, they, the title was just to, um, to underline the importance of, importance of documenting the status quo, so it has no any relation to the documentary photography. Just to present Anta Jokes, immediately that you can see that in the end of the 70s, he was experimenting with different uh, 
different uh, possibilities and one was the light the other was the time and um, and uh, and and the structure of the image and also it was very important for him to to use one very lately very important um, uh, important uh, um, uh, phenomena or sign and this is the black frame the black frame just for the outsiders meaning that means in that sense that that the, the whole negative is blown up and um, and this black frame is, is coming from the edges of the negative and this was something for them which was believed to to speak about the truth of the photography but i will reflect on them uh, more but there is one very important aspect to mention and this immediately starts from the beginning. And this is the, the, the connection between the, the photography and the fine arts. And uh, we are in the end of the 70s, we are in the end of the decade when, um, when conceptual photography was on the, on the highest point in Hungary with, uh, with a lot of artists documenting their performances with Miklós Erdély as a theoretician in the background and also other theoreticians like Laszlo Becker, who is also shown in this photograph. And one of the, one of the contact person, maybe between the, between the fine art photographers and Anta Jokes was Tibor Hayas, who he also knew personally, who was documenting his own performances and also, also manipulating the images uh, and um, also uh, in many cases working with another photographer, Janos Vettő, to, to realize this, uh, this shot. And Laszlo Becke and uh, Tibor Hoyas was, was, was also participating in the, in the, in the document, uh, Documentum uh, events and Laszlo Becke immediately was standing on the side of this project because he had seen how how important this is to, to, to find a new forum, which is, uh, which, is, which is trying to explore the overlapping borders of, uh, of fine art uh, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and photographic uh, uh, expressions. So in the Documentum exhibition, there were some keywords which were very important uh, in, their, um, in their actual work. One was the provoked coincidence which was also related to the fine, uh, fine, fine art concepts in, um, in the conceptual art field, but provoked coincidence was something which was very important for Jokes Antal himself. The second was how to go against the canon. And this means that if, the, if, if there is a canon of photography in a certain moment of time, which is, um, which is the general official uh, market like belief in what uh, what what a, what an art photography should look like and how should that appear and what kind of language that should speak, then there is a possibility always to 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 extend the borders by rethinking what should be if we would not use the category system of the of the canon but uh, but use something else. The black frame was something what I was speaking about and this is very interesting because. Um, just recently, when I was listening an interview of uh, or with with, with Yoke Santal, he was speaking of this, and he was saying that that yeah, the black frame is something in documentary photography, which is meaning that that uh, that that there is no any manipulation of the photo itself because the whole whole negative is blown up. But he said, well, but but anything what happens in that moment. And anything what happens in that that certain situation where the photography is done is of course manipulated because as we can we have seen the example of what uh, what I have shown from him that you could see that there is there is manipulation with the light there is manipulation with the with the overexposure to uh, to, the, to the same frame two times etc cetera, etc cetera. so this kind of um, kind of uh, a black frame thing is also something to discuss but. On the other way, with this title "Documentum," was 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 always uh, was also something which was immediately uh, created a debate on documentarism. What should what should be the difference between their work and the documentarist photography's work? And of course, <clears throat> their proposition was that um, was that the documentum itself should mean something else than documentarism, because documentum is uh, is showing how 
um, uh, present uh, status should be should be clarified in um, uh, in, in photography. This is one example. <clears throat> what um, what I will uh, I will uh, um, uh, recall a little bit later, which was uh, which is also speaking about Yorkes. Uh, uh, behavior and, and methodology about uh, how to how to, to to modify the coincidence or how to work with the coincidence. As you can see here, uh, he was not using the pathfinder. He was uh, he was working on a way like um, like um, like holding the photo of the camera in the hand in the level of like one meter or something like that. And making making shots just just by by feeling a certain moment and feeling a certain situation and this is what created this uh, this very strange way of um, way of uh, uh, um, of presenting the world. He was uh, he was mainly photographing in in inner parts of cities and uh, and this uh, this photograph also shows a kind of a kind of a socio interest uh, in his uh, in his way of approach. Another photographer of the first exhibition, Gabor Kerekes, whose very poetic uh, uh, early photographs and, and blow-ups shows, uh, shows architectural um, uh, uh, units in, um, in the 70s, uh, um, which had different meaning in his photograph by, by having this very silent way of presentation, showing different kind of reality, I would say, with this very very smooth and, and, and edgy black and white uh, uh, images. The third artist in the first, uh, first exhibition was very interesting because Janos Serencis was somebody who was also, also working on the official side. He was a very uh, successful photographer and he got a lot of uh, jobs like to, um, uh, to, to make photo series of, uh, of certain cities and, to, and, and these books were published about the cities. And meanwhile, working for, the, for these tourist agencies, uh, he was also uh, having this uh, parallel path in his career, what, what took together this, this group of artists. Then another artist from the, from the second uh, edition, Janos Vettő, who was a very important figure, not just on the, on, on the photographic field, but more on the fine art field. And he was somebody who was very much involved in the underground, under, underground world of Budapest from the 70s, also, also working with rock musicians and, and uh, actors, and also making, um, making uh, uh, record covers for different bands. So his position was, was also a connecting person uh, in this sense. And I show, um, um, Lenke Silagi's work on a different way, just because to 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 prove for you how this um, this this aspect to, to to find find a common language between the fine art went through. Here you can see a series of uh, of um, of photographs. He she was the only female artist in the in this first first series, but you can see how it was published. On the on the cover of the on the back cover of the document to for magazine, you can see that immediately with this text and with the drawing, it changed this um, uh, this series of photographs towards somebody else. Just another um, other uh, um, um, example of the design, how how this magazine will look like, and in, in itself, it has a has a very unique and very very new language. So just to to summarize again. Um, media consciousness was very important for them. The borders of the, mini, uh, the medium, the meaning of the image was something what, what they were always considering how to, how to work with and also to, uh, to, 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 to neglect somehow the word experimentalism and, to, and to, to, uh, to, to state that every kind of photographs are, um, are, are statements. But there were some theoretical debates that I would like to underline and what I think are very, very inspiring also in, in 81. And that was, was a proposition by one artist, Akos Birkas, who, who was a conceptual artist and painter. And um, he made this small drawing in the, in the Documentum number no. three magazine, which is inspiring me, for example, until today, which is staying, saying that there is a camera which, is, which looks like a photo camera here on the image you can see. 
and everything which is outside the camera, which is not shot as a photograph, should be called anti-camera, which means that that which means that that the reality is what we document, and 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 so everything what we don't document is 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 an, is an anti-statement of what the camera is. It's I think it's a very very interesting. Um, aspect of thinking and this is something which is really really actual today when surveillance cameras and uh, and or phones and or or no or notebooks and and laptops are just documenting what we do and where we are and this is the reaction of yoke santal in the in the document number three asking the important questions what can be the on the other side of the camera or what what should be this side and what should be uh, with that side and so this was the this was the end of the first part, and it's very interesting that uh, that why this ended had uh, had also official official reasons um, because um, even if it was outside Budapest, it was even if it was in Vesprem, the official party members were suspicious about what's going on, and they did not like so much that every year a lot of uh, intellectuals uh, from Budapest are traveling to Vesprem for this event. And uh, they are discussing things what uh, what the party officials do not understand. And um, Yoke Santal, because of personal reasons, also quit photography in that years. But after ten, after uh, yeah, after a couple of years, in '99, Laszlo Becker organized um, a memorial exhibition, and this exhibition created a new wave for the documentum um, documentum series because the technological environment and the institutional frames also changed so much that this immediate, immediately actualized the original ID of the exhibition itself. And, um, and so still two documentum exhibition have uh, ha took place uh, in Budapest, but there was also one very important aspect how Antiochus himself was thinking about his abandoned work. And here you can see the first version of the Elegancia, what I have shown. And then here you can see another version from 98, where he was repainting by hand the original version and also showing the frames of the slide, telling that this is nothing else than an object. And we can do with this object whatever we want, because this is not, it have no any kind of, uh, kind of um, values just as it is, like um, celluloid film part. And here you can see a third one, from 2003, where he already modi modified and used uh, uh, computer softwares to rework the original image. And I think that this transformation is very meaningful in, um, in, in seeing how something can be actualized in, in time and how can, how can we rethink original concept of photography. The number five was, uh, was, uh, uh, was organized in 2000 in Budapest and in, in, in Vesprem. And um, it's called, it was, it's, it's, its title was False Loyalty. And it was reflecting on, on, the, on the analog and digital, digital debate and, uh, and also the, uh, the impact of visual culture on photography, which was really very important for the generation who was working in that time. Just to tell some examples, here you see Gabor Gerhes, uh, a member of a generation upcoming in the 90s, uh, making very strange self-portraits, um, stage photography, but also using using elements which leads to the to the software world used in photography. Or Lajos Chonto, who who was also the title giver of this exhibition, who was working with archive photographs and combining it with different uh, kind of messages. Or Andre Koronci, who was um, who was photographing different body imprints by different objects, or yeah, that was the last example. And um, the last documentum uh, happened four years later in 2004 in Budapest and in Dunaujváros with the title "The Reality Strikes Back." And what uh, made it very important was the change of the generation, because at that time there was an absolutely new. Uh, generation finishing their studies in the in the MoMA University, and what was a very important change and a very important aspect 
that um, that there was a female takeover in that uh, photographic generation a lot of very exciting upcoming uh, new young uh, talented uh, women artists who uh, express their lifestyle and um, and uh, and life experience uh, in the in the frames of photography and that created a really interesting exhibition and also because of uh, of the fact that uh, that even we went through different waves but they again wanted to go against the different uh, canons and and the different um, different um, uh, um, understanding of what and how a photo artwork should look like uh, christina erdey here's judith alec who was also uh, both of them female photographers uh, um, presenting a kind of subcultures in of their life for Sabo, Sabo to Char, uh, Charlotte Sabo, and on the end Gabriela Chosso, who who was also uh, port, uh, working with different very very slight um, slight interventions in um, in making portraits. So the history of the Documentum project uh, uh, also proved that in Hungary, this uh, this changes of, of generations and changing of the institutional and technological frames are very very important to 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 follow and to understand the this this whole project. And just uh, as a summary, I wanted to get back to this uh, these four four points. What I was uh, I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, and so maybe you understand better how. Um, uh, how this project became so important in describing photographic identity and why there's a lot of lot of things what we still can learn from from history to understand where we are where we go thank you very much and so i try to stop to share the presentation yeah i'm here again yeah thank you very much george um Again, we are accepting the questions. If if any of any of our uh, yeah, you did. Do you think of uh, making a digital archive on this documental project, or will you continue the work? With with Anta Jokes, uh, so I did not mention, but myself, I was I was uh, curating with Anta the last one. Uh, the Documentum uh, six, and uh, from that moment uh, we we were we were thinking to 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 continue and to think over what could be the important when could be when when could get when when could that be important to make a new one, but um, but uh, but it, it it creates a lot of questions. So so I think that just after. Having a lot of phone calls with Anto uh, today as well, that that he somehow is also seeing that the technological changes got us to a direction where where there is no um, there is no moment in yet maybe where we could make such a strong statement how what what they did before and what was done in 2000 and 2004. So in that sense, it's uh, the question is about the future is that it's uh, the future is unseen, it is one thing. <laughs> and the other thing is that regarding the archive, this is also something what, what should be considered because now when I was preparing for the show, I was asking, asking him to, to, to send me over some images, not from one part from the first one, but from the other part from the second, the, the 2000 and the 2004 one that he said, you don't have. So in that sense, it's really, really, really very meaningful. Also in your case, and also in, in our case, that these projects are passing away. And of course we have these leaflets or whatever, but the participants are fading away in time. And I think that for the young generation, it would be also very important to see this kind of case studies as experimental institutional, um, uh, how is it called? Um, 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 yeah, so 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 new post to, to try new possibilities and to to try try new territories and to present uh, the work elsewhere if there is no possibility to present it in the biggest museums. I remember in uh, Documentum Six exhibition, 
um, it was um, it was kind of uh, out of the blue for me. I was like a very young young guy, and uh, and uh, it's interesting perspective uh, to see that there, it's it's kind of an experiment. But when we were uh, very young photographers, as you mentioned, not just the girls but the boys as well, <laughs> we uh, for us it was like something. Uh, it was the exper experience of entering the the big museum and the and the and the and the big curator is inviting you know the work into the into this uh, exhibition. So I, I I really had a different different perspective uh, uh, at that time, which is I just, uh, I, just I just would like to under like underline the. Uh, the importance of of, of Antiochus in this sense. So when when we are speaking, when Michaela was speaking about the transgenerational issues, I think that this is really really very rare, also in Hungarian photography, that uh, that uh, that somebody could could refresh his ideas and to to involve not just not just photographers and to understand their work and not be jealous on their work, but to but to invite them, but also. How, how Anta was immediately creating um, an atmosphere in 2000, mainly when he could uh, uh, immediately convince all of the young theoreticians from Attila Horányi to Katalin Timar to, to a lot of other people to, to be involved and to add their own perspective to the topics. And I think that this is, um, this is, the, this is the point. And um, yeah, tomorrow we will speak more about the visions and tomorrow we will speak about the future and maybe this, uh, this overlapping of, of, of the generations and the interest uh, of the young generations toward the old ones, this will come back as a topic, but maybe maybe we should also, or we can also already switch to the round table discussion because I think that uh, everybody's here from the, from the today lectures and, then, um, and then, uh, then we can continue that way to reflect to each other as well, if you agree, Ariel. Definitely, definitely. Uh, actually, I, I, I wanted to ask something and it's, a. Uh... You, I would wanted to ask you about something, but then, then I realized that the question shouldn't be asked, uh, proposed to you, but, but uh, to Michael and Susanna rather, is that uh, I often have the feeling uh, that uh, uh, neighboring countries are sort of doing this very similar work, very, very similar uh, process. They are going through uh, development alongside each other but there is often there is no, you know, no in, there's no interconnectivity. Or the, there's no crossing from one to the other. So, like something very similar to this documentum series in the 70s, 80s, uh, was happening in Slovakia, uh, probably. And 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 that. How do you see was? Was there or was there a possibility of uh, being interconnected? This, it's a very interesting question, and this is why I was uh, I was mentioning this this these four four crucial points, like the institutional frame, the local interest, the technical environment, etc. Because I think that um, that this is not so clear that the developments are so parallel at that time. Jokes was was uh, as an organizer was not interested in the in the parallelities. He was much more interested to to define and to declare what's going on here. And I was, for example, of, of course, the Hungarians like you did and Darion, you know well that in Hungary in the nineties uh, and also when you started your career, Arion, there was a lot of questions about the value of documentarism as a, as a, as a Hungarian whatever. Uh, like like something to follow or something to start with, and you know I was shocked when I was in 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 Warsaw in 2000. I don't remember when, and I just bumped into an exhibition which was called Post Documentarism, and I was absolutely absolutely surprised that wow, what does this mean? What does it mean post? And I was I was uh, facing that there is a new generation of photographers in Poland who do not want to cut their roots from the earlier generation of documentary photographers, but they say that, that they are following somehow the earlier past, but, but using a, a totally different language. 
And so in that sense, that's why I am, I'm so curious about, um, about this, um, this, this uh, local talks and local, local, local interest, et cetera, et cetera. Because what we see on festivals, what we see on different group exhibitions are, are coincidences, coincidentally connection points, what are usually managed and usually, usually um, uh, generated by the, by the lucky curators who oversee the, the different countries maybe. But, uh, but getting, getting back to this, um, to this um, uh, round table thing and getting back to the today, uh, today um, general question of past, I was just wondering that, um, and maybe this is a question for Michaela because you are the youngest, that, so one question, where does the past end? I think it's a very interesting question. The second question will be before you answer that regarding the, the socialist heritage or whatever, but, but, but coming back to photography, is the past important for, for you or for, for Slovakian photographers or local past, past of photography? I think I can only answer from a personal point of view. Uh, I think connecting connecting to the photographers, obviously everyone has a has a different way uh, of connecting to to the medium and of exploring uh, whatever kind of kind of topics. For me, personally, past is uh, I mean very very important. Uh, where it ends, wow! I think I think that's a, that's a very uh, <laughs> That's a very difficult question that, to be honest, I don't really, I don't really have the answer for right now. Uh, but I think for me personally, it is very, very important because I am very intrigued by it. I am very intrigued by our collective and historical memory uh, about how we're getting, uh, how we're being taught about our collective and historical memory in schools or how we're connected to our country. Uh, but of course, I cannot say that our local photography scene, I cannot speak for, for other photographers uh, based, in, based in Slovakia, but, but uh, for myself and uh, for some other photographers uh, that I, whose work that I've, I've seen in, in Slovakia, I have noticed that there is, there, is, there is an identity topic going on quite a lot. There, is, there are people that uh, are in a way exploring their identity through their projects, which I think it's also, it's also a common thread around uh, and in Central Europe, to be honest. Did you have any influence by a curator to deal with, uh, with your past or to deal with the archives, your personal archives? Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, curator. Uh, to be honest, the way it started is that my my mother would just send me the, the photographs when I was in lockdown in London. And uh, she started doing uh, as something that she found funny because she, she thought that it would be interesting for me to see it. And uh, because I didn't know about him, it was like a whole different world to me. Uh, so there was no particular influence from uh, any curators at the very beginning, but then as soon as I started researching for the project, uh, then I was like, whoa, I really don't know much about, also because I studied in London, um, both my BA and MA, I was like uh, surprised of how much I don't know <laughs> about our, our local uh, Central or Eastern European scene, to be honest. Uh, but then, for example, I looked a lot at uh, a photographer, uh, Rafael Milach. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, or uh, there was a photographer, Andras Ladoci, I think from Budapest or Hungary overall. And, uh, and, I, I, and also some, uh, some younger generations of, uh, of Slovak photographers who, I don't know, have graduated from... Uh, uh, the art university of um, whose work I found really, really interesting. And also uh, their work from what I've seen, maybe 
not a lot of them uh, were focusing on, on post-socialism and, and, and socialism, but as I said, a lot of their work reminded me of, of mine because of the identity aspect there. There was an interesting question uh, that uh, was sent to me in a secret chat, is that where does the past not end, but where does it begin? And I, it reminded me of, uh, of uh, something that, uh, that we talk about this recent history of the region. Uh, and it seems, so this socialism seems like the and only interesting topic in this region. In if we uh, think about photography, and uh, and uh, I find it quite interesting and different from, for example, if I go to France, uh, they 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 uh, uh, photograph the uh, the fields where uh, Napoleon fought the wars, and that's that's contemporary photography. You know, <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the photographer whose whose work. Uh, is like this. So why why is that that we um, that we seem to be how to say stuck in this post Second World War and pre nineteen ninety uh, zone of uh, experiences? I just can can recall something about Hungarian photo history, but I think that for the Hungarian photographers also there is this pressure on their shoulders of some internationally recognized Hungarian, originally Hungarian photographers from, from Andre Kertész till, till Kappa, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, that this is a very, very good question. Where does the past begins? And I think that, that for, a, for a contemporary young or whatever Hungarian photographer, certainly the past begins after this big generation of international artists, just because it's, it's impossible to, 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 to compete with them or to come up, come go after them when, when they are in big museums and and this is like a, like a big sign that okay Hungarian for Hungarian origin origin is 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 is, uh, is done by this this person so there's something else where we should begin but on the other hand um, what you mentioned that this afterwar period why is that uh, that so 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 meaningful and then then i think that there is a local answer also that that regarding the fights the local fights of of uh, of photograph photography how it became from a romantic is romantic propaganda image how it turned toward the, an experimental territory it goes back to the to the 50s i think and that's it that is that is the context what what we what we have to um, uh, where we have to position ourselves, or, or so. but I'm very curious about Susanna's um, opinion. Please tell tell your own experience and um, and this transgenerational question and past, etc. I'm not sure if I understood the question. You want me to There's comment? This, yeah, the... just, just comment, and also I would like to you to comment also this this um, this uh, question what we raised on the beginning, these parallelities. What Arion was mentioning that this uh, what do you think about this yeah actually that was something he took uh took out of my mouth because this is what i wanted to ask you about if you heard about the uh <clears throat> the project which uh uh from from the other countries uh of central europe uh as we understand it uh uh which which might be similar because uh, you know i i do see do see a lot of similarities in uh especially in uh what was happening uh in 90s uh the one thing uh uh which i didn't mention uh in my presentation but actually i i uh i draw on 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 the on that fact uh was that uh uh, I think it was uh, it was only in nineties uh, when uh, when the borders opened, or maybe end of eighties uh, when it was slowly opening. Uh, uh, that there was a big surprise on both sides uh, of the Iron Curtain. That uh, already in sixties uh, you could see this this uh, uh, very similar. Uh, ideas developing on both sides of the iron curtain then even in spite of uh, of this isolation the artists uh, 
uh, including uh, photographers, uh, and 60s was really strong in this, uh, developed project and, and thought about the ideas which were similar to, to France or any other uh, Western countries. And I know that it was quite, quite a surprise to, uh, to realize that. Uh, and uh, during your presentation, I was just thinking that uh, how much we actually thought of uh, the parallels within the Iron Curtain, because obviously there are, especially 70s are very strong, as you said, uh, in this experimenting uh, photography and video being a very strong part of it. Uh, and uh, plus uh, the specialty of this region was that uh, willing or not, uh, it became uh, it became somehow um, in the opposition of uh, uh, of the uh, of the state of of the regime. Even if the artists uh, were not planning it, uh, but uh, the fact that it was forming as a strong uh, as a strong voice, it became uh, suspicious. Uh, and of course, there were uh, uh, there were artistic initiatives which which were uh, mentioned to be uh, to be in oppositions. But all this uh, I found included even uh, in, in the documentum project. And so I thought that it, it might have been, uh, or it might be for the future, it might be interesting to uh, really, um, I'm not an expert in, in this period, in 70s, you know, that, that's not, not my field, but it might be really uh, interesting uh, to, to sit together like experts in, in, uh, in these periods uh, from, uh, uh, from Slovakia, Ch the Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary, and and just uh, find this this these parallels because they they might show they might show a lot about the history about development of photography or uh, photography and the other related media, and uh, also uh, also about um, nature uh, nature of, of a human being as well because I think it, it partly comes uh, f uh, not only from the similar historical development but it partly comes uh, from uh, the development the development of the uh, global society which you, you just cannot stop even though you are under some kind of oppre political oppression uh, oppression or anything uh, like that. So maybe that would be an interesting international or central European project to to get a stronger voice for, uh, for for outside. I think that this is a very important perspective. I think that uh, what what you did is also working on, or, or what we are we should work on is first of all to write these local histories, and this is um, this is uh, this is of course I think that we parallel with that we should already already try to find um, find um, find partners to to communicate about the the, uh, the similarities and the parallel stories but in the moment I also don't know and it's not not just because of course I am very much interested but of course when we are when I am approaching the the Polish or the or the or the Slovakian or whatever photography my so I my interest is sporadic in a way so I think that that maybe this is the first step just to just to, to to speak about this issue but I'm very much motivated to 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 go ahead and to and to see what 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 happened on the other side because what is a fact is that these artists were not so much interested in that I don't know how it was in Slovakia but as far as I as I have uh, experienced in the fine art field as well that there everybody of us in the east east block were facing in one direction and this was the west and of course, if in the on the West there were some contact points, for example, in male art or in experimental photography, that's fine. But originally, the the idea was something to relate to the to the uh, to the cut, cutting edge happening of the West. Mario, uh, I'm, I'm, I was thinking whether to uh, drop this stone into the conversation or not. But uh, I sometimes I feel when there is this conversation. Uh, or similar conversation about the uh, past of the photography uh, of the region's photography, that Hungary is somehow uh, uh, somehow is isolated, 
And that isolation may come from actually from, from the First World War, <laughs> of uh, that there is this. Um, uh, so we Hungarians might uh, feel that there is a, some kind of a, you know, some kind of a, uh, we have to define uh, Hungarian photography against or as different from, for, for example, from Slovakian or uh, Czechoslovakian photography. And during uh, Zuzana's uh, presentation, I brought a question to myself, is that, for example, this, the, the humor when you were showing Martin Kollar's picture, uh, you know, that's, the, that's his brand, I think. Uh, there was this, you know, Slovakian photography or Czechoslovakian photography is humorous. You know, there is a, this, uh, uh, there is this element. And um, so that, that thing is already taken. So when I was thinking about how, what is, what is the uh, characteristic of Hungarian photography, then I was always thinking that it has, it, it's different. But actually, if we think about the region, we should find, you know, there, there, there must be connecting uh, elements or characteristics. Yeah, you know, um, there are, uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 the way you put it, like that thing is already I taken. <laughs> No, 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 no. But uh, that was actually that was actually my thought, or or that came to me when I was uh, formulating uh, my presentation, uh, uh, but in in a little bit different context. Because uh, using, for example, your work, <laughs> uh, I want uh, wanted to say that do not uh, take the subject of uh, socialist times as some as a subject which has been already taken. For example, by Arion, you know, because uh, it always depends. It always depends on uh, on the artistic um, uh, well creativity vision on the artistic vision, you know. And you are right. Uh, th there is a, there is a certain stream of uh, Slovak documentary photography. I think the peak of it is already uh, gone, but but. Uh, uh, it still has uh, its followers and and uh, 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 and practitioners. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the line which is which has this kind of sarcasm or humor. You know, it comes. I I think uh, I would say it it started somewhere in the end of uh, 80s and and uh, developed uh, very strongly in, in 90s and Martin Kollar is uh, one of those who uh, became who has become very successful internationally uh, like okay uh, spreading uh, spreading it is as some, something typical uh, Slovak that's why I also used uh, you, you used uh, him as an, as an example but uh, you know um, I think for you, uh, Hungarian photographers or Hungarian theorists, uh, it might be even more difficult than for uh, for people from outside to help you to find a definition, like what, what distinguishes the, the Hungarian photography. And you are right uh, that uh, your uh, glorious past, I mean, these big names uh, very often connected to, to Paris and, 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 and France and, and um, helping uh, and this connection helping like really uh, um, uh, gain the fame. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to now make it easy. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the all these the, these big Hungarian names, uh, they uh, they really uh, receive their credits because because they uh, they they just deserve it. Uh, but uh, I know that this uh, to beat it or or to uh, to become uh, somehow dis distinct to distinguish uh, you yourself from from this past must be very difficult. For example, in Slovakia, we do not have this strong generation of such a such a internationally famous photographers. We do have like 
some names, but it's not that strong as you have. So it, this is already your uh, um, your specialty. Burden. That's already <laughs> uh, burden, burden, if you want. Well, that's that, that, that's uh, advantage or disadvantage the way you put it, right, or the way you look at it. But that that might be something what what already what you can already uh, put into the definition of what is Hungarian photography now. Obviously, there is still something which makes it difficult uh, uh, to to cope with with your glorious past. And there is one more thing which might not add that much to uh, to help you to define your position. But uh, what was very significant for me to discover uh, and it was uh, beginning of two well beginning uh, around 2005 six seven uh, when I first time uh, came to Budapest for the for portfolio review and it was very interesting to to find out that there was a lot of uh, documentary photography but there was hardly any uh, conceptual photography uh, and suddenly after I don't know, uh, for years, it changed a lot. Suddenly I see, I don't know if I'm just that uh, unlucky, but I see a lot of uh, uh, conceptual photography, but uh, but less documentary. Do That's, you? Uh, sort of, sort of right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know because of course I'm not an expert in, in Hungarian photography, but somehow uh, I came across uh these discoveries so if that helps <laughs> yeah 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 uh well it's it's something that we uh i myself don't really uh, uh like to admit but there was uh, this documentary photography seemed that it became not so sexy anymore like uh, uh about 10 years ago which is an interesting why why then 20 years ago you wanted to say Oh, okay. 20, I think. 20, 20, 20 years ago, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and 10 years ago, even, even less. Um, Michaela, I, I wanted to ask you about this, about this uh, sarcasm and humor thing, because uh, if I look at your work, it's, it's different. And also there is the, uh, in, 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 in uh, Slovakian, Photographers' work. I often see this uh, uh, melancholic approach, which is which is, is it is it a similar shift against? Mm, I think it has it has it has a lot to do uh, with the topic, uh, mm -hmm. because I was trying to, I wasn't trying to put myself in the shoes of my parents or grandparents, but I was trying to um, connect with them and connect with the history and connect with the landscape more. I didn't feel that a, a satirical or funny way of showing it would uh, would work, and and this just this just really this just really came to me. And when I was doing the post production process, I think to me it was it was the aesthetics that worked the most for the project. Uh, but right now, it's interesting because I'm I'm doing quite a lot of research about central futurism and Eastern futurism overall, and how to really move forward and, and uh, uh, let the past be, be the past. Uh, and uh, more and more I'm thinking about images that may be slightly, slightly funnier or may slightly also play on the stereotype that uh, many people, for example, in the West or wherever else might have about Central Eastern Europe. So I think it really, really depends just on the topic. And, and in that project, I... Uh, I don't know. I felt like that that might be the best possible way of of portraying it, but uh, maybe it isn't. <laughs> so I'm I'm very happy that Adam, you have followed us. Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, because sure. because that would be really in, in, interesting to to hear about your comment. Yeah, I must say that uh, it was very uh, nice to listen to all of you, and I made a lot of notes. So um, uh, maybe I would like to uh, share some after thoughts. Uh, uh, with you. Uh, yesterday we had, a, we had a meeting with a friend of mine, Karolina Lewandowska, who just got back from France and she's now in Warsaw. And she was um, 
uh, for several years a curator of for photography uh, at Pompidou. So we uh, talked about uh, her practice and, and her achievements when it's uh, coming to, uh, let's say, like promoting of the Central uh, European photography. And this was very, uh, and it was like a meeting for the, you know, number of collectors uh, of photography here in Warsaw. Uh, and I was moderating this. So uh, we actually had an interesting conversation about the dynamics of this last 10 years of uh, what was achieved, so to speak, also by her and, um, and the committee that she organized uh, uh, to acquire, for example, photography from uh, Central uh, and Eastern Europe. And this sort of committees are actually like working uh, at other museums too. So um, it's worth like uh, um, remembering that uh, it's not only us, who define somehow the, uh, the field, but it's also like people from outside who are like specifically, uh, you know, traveling, for example, to Romania, like uh, this year's uh, Oracle curators or like the committee uh, for Pompidou traveling around, for example, Baltic states to acquire some new things, but also to get to know what's going on. And the same is going on uh, with the MoMA committee for acquisitions, uh, uh, with curators who are organizing this and are, you know, basically uh, somehow um, researching the, uh, uh, the field. Uh, so this is also like a part of this frame and uh, what they are looking for. Uh, and this is kind of um, uh, interesting because this history of the Central Europe for this uh, people is, uh, is extremely interesting and inspiring till today. And this includes, of course, like, you know, both world wars, uh, interwar times, and also, you know, communist times, uh, different uh, sort of things happening in all of those countries and the uh, post-communist transformation. So this is like, a, let's say, like a fundamental thing, uh, looking from uh, the perspective of, uh, let's say, London, uh, New York, or Paris, uh, uh, what is the identity and the, and the, you know, somehow what's the uh, point of this, uh, having this like a specific uh, uh, region uh, in their, you know, in their like kind of focus. And there is of course also uh, one uh, more uh, very important uh, thing that is somehow connecting this uh, uh, research. It's, um, uh, it's let's say uh, a Jewish aspect. To this yeah so like you are saying for example hungarian photographers i would say hungarian jewish photographers right or like polish lithuanian jewish photographers and this is like a big diaspora of let's say central european jews who are now for example you know uh, also looking for their roots uh, being part of the let's say east coast elite uh, cultural elite and this is also very clear that this jewish identity is uh, transgressing the uh, national borders uh, of, let's say, today Central Europe or even pre-war Central Europe. And it is uh, very fluid and, and there are many like different uh, uh, tensions, but it's still very vivid as a kind of, I would say, uh, cultural um, factor uh, of also how we uh, should understand what is Central Europe today. Um, and you know, I, I think that, uh, so this is like uh, to answer this question or try to answer, I would, I would say to, uh, that was uh, in, this, uh, in this panel, how we ended up here, like with, you know, with the central, with this idea of central uh, uh, and Eastern Europe. And, uh, and I guess, um, um, you know, it's also very specific when it comes to this uh, geographical, uh, dimensions because for example i'm going to open an exhibition in vilnius uh like within a month about the central european photo books but there is for example nobody from the baltic states in this panel even though for me as a person born in warsaw the austro-hungarian empire is less important than for example this extension to the uh, baltic countries uh, so you know and from the i guess from the budapest perspective or like ljubljana it's super clear that this uh, habsburgs past it's still like uh, uh, having some energy emanating um, uh, till today 
but for example, you know, it's like a changing, uh, this, this geography is changing all the time. I will, I will talk about it uh, tomorrow a bit more because I think, for example, these Lithuanians are uh, also very important. And um, it's a kind of pity that none of them is uh, taking part in this panel, but they have also like a blooming in a way, Central Eastern European um, scene or photography scene. And uh, uh, you know, I was uh, I was thinking that perhaps this uh, the situation that we have here, like uh, even with uh, us not being so sure how to pronounce one another's names, is kind of okay. You know that this is also part of this um, uh, you know the definition of the region. You know that uh, the Hungarians have their specific history, like uh, still embedded in this First World War, and you know. Poles have a different thing. We don't know how to pronounce names. Sometimes even don't know what is first, what is second name. So it's not only for Americans that they have this kind of you know problems, but it's also for us. So we have to negotiate all the time. You know who is who, uh, who's doing what. You know, and um, and this is and this is kind of um, interesting because it's very fluid and it's like uh, steering a lot of you know like. Uh, very inspiring situations, I would say, uh, like crossing the borders between those uh, countries. So it's like even in today's politics, if Poland is with Hungary or against Czechia or like uh, where are the Slovaks, you know, and so on and so on. So uh, even though there is like a before, but we don't know really how it works um, uh, and so on. So I guess this is uh, like this kind of heterogeneous um, a puzzling kind of identity that that it's uh, still inspiring to uh, the photographers and they are somehow trying to translate this um, uh, condition uh, because it's a in a way a very contemporary condition not only for central europeans but uh, people do experience this also in other parts of the world but but here it's like um we know how how it works so we are not surprised and i think that the photographers in a way are Mm, uh, from Central Europe, they are more into having a very good translation of uh, what they want to say to other people and to other kind of audiences. And, uh, I, and I think that uh, this uh, identity issues like uh, we were, uh, like you were talking about, like um, uh, about this, uh, if we should know the, the history of like, for example, past generations, uh, uh, like in Hungarian photography and you know, how, how we should relate to this. It's, it's also like a kind of foreign country that we sometimes don't know what to do with this. So, uh, you know, this post-documentary uh, exhibition like uh, that, that, uh, uh, that you mentioned briefly, uh, and I curated this, and this was a term for me uh, taken from Marta Rosler's uh, text. And it, it was kind of not only a, about constructing a certain uh, narrative between like uh, generations of Polish photographers, but also trying to uh, situate this Polish photographers in the context of what they really love, for example, knowing much better than their own past. And this was, for example, the American uh, photography. Uh, so it was, it, it was kind of very bizarre, um, uh, I would say, disorder that they didn't know their own like, um, um, let's say masters, but they knew very well what's going on in, you know, in London or in, in New York. Uh, so this was uh, uh, an interesting context for me to, uh, to meet those two ends somehow. Because, you know, like, um, uh, even like, uh, um, like we're talking about this uh, um, projects uh, uh, of Michaela, that you have like those uh, whole generation or even more than one generation already of artists and photographers who are like totally free to go to study abroad, you know, to do things abroad and to come back and to do something here. And, and this, is, uh, this is also interesting that they have to negotiate between uh, what is there, what they know from, you know, from the very good uh, universities or art academies in London and also what they want to find out or take from their heritage in a way. And, th and this is again, like constitu constituting a very, uh, from my perspective, very interesting, like a situation that is very unique in a way. 
uh, because uh, it might be you know subjective in a way that you you can take like uh, like pick the cherries and uh, take what you like but this is okay again like uh, in today's world in a way um, so I guess this is um, um, uh, this is a very specific region and I and I think that we somehow uh, uh, you know, uh, started to discuss this. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have like a point to, to, to my, uh, uh, to what I'm saying, because like I told you, I was like writing down what you are saying. And uh, uh, perhaps tomorrow I will have more clear thoughts about uh, uh, what I would like to say. And I would try to address them uh, in my presentation, but it's extremely, extremely inspiring. And I must say that it's also, uh, showing how uh, lively this scene uh, is, uh, and how you know different, differentiated in a way. So um, uh, you know, I was also very happy to see uh, even this this Hungarian um, like uh, newspapers and zines. So I, I took several you know uh, screenshots of this uh, to to look closer into you know Kereke stuff I didn't know about. So it's, it was very illuminating and. Uh, I'm very happy and also very controversial. So I'm very happy um, that I could uh, follow what you were uh, um, saying. Yeah, so this is this is like my, my comment without questions, but I'm very thankful and uh, uh, I hope to, you know, that we'll continue this discussion also tomorrow. Definitely we will. And uh, uh, as I was listening to you, I had a few, uh, uh, things that I wanted to react to, but I just looked at the, looked at our clock, and it's already eight o'clock. Uh, and uh, if there is, um, uh, if someone would like to react, I think we have, we can allow ourselves a little uh, uh, delay, and 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 someone can uh, react to uh, Adam's uh, comment if you want, or we can agree that we continue tomorrow. Oh, I'm very, very curious about how we will follow tomorrow. So I think that that kind of not commenting and not not closing down the discussion, but just postponing it to to tomorrow tomorrow by listening to all the new new presentations. I think it will be more exciting. Okay. Well, we so we all agree in this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Gabor, it's it's really perfect how uh, how we manage this uh, you know online session like uh, straight to the like a single minute. So it's like 8 p.m. and we can close it down. I mean, this is really important to, to have this. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, also you, you were saying several times that you were like, you know, moderating is not my uh, thing, but uh, this was really great. So uh, uh, thank you for this. Thank you. Um, well then, we arrived to the uh, end of today. Uh, I would like, to invite today's speakers for tomorrow, if you are interested and you, if you have the time to uh, join us, it would be great. Um, thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Susanna, Jolt, and Judith. Tomorrow morning, uh, you will be uh, the hosts in the present and future section. Please, if you didn't, uh, I'm telling it to the audience. I don't know if how many people are following us, but uh, if you can, uh, look at the uh, exhibition, which is uh, accompanying the uh, uh, the uh, symposium, and tomorrow we will continue uh, with four, uh, and then another six very interesting presentations. So please return. Thank you, everyone. So good morning for everybody who is participating in the Working Context Conference, which is the second day of this event organized by the MoMA University here in Budapest. And um, the conference is about 
how to identify East European photography. And uh, in this topic, we created three different um, sections, if I can say. The first was about the past. Historical example, we examined and we analyzed about how we came here. The second, this morning panel is about the present, which is uh, uh, trying to give a status quo about uh, what is what are the different good practices and strategies here in Middle Europe to identify ourselves. And in this um, section, you will hear different lecturers from different fields. We will have um, have a presentation from the art management side, curatorial side, artistic side. And for the first, we will have a very interesting presentation by Thomas Opitz, who is running with uh, her part, his partner, Bea, a um, very interesting uh, uh, photo gallery, the Tobe Gallery here in Budapest, which is focusing on um, on uh, mostly on the on the young generation of artists and also trying to help them to establish their career. So that is why it will be very interesting to hear his uh, presentation about what a gallery network means. So let me give you give give the floor to Thomas and please start your presentation. You have twenty five minutes and then we have some minutes also for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hi. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, for, for this uh, magnificent event. I, I followed it yesterday and it was pretty good and, and with a lot of nice ideas. And yes, my, my presentation is about uh, the art gallery as a matter of network. And this is because um, uh, I'm still thinking, or we, that uh, the galleries are seen like a kind of just or an exhibition venue or an exhibition space or uh, the, the, this uh, very capitalist thinking of galleries that they want to own all the money of the artists. But actually we, we do very different uh, things and uh, the way we approach all this and I want to to share this with you today and for this we will have 24 five minutes uh, first of all uh, a brief introduction of myself I born in and lived in Venezuela for 31 years uh, but with Hungarian roots I, I have to say and uh, actually I grow up more, we can say, than, than a Hungarian as than a Venezuelan, but I, I received both culture uh, in, of course, in, in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, I degree like an architect and I moved here to Budapest in 2003 and with the idea to prove myself in another place. And because Hungary wasn't an alien place for me, I, I decided to move here to Hungary. It's uh, another presentation why, but maybe everybody knows that in Venezuela is very hard the situation. And I married my lovely wife, Bea, since uh, 2013. And this is an important date because not just because the wedding, but our honeymoon is the gallery which are, we are still running. Uh, just a little bit to, to have some, some images also. Then the top you see Caracas. It's a very busy, but at the same time powerful city. It's not looks as Pal Rosti in the middle of 19th century photographed but uh, it's a multicultural place uh, with, with a lot of green, actually, with that big mountain called Avila, from, it's which is a nat national park, and uh, it's an it's a energetic city. As you see in the bottom left, I was close by photography since I'm very young. This was maybe in New York, a picture with my family. And I was uh, very close to photography since that. And uh, the other picture is the Universidad Central de Venezuela, where I degree as an architect, I said. 
which gave me these uh, very strong, we can say, multicultural uh, feelings. And the main important thing is the mix of architecture and photography and art. So as you see, maybe you know that this is the Aula Magna of the university. And on the top, you can see Alexander Calder's uh, acoustic uh, clouds. It was, it's a masterpiece of art and, and, and architecture in the same place. And this, which is a kind of decoration, it's at the same time, it's a functional uh, element in this, uh, in this venue, which is the big hall theater of the, of the university. Um, I had magnificent teachers during this time uh, who make me be more closer to photography through architecture and vice versa. So, now I will start with the with a, with a story of the gallery uh, and, uh, and what, what, why we did it. Before, before 2013, we, we, with my wife Bea, we traveled a lot and, and we, thought, we saw that, that in other places this uh, type of gallery, which are dealing more with the contemporary photography, is, is on the city. So you can see it in, in, in Miami, in London, in Barcelona, in Paris, of course. So with the idea to bring a new color to the city, we, we created this uh, first uh, space that we were running and it was just 10 square meters. Actually, it was the smallest gallery in town, we can say which is in Venice, for example, it's pretty common. Uh, you can see just a door and one vitrine with, with one work. But yeah, these 10 square meters was uh, actually a challenge also. But at the same time, it was the, the most uh, secure way to start because uh, we were we were speaking on 2013, a little bit after the crisis and and it was uh, for us it was not so risky to start with something which is small affordable etc and actually to know the the market and also the 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 things that people would like to see or would like to engage with and because my background from from venice because my background from venezuela I, we, we had this idea to, to start with, with Ibero-American uh, photographers. And of course, there are a lot of who are friends of mine or alumni uh, or, or through other contacts that I had. So we started with, with this and with the idea, as I said, because we felt the, the emptiness or the missing of, of this type of galleries, actually there were, and for unfortunately other closed. Uh, we, we, we felt that the, the necessity or, or, or and looking for a, for a commitment to, to photography. And, uh, and there is this interrelation with MOME, with the university, because Bea did this uh, course of cultural and, and cultural management and uh, since the beginning, we had a very good uh, relationship with uh, teachers, students, and, and uh, people from, from MOME. Some illustration of these uh, first steps. Uh, as I said, we, we, we started with, with some of my, my friends or, or colleagues from, from Venezuela whom also are around, spread around the world. The uh, first one is uh, Marco Bell, who was a former student of, of mine in, in Venezuela. And he moved there then to New York, made a master in, in the Parsons University. And, uh, and we, we started actually uh, with him, with, with him the, these international uh, projects. Actually, as I mentioned, the, the gallery was so small, 10 square meters. So we used 
also the facade of the building to, to make some screens, some visuals. And uh, looking for this commitment to photography, we also are invite uh, many times, I won't say common people, but people who are not these very closed uh, uh, sector of their culture, we can say. And um, for example, for, for, for this exhibition, Ricardo Parra, we, we invite uh, this, uh, oh, I forgot his name ra randomly. Uh, who he has the 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 world uh, um, uh, record of of navigating with kayak, and um, and and he made he made his his uh, impressions of the exhibition through his experience in the in the kayaking through the ocean. So it was very very exciting, um, and then we start to think uh, how, how to build this new network. So already we have this from, from, from abroad, from the Venezuelan uh, relations and South American. And then we, we thought that we have to uh, energize this a little bit more. So let's, we, we, let, we started to, to see a little bit deeper the, the local scene and uh, to actually to contact uh, photographers and artists from the local scene and uh, try to to deal with them to to figure out the ways to how to exhibit and to show them and actually uh, from very the beginning we started to to think in a wider range of of works that we are showing even with the prices so because we felt that there is a also a misunderstanding of of how to to put prices uh, to to the works so uh, as I, as you see on the bottom there is some examples of of hungarian photographers shown at the gallery for example that that group small group exhibition of uh, Reiko Bohus, uh, Agnes Seperjes, and Aniko Robit. It was a very interesting show group because it was very abstract, very geometric, but at the same time, very and, and a very uh, good dialogue. And also in, in 2014 uh, was our first uh, participation at Art Market Budapest. And that was the point when we really saw uh, what what's what are the problems here in budapest with with uh, selling photography or 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 showing photography for a for a wider audience in terms of of a fair and not an exhibition because it's totally different thing and for that that uh, fair and after we did uh, his solo show we we invite Alex Plademund, who is one of the best uh, Spanish photographers right now and at, the, at that time too, and uh, and uh, it was a, a very nice exhibition and a very powerful presence with these works at the at the fair. But at that time, those collectors who were a little bit afraid about the prices, now they are. Uh, crying back those days when that that images or that works were, were were exhibited by us of course because now it's more expensive <laughs> and and the and because this uh, of of the not very clear uh, situation of the of the hung, of, of the contemporary photography uh, here in Budapest, we we thought that we have to step abroad, so look for 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 this international scene. So we start to build this international network. And at the beginning, uh, actually, we first visited the the fairs, start to to see 
how it looks like, how is the aura of these uh, places, how we can imagine ourselves in these uh, fairs. So we started just to, just to visit and then applying to those which are interesting for us. And um, of course, again, uh, because the, the, these expensive things we, we started with, with those fairs which are close by or, or, or nearby and, uh, and we, which we can go with car without too many uh, costs of transportation, etc. And, um, and, and this was actually Vienna and Milan. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, we still very interested about these all market so we went to other places uh, to look around and uh, as I mentioned uh, you can see it on the top the Mia photo fair which is in Milan that was our first participation and in Parallel Vienna which is a kind of underground uh, fair in Vienna and and we were we were very successful in both uh, I will be honest, on, on, on Milan, we, we didn't sell anything, but, but we get very good uh, connections and, and uh, network there. Actually, the lady in the red uh, shirt, she's a curator from Italy, and she made a very nice uh, uh, writing uh, uh, in a magazine, which were uh, featured in, in Paris Photo that year in 2016. So it was very, very good that first uh, presentation or presence in Milan because opened new, new doors and new network. And of course, Art Basel is a, is a place where, where every gallerist would like to be. And um, and, and we went to Art Basel Miami in 2016. Uh, we spent uh, a little bit longer time there to, to see what is this about and to understand things. And it was very interesting because uh, Paris Photo is the main of photography. Art Basel is the main of, of contemporary art, but there are also these uh, encounters between both and, and we saw uh, quite interesting at the same time, quite weird things. Uh, for example, that we saw uh, at uh, Paris Photo and Andre Curtis' work, uh, priced for one million euros, and at, and uh, actually then in the press release of Paris Photo appeared that this photograph was sold, but in Art Basel in the same gallery we saw the same picture so it was very interesting that um, that uh, appeared again the same so yeah then uh, we are talking about from uh, 2017 we saw that we have to amplify a little bit the network uh, we were already working with some uh, artists, but we wanted to open or, uh, a little bit uh, in a wider way, again, to reinforce this network. So we start with actually the Venezuelan diaspora, which was in that time very strong. Many, many people from when Venezuela left the country and, uh, and, uh, and started to, to work in other places. And at the same time, we, we felt that we need something or some other artists we are, which are uh, like a, make a very a stronger engagement. So looking for internationally recognized artists and with this trying to have an attention over the Hungarian scene as we are a Hungarian uh, gallery. So for this, uh, we did the, the last exhibition in 2017 at the gallery in, um, in this uh, small space at, at the new Leopold town, the 13th district of Budapest. And it was called Resistance, uh, which was uh, 
it's it's it was two meanings for us resistance to 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 resist and to to stay on our feet because uh, in that time we were thinking to move to another place because we felt that the 10 square meters is too small for us already so from one side it was that meaning and from other side is the the situation in Venezuela, which in that time was much more stronger, and it was the 15th anniversary or, or memory of, of that uh, very sad situation that happened in 20, 2002 there in, in Caracas. Uh, yeah, this was part of the exhibition. And uh, then in 2017, late, late 2017, we moved to our current space, which is an eight, in the eighth district in Brody Shandorutsa. And uh, it's a bigger space, almost 40 square meters, which for us now it's a perfect venue. Of course, every time newer visitors said, just, is just this the gallery? <laughs> but it's okay for us. And, and then, then is when we started to work with Daphna Talmor, who is a London-based uh, photographer and artist. Actually, she, born in, in, uh, she was born in Tel Aviv, but grew up in Venezuela. So we still remain with this connection between Venezuela and, 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 uh, and here, Hungary. And she accepted to, 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 to start to work with us. Actually, we were the first gallery uh, who worked with her he, she she was very she is very recognized in in london she she, um, she her work is in many collections uh, the deutsche bank collection and she made uh, workshops at the tate modern and actually now uh, her her book which is this constructed uh, constructed landscapes is uh, available it's a beautiful book so if you have time come to the gallery and you can see the the uh, we have there a, a book to show so with her we started a, a, another step in regarding to this uh, uh, major level of of quality we can say and and at the same time uh, more or less uh, there was the the um, presentation in, in the Festival of Art of uh, this project called Monsanto, a photographic investigation, but Mathieu, Mathieu Asselon, who is a Venezuelan French photographer. And uh, we get in contact with him and he was very pl pleased to, to, to be part of this idea to show this project uh, was his project here in Budapest and uh, and he actually he was the drive to to our stronger uh, participation or stronger uh, focus on the on the on the abroad and and on the on the outside uh, presence because he he told us that you should go to R and you should be in R because there is everybody and actually there is everybody there. So in 2018 was the year when, uh, when, um, when we start to thinking more in this uh, uh, thing and, uh, and to have a wider angle of international presence because the goal or, or our idea was that the Hungarian contemporary photography have to be seen abroad. Because when we traveled and, and we, we, we look around, we didn't see so much. Of course, there are those uh, artists who are living abroad and, and have uh, uh, presence because they are all already working with a, with a gallery abroad, but there are so many talented photographers here in Budapest and or in Hungary, and and we didn't see we didn't see so much abroad, and neither 
the the audience outside sorry so that was our goal uh, in 2018 so we started to apply for other fairs a little bit bigger ones and uh, and we were we were selected for mia again for vienna contemporary for photo london and for unseen amsterdam which were very 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 good in terms of 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 being in contact with a new newer audience and of course the 2019 was the star year for us when we applied with uh, Matte Borta for the Louis Rodelet Discovery Award at R, and we were selected, which was already a big thing. And this was the strategy that we, we talked with him. If we, we can apply for this uh, award and we are selected, that will be our next step to, to, to apply for the Paris Photo because the engagement of both uh, venues are very strong and um, and it was that so really really we applied for paris photo and we were selected it was the second time that we we applied and uh, that was a amazing situation for us also and and we felt that uh, many people rem remembered the, the exhibition of art and then we reconnect then they re reconnected with the party photos uh, booth that we had and uh, and this exhibition i would say the contact by by mate uh, was so successful that the festival of art brought it to china so it was shown in china and uh, last year in the festival of lots and uh, now there is in Frankfurt in the right uh, photo triennale, which is a, a fantastic uh, achievement, and and uh, and we are very very happy that he was selected for this. But and we think that this happened because because we helped him to bring it abroad. So last. But not least, move on. Of course, we have this last year, which was a pretty uh, unhappy for everybody. But uh, what we 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 had these things, and and we we move on, uh, trying to make a strong communication, not just online, but but we try to be present offline too, and we get this way very a lot of focus from the media. So we did uh, a lot of exhibitions. Uh, uh, thanks for a uh, nice support from the National Cultural Fund of Hungary, and we had we could had the the program of 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 our gallery. So it was uh, Jean Francois Lepage last year, a nice exhibition opened by Jolt. Uh, then we had again contact, which the the bigger audience didn't saw here in Budapest, then uh, Reka, Akos Mayor, and uh, this year we started with uh, Kinchu Bede, who is an amazing uh, young photographer with a lot of uh, uh, awards already and, and, uh, and uh, presence abroad and on the autumn, if everything goes well, we will have many others and then we got uh, Anthony Marchetti's exhibition which started again this engagement with people so many people came to see the exhibition and this is what I thought uh, told about the the media presence uh, at European photography uh, the cover is by Mate which which is amazing and uh, now already published the Fresh Eyes, which is the Goop magazine book. Uh, Kinche's work is there, and also uh, made in medium format. Akos Mayor works appeared. So I guess we are already on time. Just point and uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm to your help or or 
to answer it. Thank, thank you very you, much. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, introduction of how you have you have um, uh, built up this this uh, fantastic gallery. But I just have one question just before the others. How were you accepted here in Budapest? Because you absolutely arrived as an outsider. You absolutely have built up your your network as uh, as somebody who were not known at all in Hungarian art art and uh, art market circles. What were your feelings? Uh, well, it's of course it's it's uh, yeah it's it's uh, yeah it's it's a kind of 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 uh, how how open is the scene to to know new ones. Of course. Uh, you can be an outsider, but if the other side is uh, pretty open, uh, then then you can you can engage with. So it's the same from my side. If if I'm a closed mind person, I I never be I never be the, in the possibility of do or to do thing a thing like that. So it's it's a it's a it's a think of, of, of how open-minded is, is the person who is in the other side. So, and that's actually, this is the thing that I'm feeling is missing here in, in, in Budapest. And, and yesterday was nice uh, to hear Susanna who, who said, um, uh, I am a gallerist who are very positive or very naive, where I am on the same way also. So I'm trying to be as positive as I can, but I, I, I think sometimes I'm very naive to think that, oh, if I bring uh, uh, the, the, the exhibition of Matthew Asselin, oh, many people will come, but actually they didn't. <laughs> so we had more visitors from, from other sites or from other networks, we can say, than from the photography's uh, network. So, or, or, or we did a workshop with, with uh, Daphna and, and there was not too much uh, people who wanted to come. Of course, uh, it was a success, but, but we, we always thinking that could be better. And, and this is maybe the naive thing of, of it. We will continue this this uh, this conversation of the uh, in in the in the roundtable discussion. Just a short short question of Arion. Then we have to go ahead. I see, Arion. Yeah, uh, thank you. I really liked your uh, presentation because it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, it was very nice to see how it's how it how it grew and started. And I and I think we are on a uh, on a uh, <clears throat> upward upward uh, uh, track. Um, I wanted to ask um, that beyond your uh, personal connection, why, why or how do you uh, consider this Latin American connection with uh, Central Europe? So why, why is, I mean, Tobe Gallery has this focus uh, and and I really find it interesting. My some of the favorite photographers like Matthew and uh, and also Alex uh, came here because of you. So how how do you how do you find this? Is it a mission that you take, or is there some how to well, say logical decision behind this? Well, both both we can say logical because because my connections and because uh, because my background. The other thing is that that we felt that that this could help to have another vision. So it's so different the, the way that Ibero-American photographers see the world. So that's why we, we, we thought it could be interesting for the Hungarian scene or for a Hungarian audience to, to be more, more open-minded. Because I, what I feel from, and now we had this experience with in Paris Photo with a Guatemalan artist. He was amazed by, by Matthew's work. And, and he's so open minds, he's pushing, pushing and wanting to go and to see. And, and what, we, what we were talking about yesterday, the isolation of Hungary. It's also, it's this, this, this thing is because that. So if, if you don't go abroad, if you don't go to see what is happening, if you don't are open to see what is happening abroad, you will be isolated. So. It's a kind of mission, as you said. <laughs> uh, hopefully, someday will be money of it. But 
yeah, we are working on it. So it's, yeah. we can Thank say you. it's both. Thank you very much. And Thank now we, we are moving on to our next presenter, Alexander Anufriev. He, he will, I'm very curious about what Alexander you will say because you are the artist of this panel. And, um, and as far as I know from your description, you will focus on, um, on, uh, on, um, on political pressure as a kind of an inspiration in contemporary art or in your photographic practices. And that, that itself is, sounds very interesting. So I immediately would like to give you the possibility to show, show us your slides because we are waiting for your comments or for your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and you know, I wanted to say that uh, I was impressed uh, and surprised by this idea of Hungary uh, being isolated in art, <laughs> in art uh, way, because uh, in Russia we feel the same uh, total isolation from outside world in terms of art practice and everything. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to say hello and introduce myself. I'm a photographer from Moscow, from Russia. I do mostly editorial and documentary photography, and sometimes I do personal projects. Um, my topic sounds like uh, political context as an art practice driver. And today I will show you some of my works and works of my colleagues, uh, not only photographers, but also artists. And uh, I think, first of all, I want to say uh, about my point of view on this situation, on situation of, um, um, of being in that uh, history, in that period of history when something is going on in your country. Um, and for me, as a, as a person, as a, as a human who wants to be happy and live his life, uh, of course, I feel sad, I feel bad because of the things that are going on in my country and how it affects me. But as a professional, as an artist and as a photographer, I feel lucky to be, to be able to witness these changes and uh, to be able to reflect on it and to document it and to be able to, to be in this period of time because uh, this is a kind of professional luck as I think, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Okay, so I will show you some slides. <clears throat> um, and the first work I want to show you, it was made by me, it's called, it called, called uh, Close Up Russia. It was made in 2016, 2017. At the period of time, I was uh, very depressed and devastated by, by the things that was happening in Russia at the moment, because uh, propaganda machine was, uh, was working at uh, its fullest. And, uh, uh, and militarization and clericalization was uh, at its fullest and still nation was in kind of uh, euphoria after Crimea happened and cult of Putin was uh, growing up, you know, and it was all very depressing, depressing. and uh, not to go crazy, I decided to sublimate it in photography. So I decided to do um, my own propaganda and uh, decided to image those uh, processes and things that was uh, pissing me off. So, Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I think that's it. And uh, after that, I want to show you work made by a good friend of mine, Ekaterina Muromsova. It's called Ticket. And uh, it, was, uh, it was inspired and made because of the situation, which you can see on this image. Uh, this situation of a single picket. In Russia, since 2017 or 18, something like that, we cannot have a, a legal uh, protest, legal rally, because uh, every rally have to be, uh, have to gain permission from authorities. And uh, of course, they never gave uh, this permission. And uh, the only way to be legal in this field is uh, to be in a single picket when you can stand with a sign or whatever uh, telling about your position. And uh, one of the rules that uh, you, can, you cannot uh, stand closer than 50 meters uh, between these uh, single pickets. And if you're closer, you will be uh, arrested. So there is only one person on this image sing, uh, staying in this uh, single picket action. And uh, a line you can see is uh, waiters uh, who, who, is, who wants to, to stand in single picket as well. It's a handmade a sign or sign from some other people. And this happened because of, uh, uh, because of the Golunov case. Ivan Golunov is a famous Russian uh, journalist and he was falsely accused in drug dealing case and it was uh, totally fake and everyone understood it. So people came to interior ministry in Moscow and uh, was standing in line to made a position and it was happening for days. Yeah, and when it's happened, Katja decided to, <clears throat> Katja, Victorina decided to make a work about it and she made it in that, uh, in that way. And it was a huge uh, paintings of those protesters and and this is how it was exposed um, in art residence in Moscow. Look from outside in the evening, and this is how it looks from the inside uh, during the daytime. And I like this idea of uh, being able to stand uh, closer than 50 meters, uh, breaking rules because it's not real people, and they will not be arrested. And this is how it looks in, uh, in a museum. And you know, when I was uh, preparing to this, uh, this talk, uh, uh, I understood that there is no straight uh, works about politics in Russia anymore, only Pussy Riot or Pavlensky guys who doing some actionism. Uh, but in, in terms of photography, contemporary photography as well, or arts, it's not straight. It's, it's always like um, not, not that bold as it could be. Okay, next work I want to show you was also made by Ekaterina. Uh, it was inspired by idea of uh, Walter Benjamin uh, about common body. Um, and as well, all of the um, images we can see here, it's all related to um, police brutality and uh, protests and And some of these paintings was actually uh, put from actual images. This image of a uh, girl who was uh, just walking the street uh, uh, and, uh, and rally was uh, going on and police officer took her and her mother uh, 
uh, we wasn't uh, protesters or whatever. And uh, this, this image became very viral in Russia and it was a very powerful image of uh, the system. And uh, another work I want to show you was made by Igor Samolot, Energy of Mistake. Uh, this is how it looks in uh, in museum in Moscow. Igor works with uh, photography as an object, and uh, most of his photography is uh, um, made by phone, by cell phone, and uh, screenshots. And uh, main focus of his work is everyday life. And since uh, since that, uh, there's a lot of politics in it because uh, in Russia uh, we have a huge amount of restrictions, uh, which was accepted during the last years, and uh, this uh, propaganda machine, which uh, 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 which is very powerful, and uh, it flows to social media as well as uh, national channels. And um, this work was made out of a uh, digital diary made by Igor Smalot, full of this uh, news, which we can uh, read in, uh, in our feed, full of its friends uh, and uh, trying to be happy uh, during this uh, period of history. And the uh, second part of this uh, exhibition and of this work was a diary of a young boy who was living in 1937, uh, a moment when uh, there was a huge uh, amount of executions in Soviet Russia. Uh, it was a time of uh, great, great putsch or great terror, if you, if you tell about it moment when uh, almost a million um, persons was executed because of thinking uh, uh, of spies or whatever. And the um, power of this boy was also executed during this period. And in his diary, he is uh, writing about things like uh, how, how to become happy how to be happy in this, uh, in this period. He's uh, writing about a girl he liked, about uh, Miss Eve and uh, friends and bicycles and whatever. And I like, I like very much this idea of uh, uh, two types of diary and this uh, new type of digital diary and this original old school diary and uh, being in almost the same situation because uh, as a human we want to be uh, just happy with our life and feel feel free and everything and uh, both of uh, both of them were author of this diary and Igor Samalyov who made this artwork they are in kind of same situation because of uh, this, uh, um, this politics. And uh, I like this work very much as well because of uh, this idea of prediction um, of new type of concentration camp, digital concentration camp, because uh, in Russia, government was making uh, system of uh, surveillance cameras for a few years and now it started to work it's uh, hundreds of thousands uh, cameras all over moscow uh, connected to artificial intelligence and now uh, since the start of the year if you go to uh, illegal rally or whatever uh, you will be uh, haunted by this artificial intelligence and police will come to your house. And I uh, uh, experienced it on myself because last time I was shooting protest in, in April of this year, uh, I was just taking pictures. I wasn't uh, shouting or 
doing something illegal. Uh, police came to my house one week after, and uh, they came to my house because they found me during, uh, through these uh, surveillance cameras and they recognized my face. I don't know why, I don't know how they found me and why do they know my face. So they came to my house and I was uh, judged and I was uh, found guilty and uh, they gave me a fine of 10,000 rubles uh, for doing nothing actually, for taking pictures and standing on the street. Uh, and this law, it made like, if you do it for the first time, you have only fine in mind. If you do it for the second time, if they find you on the streets in a, in a wrong place, um, you will go, you will be arrested for up to 15 days. And if you uh, will, uh, will be arrested for the same thing, for the, third, for the third time, you can go to jail for up to five years. And uh, this system works great. You know, hundreds of people was arrested like that uh, through the surveillance cameras and artificial intelligence after April. And uh, all of us are now scared actually, because I don't want to go to jail and I don't want to go uh, and I don't want to be arrested for 15 days as well. And uh, now I'm trying to understand how to cover these uh, protests and if they will be actually, because I'm not sure that, it, that people will continue to go there knowing that uh, they'll be wrecked and counted uh, after that. So yeah. It's a new system, new reality. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, Igor, from my point of view, uh, predicted it because uh, this uh, digital diary and this surveillance cameras, which, which we can see in this exhibition, it's uh, just a perfect prediction of the system. And it was made. Uh, two years before, before we uh, pushed it and before we started to use it. So I found this work really, really nice. So yeah, probably that's it. This is everything I wanted to show you. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's time or I was too, too short, I don't know. Thank you very much, Alexander. I think it's um, this this last slides were really shocking us, and uh, this this system. So, how in general, how do you see the role of arts in present times, Moscow? Because because if, if the limitations are close and are are are, uh, are um, more and more drastic, art still works like an open field for discussing ideas or, or opposition or, or how do you see that? I think it's a way to reflect uh, what's happening, what's going on and to document it. That's it. It's not a way to, to fight because uh, it's impossible to fight. It. Uh, I, I don't feel uh, enough power in me to fight the system because I understand this, but you have the surfaces where to show this art, or you have your own audiences, which is still independent from the authorities. You know, I still have Instagram, and this is uh, the only way uh, to show it uh, publicly. But uh, in terms of uh, galleries or whatever, um, I'm not sure. You know, you, you can still show something which is not... Uh, uh, straight, which is uh, kind of uh, around, you know, it's not, it's not understandable easy. Uh, but in terms of uh, straight work, it's it's almost unreal to show it in Russia. Maybe in uh, um, in the commercial galleries, but even them don't want to show it. You know, it's even hard to show nudes in in Moscow right now. So, 
There was a case when uh, gallery, uh, uh, commercial gallery, uh, brought an uh, exhibition made by famous nude photographer. And a few days after, uh, people came there and uh, brought a bottle of peace and put it on the walls on on the artwork saying this is uh, bullshit this is, shouldn't be shown in moscow and and since that uh, moment uh, it's hard to show nudes in moscow you know? i don't remember the name of this uh, photographer who it was but it uh, it's well known right famous quite famous uh, photographer I don't, I don't remember. Hey, Arion, you wanted to ask something. Yes, actually, uh, you partially responded to my to my proposal, so to my question uh, just before that. <clears throat> I imagine that uh, artists who, are, who want to deal with the uh, system or with the problems uh, have to resort to uh, art that you have to read between the lines, really, and uh, and and I feel that there is, a, there is a, also a danger that not just the authorities won't understand, but also the uh, audience your, The audience has difficulty to understand, or there is a certain uh, uh, secrecy, you know, that the, the narrow, the narrow uh, only the narrow artistic community will, uh, 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 will understand it, and the wider audience cannot really grasp what's behind it. And so there is an again another bubble forming. Uh, mm -hmm. Is is that true or is that so? Yeah, I think so. Because, for example, uh, probably uh, work made by Igor Samolot, which was the last one, uh, uh, understand it like that only by me. You know, probably mm -hmm. the audience who who came to, to to the museum would understand it that way. They will see just nice screenshots, um, some painting on a, on an iPhone, and uh, that's it. Yesterday we we, we were for uh, you did you also want to okay sorry no no please. Oh, it's uh, it's just a comment that um, I was also really shocked uh, about your presentation, and um, I really appreciate your um, courage is uh, is stronger than your fears and uh, share your thoughts with us and um, and happy to see that you still have the chance to show your work in international context so um, that is good uh, this is just a comment a question yesterday we were focusing on the past and one question was the heritage and it was interesting to see your first um, first series of photographs alexander where you you were showing um, showing different photographs which were somehow dealing with this with this with this uh, with this heritage or past an image of 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 the soviet union still remaining uh, in the environment do you agree with that yeah for sure for sure because uh, there is a huge uh, no nostalgia i don't know if you got it um, Nostalgia about uh, Soviet Union and how how good it was in, uh, in Soviet Union and uh, you, you mean the, you mean in the society? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. There's a lot of uh, uh, nostalgia about Soviet Union. A lot of young people who who can uh, wear or like Stalin. You know, you can go to pro government rally and find people with a uh, uh, portrait of Stalin on it. Uh, yeah, there is a huge nostalgia about it. How how good it was, how strong we was, and the uh, world was afraid of us, you know, and we was one of uh, top nations and so on and so on. So if there is no more questions in the moment, then we thank you for your presentation and we will continue for sure to ask you about details or to hear your opinion, more general opinion about about uh, artistic behavior. But now our next presenter, Adam, just disappeared from the screen. Okay, he's, he's back again. And um, he's, the, he's, the, he's presenting the curatorial side today. 
in our present um, uh, section. Um, and he is, um, he is a curator who organized many uh, different projects related to Polish and non-Polish or international, international photo projects. And so I immediately would like to give give him the possibility to to present his uh, his slide that his slides about um, about uh, photo books if i understand well so adam <laughs> hi hi you? can you hear hi, me hi yes we can hear you and the, your your screen is already shared okay so, cool so um uh thank you for having me here and i think it's a brilliant opportunity for us to talk about the condition of the central european photography so uh, um, I will talk about uh, um, photo books, but you know I thought that after yesterday it would be good to bring those guys who made the history, and even like to like now we are talking about this uh, Stalin nostalgia and some like um, uh, you know figures that we are embedded uh, in their kind of uh, strange vision sometimes of the uh, continent and history. So I guess it will be also helpful to to get this idea of. Uh, uh, where we are now with this uh, photo books that I will be talking about and also how uh, my uh, curatorial practice is based on this uh, uh, reading of uh, historical experience of uh, Central Europe. I'm kind of uh, referring also here to uh, yesterday's presentation uh, by Judith, I guess, uh, about this, uh, you know, tradition also of Central uh, European and, and Eastern European intellectuals like being against the system. So I think we have this kind of uh, knowledge or experience of being uh, oppressed, alienated, isolated. And this is also a history of like um, us uh, overcoming this sort of uh, condition of uh, alienation. Uh, so just like briefly, I'm giving you some, you know, faces and uh, traces uh, also not to get uh, that much depressed with this uh, uh, with this condition of today i guess uh, we have some fantastic examples that you know even like samizdat under uh, communism was operating against the system and now it's really something that is recognized uh, as you know as uh, important not only in artistic terms but also as a kind of model for let's say today's uh, uh, networking so um, uh, I guess uh, what we need, and this is also like my introduction um, to my uh, presentation, but also I'm kind of referring to what uh, we stated yesterday, is that the discourse surrounding Central European photography is much, uh, um, how to say, more modest uh, or uh, uh, not developed enough. And this is also why I think this conference is so important. Uh, unlike uh, you know this uh, discourse is concerning, for example, contemporary art or let's say art in general, but also you know literature or you know um, other cultural fields. So I guess we need to somehow speed up or think how to uh, catch with this uh, uh, with this uh, other parts of this uh, cultural field uh, that uh, photography is part of. I mean, like uh, you know visual arts, for instance. So I'm, I'm showing here a, um, um, a cover of a catalog and, um, and uh, like a entrance to an exhibition at the Barbican Gallery that happened some time ago. And for me, this, this is kind of telling because uh, like, you know, this was the uh, kind of show trying to uh, get together East and West in one exhibition and the common denominator was uh, history, of course. Uh, but at the same time, this uh, uh, London-based curators were very much into like ending this history in some way, even though it was kind of ironic. But you know, they had this sense that this history may end. Well, I think we all know that it's not ending, and especially like in Central Europe, it's like ongoing. So this is also part of this uh, experience and having like this uh, knowledge about the momentum or like the things that may happen within a year, two or 10 years and change like very drastically from one, uh, let's say position to something completely uh, different. So I guess this is also part of what we have uh, in our heads, but also what photographers uh, specifically are facing today. Like even in this uh, uh, presentation um, about Russian scene, you can have this feeling that you are taking part in some like a super important 
uh, moment uh, in the history of the country, but also, let's say, of our uh, region. And in this, in this sense, I think many uh, photographers or artists from different uh, uh, areas or like regions don't have this, uh, uh, you know, like um, kind of feeling that uh, the history is happening and they should simply um, take part in it or record it uh, in a way. So, uh, you know, I, I think that this is also an interesting publication uh, about the Central Photography, uh, Central European Photography, with these three like um, uh, key words, history, memory, uh, and identity, which I think are crucial to understand also, you know, the, um, the condition or how the Central European Photography is perceived from, let's say, outsider perspective. So like Jolt said, I'm um, very much into curating and I will be talking about uh, photo books and the photo book exhibition that I did curate with uh, two friends of mine, Łukasz Gorczyca and Natalia Żak. And uh, we were like digging in this uh, photo books, uh, you know, for almost uh, two decades uh, from now. And uh, we did several shows, but uh, I will tell you about one exhibition of uh, photo books from Central uh, Europe. Uh, we were, of course, thinking of how to uh, how to make this uh, exhibition, and how to write about uh, photo books. Initially, we uh, were like um, going into this direction, like you can see in the slides, that researchers and curators do have this focus on, let's say, you know, like um, Belgian or Swedish or Chinese or Swiss or German photo books, and we did uh, very much the same with uh, Polish photo books. But then we realized that. There are things that are not really matching uh, that are not really matching with our um, focus, like you know what to do with uh, Lithuanian, Polish, Jewish, German um, authors who were kind of uh, um, in the void. So we decided to uh, change the focus, and uh, instead of like uh, following this, let's say. A nationalistic kind of perspective, we decided to cross the uh, borders of this, uh, you know, national cultural fields or like uh, photography fields, so to speak, and uh, do a thing concerning uh, like a network uh, and showing also the dynamics of the uh, photo book uh, scene in uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe. So, of course, this is uh, part of the uh, photo book phenomenon, like um, uh, Moritz Neumiller um, defined this uh, sort of uh, uh, situation, and it's, of course, founded by uh, Parent Badger, uh, in a way. Th this, 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 these books are kind of more interesting uh, because they are not into this uh, uh, single, like, nationalistic narrative, but like uh, with this Latin American photo books, they try to get together uh, for example, the, uh, the regional experience, or see how it was uh, uh, how it uh, was developed in um, uh, across the boundaries of uh, uh, single nations. Uh, so I did also write uh, another book about the Central European photography, but I will stick to this uh, uh, photo blog. This is how we titled this, and this exhibition will open like uh, at the National Gallery in Vilnius uh, on 30th of. Uh, July, after you know, three times uh, it got postponed due to lockdown in Poland and Lithuania. Uh, it's been uh, already exhibited in Czechia, and I hope we will manage to also uh, get it to um, uh, to Hungary at some point. Uh, so you know, in Lithuania, it's called uh, Photoblockas, which I like uh, very much. Uh, so you know, you are invited to visit Photoblockas. The show was uh, about uh, uh, 20th century experience of. Uh, uh, Central Europe, so to speak, uh, as it was uh, inscribed in uh, photo books by, you know, by eminent photographers. So we uh, decided to divide it into certain chapters uh, showing like uh, this uh, phenomenon of Central European photo books from different perspectives, like let's say war and trauma or propaganda, be it nationalistic or communist propaganda, but also uh, art photography, uh, experimental modernist photography, but also, for example, you know, this transformation period after um, the collapse of uh, uh, communist system in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So the, the book was uh, very much about historical uh, uh, photo books, uh, 
let's say, the best of the best from 20th century, and we established a network of uh, researchers who were helping us to uh, to get, uh, you know, the books, uh, the proper books from uh, the region. Um, uh, but there were also some moments that we had uh, has, uh, kind of hesitated what to do with uh, uh, with books like Rafał Milach's Winners. Uh, the book is about Belarus. Rafał is not Belarusian. The book uh, was published in um, in London, so it's not really Polish even or Belarusian, but you know it's like a global kind of uh, product. Nevertheless, we decided to somehow uh, include this sort of uh, uh, books and photographs, uh, feeling that they are somehow uh, important. And this is also uh, a part of our, let's say, condition to, uh, to transgress this uh, strict divisions. Uh, for example, I, I guess researchers dealing with Swiss or uh, uh, Belgian photo books, they don't have this uh, kind of um, uh, problems, right? But uh, in case of Poland and Central Europe, I think this is like a daily uh, thing when you research this uh, uh, topic. So basically, Rafał Milach uh, uh, was included to the show. He's, uh, I'm showing you this book as a kind of exception to a certain rule. The other one that was also giving us a push to uh, rethink and reconsider the, uh, let's say, the borders or the limits of our project was a famous book by Moiver uh, or Moises Vorobiejczyk. Uh, his third name uh, is in Hebrew, is Moshe Raviv. And the book uh, uh, was published uh, in, um, uh, during Bauhaus period uh, in, um, uh, by the Swiss uh, publishing house and was republished later uh, several times and recently it got uh, republished back again by the National Gallery in Vilnius the same one that is hosting our show, by the way. And it uh, has been like shortlisted uh, uh, by several, you know, this photo book contest as a, like a new uh, thing. So for us, it was also astonishing and interesting that the book by a Polish Jew published in Switzerland about Vilnius, which is now Lithuanian uh, capital city, uh, is back again, like in print and is uh, getting uh, attention uh, from the international audience uh, uh, like seeking some information about what's going on in our uh, in our uh, uh, region so this is like also showing that this history is kind of um, um, ongoing that there is no like a breaking moment or breaking event uh, uh, in uh, in the history of central europe and there are like and this is actually most interesting when when it comes to central europe that this sort of bizarre constructions and narratives are possible and they are visible in this or they are manifesting themselves uh, uh, within this format of a, uh, of a photo book. Uh, so for us uh, also uh, the, the important book was uh, Peter Puklusz uh, handbook uh, to the stars that you probably all know very well and Claudia wrote a marvelous uh, introduction and uh, the book has been just uh, republished. So uh, uh, this was one of, like I said, one of a few uh, examples of this uh, contemporary photo book uh, stating that there is some kind of steer uh, and like um, how I would say like um, like a renaissance of thinking about this uh, book format uh, among uh, Central European photographers. Uh, however, you know, we were thinking that we will manage to include this to this exhibition as a separate uh, uh, chapter of the show. And unfortunately, we didn't have uh, enough space. So uh, this uh, presentation is a bit like, um, uh, you know, like me and myself trying to cope with the fact that I had to get rid of so many fantastic photographers. And perhaps we should do another show about, you know, this uh, contemporary photo book uh, phenomenon in uh, Central and Eastern um, uh, Europe. So this is how Peter's uh, uh, book uh, uh, was um, um, exhibited. So, you know, each and every year there are these contests for photo books that are around the world and the photographers are sending their proposals and many, many of them are coming from, you know, from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So this is, of course, for us uh, uh, a kind of must to follow what's going on, especially that books like uh, uh, Frost by Joanna Piotrowska, uh, like one of the Polish photography superstars, are becoming part of the history of photography uh, in general, not only of Polish photography or, you know, like Central European photographies, uh, making her 
uh, almost uh, immediately uh, an international uh, star, uh, not only in photography, but in like uh, uh, visual arts. So you now the book uh, uh, has been published um, as a, for, this was the award given to uh, Joanna. Uh, so this was her first photo book. Uh, and uh, you know, you can imagine that it was the only uh, show that she got last year at the Zahenta National Gallery. So it was seven years after she um, got awarded uh, this prize and uh, had her book uh, published that she got the full recognition uh, in a way uh, in Poland. And of course the book was also read in a political way that this froze is a kind of comment uh, on the current uh, political situation also in Poland. It's not only about her you know, herself coping with some psychological family and relational issues. So uh, the book was kind of, you know, still contemporary, even though some years uh, has already passed from um, the moment it uh, got published. So for me, this was interesting. This was her MA diploma that uh, artists like uh, Piotrowska can like uh, jump in the middle of the field, like almost being a student and, you know, you, you just send a book and you are like immediately there. Uh, you are very you know, successful in a way. At the same time, the things that you are doing are referring back uh, uh, to your own personal history or to the history of the country that you are coming from. So I was trying to figure out how we could somehow divide uh, this, uh, let's say, wannabe exhibition into chapters uh, once we would be able to to do it as a kind of extension of this uh, photo blog exhibition that was uh, uh, focused on uh, 20th century experience. So another artist that uh, I wanted to show is uh, Agnieszka Sejud, because uh, if uh, with the uh, Piotrowska, it was her MA, uh, uh, Agnieszka Sejud got shortlisted uh, in the last year at the Paris Photo Aperture Photo Book Award as a BA student uh, the, and she's studying uh, in Opava. So this is another like, a, let's say Central European photography phenomenon. And the book is uh, uh, like her vision or reading of Polish uh, uh, province today. So uh, she made like her own fundraising using internet uh, you know, opportunities and got her book self-published in um, not even 500 copies. Uh, so she sent it to Paris and uh, was um, uh, on a shortlist and, you know, of course, sold out immediately and also became um, uh, visible, not only to uh, her colleagues from uh, university. So uh, I think that this is really interesting how this uh, young, uh, very young artist, uh, like I said, she's a BA student, so she's like 22, 23, something like this. Uh, are able to achieve the things that were almost uh, not possible for this uh, past generations and also how they somehow, mm, you know, they maybe not cancel, but uh, they, uh, they avoid this regular kind of careers with exhibitions, diplomas, you know, like small exhibition, medium-sized exhibition, bigger exhibition, uh, you know, stuff like this. They are using these books as a kind of platform or a tool or a medium that is uh, uh, giving them opportunity to, uh, to cross this uh, usual paths of uh, uh, career uh, that, you know, we are kind of accustomed with as curators or, you know, like researchers uh, in the field. So this is also a book by Marta Bogdańska that has just been published. Uh, and was uh, shortlisted by uh, Michael Mack uh, last year. It's about, you know, basically people uh, or humans abusing uh, uh, animals, uh, using them for warfare uh, reasons. Uh, so uh, this is also interesting that the books that uh, got shortlisted, because not all of them, like, you know, like Piotrowska, uh, are winning prizes. Many of them are only uh, shortlisted, but then the shortlist means that they may publish the book uh, with some other publishing house uh, or uh, do a show and publish the book as a, as a kind of catalog and stuff like this. So uh, Bogdańska is one of these uh, uh, examples of people who are uh, successful in this uh, way. So, you know, this is my obsession, like uh, seeing those lists, you know, who's nominated, nominating also my favorites, uh, 
uh, seeing who's like uh, winning this uh, prizes and so on. So it's a bit like picking these names from our uh, region. And I must say that, you know, I don't have statistics, but it's like, I would say that, that this is like an immense uh, 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 rise in the number of people coming from, the, uh, from our region uh, that are visible um, uh, in last 10 years. Like I said yesterday, that Karolina Lewandowska said that uh, for example, these acquisitions uh, by the Pompidou uh, of Central European uh, artists and specifically photographers rose in 10 years from 3% to 30% of the total budget uh, uh, of Pompidou's uh, acquisitions. So it's like, a, you know, it's, it's very, it's like an immense rise in uh, money spent also on, uh, on the wars from the region. But I also think it's not only about money, it's also about like visibility and who's doing like interesting things. Uh, and who's having this uh, kind of uh, attention. Um, so, you know, I thought that it would be good to somehow um, think of this uh, possible uh, narrations or like uh, how the authors from the region are trying to, you know, find their way to this, let's say, uh, vis visibility or prizes, awards, and uh, what is specific about this region. So I guess, there are several um, elements or moments that we can uh, we can find in this uh, photo book uh, uh, production. I would say that the first one is like the other or like showing the crazy East. Uh, uh, and this is very much like in, embedded in the 90s. Now I think this narrative is uh, about to end. So this uh, Eastern Europe is no longer that uh, strange, I would say. Uh, the second uh, I named like briefly like Bildungsreises, so it's like kind of kind of journey back home. So this is this template of uh, uh, Hans Lova's uh, Rokitnik as a kind of classic of a person who's a Czechoslovak emigre coming back to her uh, rural uh, native uh, uh, village. The third I would I would call it like mapping or territories. So this is like documenting this uh, let's say uh, Central European. Um, territories. The fourth one, very important, is uh, concerning memory, and I would call it like unearthing memory. I will, I will show you a book that is uh, the, the title is coming from for this section. And uh, the last one, I think this is about like uh, personal traumas or personal things that are uh, kind of, uh, mm, you know, uh, uh, reward by the artist, a bit like Petrovska, and we are uh, able to, to see or to read those uh, 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 those, you know, um, those stories as some kind of uh, sublime uh, artworks. So when it comes to this other, uh, well, you know, Boris Mihailov uh, or Miroslav Tiche, I guess, are the uh, telling examples of this kind of production, but with the uh, discovery of uh, Rimaldas Vikshaitis, who got his book published together with Martin Parr and was awarded uh, a major prize in Al, I think this it's still there. However, I think, like I said, that this this kind of like otherness of Central Europe uh, is no longer mm, that much of a, of an issue in uh, in photography. Uh, this mapping um, um, of these territories, uh, we we could find several photographers, mostly uh, doing documentary, like uh, Kolar, Sharek, Mikšes, uh, Rafomila and his Sputnik, you know, colleagues or recently uh, the uh, Lach's uh, uh, duo uh, that I will show you in a moment. So, you know, this is like uh, Sharek's book uh, about uh, Montenegro with his travels to uh, this republic, seeing what it is like, you know, the, checking the mythology of Montenegro and also uh, publishing a very successful book about this. Uh, so it's not... Uh, a kind of post-colonial experience, but he's like uh, considering himself, you know, part of the Central European nation, so to speak, or like a tribe. So he's able to see it uh, from a different angle that, uh, you know, that photographers would do when they would uh, come uh, here from, let's say, uh, uh, the West. Here's another book shot list at, uh, uh, at Paris Photo uh, by Lux, by this, uh, um, duo of a journalist and a photographer. And I think this book is interesting because it's somehow showing uh, uh, this political situation in Poland in a more, 
I would say, universal way. So this is about uh, Central European populisms uh, uh, photographed. Uh, this section uh, with the uh, memory on Earth would uh, be, of course, uh, embedded in this experience of like literal, like unearthing, you know, photographs, for example, from the Shoah or from the war or from the communist times that were hidden for decades and now are getting back and they're getting republished. So this is also uh, a bit of a case of Moiver, who was kind of forgotten uh, in Central Europe and had to be, uh, you know, um, brought back uh, to, uh, to Vilnius and to Warsaw uh, as a Polish-Lithuanian uh, Jew and not only Israeli propaganda uh, photographer. So these books are also very successful. I will show you some examples of, you know, th these are published by uh, Lithuanian uh, Kaunas Photographers Gallery by Guntaras Chesonis. Uh, a book by Stanionis, uh, Stan uh, republishing negatives uh, uh, of his father who was uh, photographing for Soviet, uh, uh, you know, the, the Lithuanian citizens uh, who had to have uh, obligatory Soviet documents. So this book is also like about memory and history of Lithuania, but there are also there are also monographs of uh, photographers uh, who died, like Vitas Lutskus, in eighties, and kind of got uh, forgotten. And now the books are republished, and they are targeting not only Lithuanian researchers or Lithuanian photographers milieu, but they are targeting, um, uh, let's say, universal on, or international audience. Uh, and, you know, in many cases, I mean, I'm only showing you this prize winning books like Wojciech Zamecznik or uh, Vitas Lutskus, uh, uh, they, they were awarded with uh, major prizes uh, in, uh, in this uh, in photo book contest. So you can see how this history, in a way, of photography is rewritten with in, um, introducing uh, photographers who were kind of uh, uh, you know, the, who are not present even in like um, uh, in Poland or Lithuania and out of a sudden they are uh, having their careers back um, almost like uh, contemporary photographers, but uh, uh, it's just that they are dead for many, many decades and we uh, rediscover what they, what they did. So uh, uh, when it comes to this unearthing uh, histories, uh, there is also interesting book by Miro Kuzmanowicz about the uh, history of uh, Yugoslavia. So this is also about like kind of mapping and uh, seeing what happened uh, in uh, Central uh, Europe or in the, in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, so this is a bit about working also with this archives and this vernacular uh, photography. And the last year's hit, uh, uh, it's Glass Strenchy, uh, a book about um, uh, a village and villagers uh, uh, from Baltic um, uh, countries uh, photographing themselves in a funny way. Uh, so it's like a um, totally vernacular photography who uh, out of a sudden got uh, um, uh, successful. Uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon is uh, pub republishing of the uh, photographers who are uh, still active, like Libusha Jarcowiakowa, and uh, their archives uh, are rediscovered. Uh, so it's, for example, about having a certain gaps filled like LGBTQ histories from Czechoslovakia or uh, uh, different ways of seeing that were kind of missing and now uh, are reintroduced as, uh, as photo books and also then uh, exhibitions follow uh, with uh, authors uh, like Libusha uh, becoming, you know, the recognition after, you know, several decades, 40, 50 sometimes years. But uh, unlike Zamecznik, uh, or um, Lutskus Jarcowiakowa is alive and kicking, so she's uh, able to somehow uh, enjoy this uh, late success of her uh, work that also happened thanks to photo books. Uh, here is Ivars Gravles, who rediscovered his teenage uh, archive uh, from uh, Latvia, from his childhood over there. And um, even though he didn't uh, win this uh, MAC contest, his book uh, was published anyway and was also uh, very successful in bringing these memories of the uh, transformation period uh, in post-communist uh, Latvia. So uh, I will briefly like show you this building's rise uh, or this journey back home uh, kind of uh, 
uh, chapter of photo books with uh, uh, authors like um, uh, Heinisch, who uh, got last year uh, first prize in um, uh, in um, uh, Mac uh, photo book uh, award. And this is interesting because he was photographing. He was like coming back to uh, to Poland, Silesia, to Ukraine. Uh, like uh, rejoining uh, several generations of his family, including his father and grandfather. And uh, the photos were taken uh, earlier on and uh, were taken from the train. So it's also about kind of like a sort of alienating perspective, but the book is very beautiful. And it's also showing the, uh, you know, this uh, in a way central Europe that we already kind of forgot or uh, it's also, I, I think, important not only to the author, but also for us as this uh, Central Europeans. And Teresa Czerwenowa, who's uh, mm, uh, made this book called June, uh, she's like a Slovak photographer uh, uh, living in the UK. And I think that this is really interesting, like we discussed it yesterday. This is a kind of uh, Hans Lovas Rokitnik style book with her coming back to Slovakia, but in many ways, she's like blurring this line between Slovakia and the uh, United Kingdom. So you don't really know where she is. It's about her and her like a search for her identity. Uh, so this is also like showing a bit of this uh, um, diminished uh, difference between uh, East and West today. Same is with Maria Dombrowski, who also got nominated uh, uh, and she's, um, She's living in the Netherlands and is of Polish and Ukrainian origin and was coming back also to this uh, uh, territories to, uh, to find her uh, roots in a way. So this is a very strong narrative among these uh, 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 photo books. Uh, and this is very well recognized by this, uh, uh, you know, contest juries uh, uh, and, you know, the, the authors are really uh, having their... Um, or attention uh, to their books. But so, sorry, Adam, but we, we have to keep on. Yes, time. yes. This is this is the for the last. Uh, I prepared. I think that I will running out of time. So you know, I'm showing only this uh, uh, Hungarian uh, photographers that are making this uh, uh, history uh, into a monumental kind of sublime, um, you know, volumes like uh, Peter Puklus. And for me, this is uh, an interesting uh, like ending of this, uh, uh, of this issue, because even if you are like a Central European, you don't really know if this is about Central European history. You just have to get very, very uh, in the uh, topic to, uh, to see that uh, it's like with Peter Puklus' uh, epic story of a warrior, that this is his personal vision of Central European history and Hungarian history. And his uh, and his own. So you know, I uh, the, as the last one, um, I knew that you would be like uh, trying to um, uh, shorten my uh, presentation. So I'm, uh, I'm using this opportunity to uh, to show also uh, Gabor's uh, uh, work and uh, uh, about like this human as a Central European human or a man who's producing this uh, new order and new situation among those countries like I was thinking that it's like made of these bricks that the book is about and then you know we can have this very strange uh, construction that we called uh, that we call uh, central uh, European uh, photography so uh, so thank you very much and sorry for this four minutes longer presentation no problem thank you very much as well it was very interesting to see the richness of of this genre and um, just to have a short, short, uh, short question, <clears throat> which um, I think you will also think a little bit complex. Uh, how, how do you define a photo book? So where, where are the borders? Because I see so that when, when it comes to a moment when you are presenting photo books on an exhibition, it, it becomes somehow an art piece, somehow, somehow a more extra, uh, somehow an art piece which have, have different aspects like the print itself, what is published in the photo book. So what is your definition about that? Well, you know, this is like a topic that is not really making my life uh, easier. And, you know, I, su <laughs> I suppose I'm, 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 should I like tell you like in, uh, I don't know, one minute or like, 
10 hours debate. <laughs> I mean, it's like ongoing, you know, people are writing yeah. books of what is, what is a photo book. But basically for me, uh, like for today's presentation, it's a very useful tool or a platform to communicate for, um, you know, for us, like Central European photographers or artists uh, with one another. So the, it's like a networking uh, tool uh, to have uh, his or her uh, message delivered. So uh, then you don't need to wait for curators, for you know, professionals, for galleries. You just produce like a bit like in the you know, in 70s, like the sum is that you just produce your message and send it and it works. You know? So this is this is a bit like this. And this is kind of uh, surprising that in this uh, era of uh, a virtual or online um, uh, you know, production, uh, this materiality of the book is also uh, important. So the books uh, uh, are still there. Other questions, Judith? Um, what do you think can photo books represent the photography scene? Uh, what? what, what once again? Do you think that photo books uh, can represent the the scene, the photography scene? So, are there enough photography books, uh, photo books? Um, that no, can... no, I don't think. I think they represent artists, and uh, for us, it was crucial also to understand uh, that if we would like to have a book on Polish photo books, or let's say Slovak photo books, or Hungarian photo books, it won't be enough. That, for example, the uh, the Central European uh, common denominator is much more interesting yeah so it represents our vision of central europe but for me what is important and this is also part of a definition of a photo book that these books represent the artists and the artists are in this region like super interesting you know and they are communicating with one another in a very uh, interesting way so you know i try to follow this but i don't think that for example this uh, uh, last books that i uh, showed uh, that are coming from hungary are uh, fully representative uh, to Hungarian uh, photography. It's like a it's like a separate narration or like a reading. It's like a bit of a, of this introduction of photo book phenomenon and photo book history to photography. Changed a lot, but it's still like a, a part of the history of photography. Arion, you wanted to ask last question. Oh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you. It was it was super amazing. Uh, it's always super amazing to listen to you. It's uh, amazing to see how the amount of inform information that can be compressed into 25 minutes. Um, I wanted to uh, just, I don't know if you, if you know about uh, Mali Nakladi. You probably you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which, which brings me to this, uh, the exhibition compared to the online presentation question. So it's like the exhibition is always like a, sort of like an elitist uh, 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 version. Uh, and, and of course, in the online collections, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult to really sense the photo book. I mean, to hold it in our hands or to feel how it looks really. But uh, so what do you find more important? This uh, first hand uh, experience with the photo book or the information? Well, of course, I, I like uh, the first hand experience. And this is why in our uh, exhibition, we try to, uh, you know, to bring as many books as possible that were available to the viewers, so they could flip them. They were mostly from the communist times, because you know, the circulations were huge. And this Mawa Nakwade means in Polish, uh, small circulation. So you can imagine that the books that uh, are published like um, in this century, they are from the very begin beginning, the super exclusive, super rare objects. So they are like collectibles that are very hard to get once. Uh, if you don't buy them, like just now, forget about like uh, buying them uh, like in two or three or five years. So this is also uh, like a, a telling um, a thing when it comes to the status of a photo book today. It's like a bit with, for example, this Peter Puklus uh, handbook. This is like an art object, basically, rather than a, uh, than a book uh, like you know people used to think. But for me, as a you know collector and a curator, I, I really love to have these uh, things in my hand. But of course, you know, maybe I was not uh, right saying that you know this uh, this online uh, situation and this uh, networking uh, system. 
uh, is not so important because of course, first hand is basically second hand experience because first I got to, I see the, for example, your book online on, on your profile or on your Instagram and, I, and then I want to have it. So then I buy it and then I can see how good it's done. So then I have this experience. Sometimes, of course, this is disappointing, but you know, uh, this this is the the moment of like a checking of the real quality of the uh, of the photo book production. So, but this is you're right that this is connected, right? That for example, I'm following this Mao and Aquade to get the best things the, they have or the most interesting uh, on my desk and see how it works. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, we still Thank can you. get get back to this topic after Christina Lubel's presentation because I think that it was very interesting also to to see your maps about uh, how we should define Central Europe. And in another way, Christina will, will also uh, speak about this, this topic. And um, her presence or her participation is very interesting and important for us because she's coming from a kind of, I could say maybe the edge would be an art management company who is dealing with very different project to, to realize uh, the only and the biggest art fair in Budapest and those other kind of projects. So, so your, your point is also, also a different point, uh, uh, how to speak about present day uh, uh, situation in art and in photography. So Christina, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Hello, welcome everybody on this lovely summer Saturday. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Right, so my name is Christina Lobo and thank you for uh, introducing me, Rob. I'm a freelance art manager working closely with Edge Communications, um, the company who is powering this project um, I will cover in this uh, presentation. But before I start, I'd like to thank my fellow um, speakers in this section. I really enjoyed all these presenta previous presentations. The project you will see is called New Visual Red Photography, as you can see here, and you might have guessed it's a contemporary photography exhibition and art program involving Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary and currently Serbia, whom I put in brackets here, but yet not in the least because they are less important, but strictly speaking, they are not a visual red country. Yes? Okay, before kicking off, uh, let me introduce Edge Communications and what we do in a nutshell. So Edge is an art and um, communications agency, founded back in the 90s, providing a wide range of services to our clients coming from both the private and the public sectors. We specialize in complex communication strategies, art consulting, event management, and conducting art projects just like this, just like new visual art photography. Okay, what is our mission? I think it's a very important um, thing to have a mission for our companies. So our mission is to connect the world of art with the business and um, in the, with the broadest possible audience. What you can see here, by the way, is one of our favorite projects, uh, some world famous Bernard Vonis um, artist and his sculptures called Arcs that visited Budapest a couple of years ago, um, accompanied by the master himself. So this is something we would do, for example. But what else do we do? So we make large scale and pop up art projects like the Arcs I just mentioned classical museum and uh, other un indoor exhibitions and also outdoor exhibitions. We organize art residencies and art prizes. And also, very importantly, Edge is an expert in art collecting as well. Over the last two decades, uh, the company, sorry, the company helped to build several corporate collections for banks, telecom companies, and we have an active art collectors club and the magazine we publish from time to time also related to art collecting and photography collecting. And last not, but not least, as Joel has mentioned uh, in the beginning, um, Edge Communications regularly teams up with Art Market Budapest, Central Eastern Europe's leading contemporary art fair and its photography section, Art Photo Budapest. We actually do this every year because we have Art Market Budapest every year. Right, so being on a symposium about Central European photography, I thought I would bring you a few references we have in this respect. Um, well, Edge loves promoting Hungarian photography, luckily, at home in Hungary and abroad, and has been doing it so since organizing the famous Hungarian photographers exhibition back in 2006. 
presenting the big names, Robert Kappa, Moholinaj, Andre Kertész, Brashai, and Martin Munkacsi. As I mentioned earlier, EDGE plays an important role in organizing Arts Photo Budapest <coughs> Fair each year, with an international section of photography galleries, photography exhibitions, talks, and panel discussions. The photo you see, um, this is my right, the left hand, uh, bottom left is, is a photo taken at Art Photo Budapest. Yes, um, we have a very exciting program, or we had a very exciting program called Focus on Hungary program, which was about presenting Hungarian art at several international art fairs. And in this framework, we invited five Hungarian galleries to participate at MIA Photo Fair in Milano. We set up something like a Hungarian island at the fair, hosting receptions, talks, and so on. You can see him um, right um, top. It's the booth of um, Varfo Gallery, I guess. Yes, um, and well, the other apple of my eye, the Bauhaus Contemporary Exhibition, I had the chance to organize. <clears throat> it showcased Bauhaus reflections of 15 contemporary Hungarian photographers. The exhibition started off as a Bauhaus Centenary program in 2019 at the Spring Festival, later touring in Hungary and also at Art. <coughs> just a second. Sorry, um, just a minute. <coughs> back again, sorry. So back to the apple of my eye, which is the Bauhaus Contemporary Exhibition I had the chance to organize. This exhibition started off as a Bauhaus Centenary program in 2019 at the Spring Festival, later touring in Hungary and also at Art Basel, Rome uh, and Barcelona. Bottom right, you can see um, a shot from the opening in Barcelona where Andrea Ladani, our Koshota art dancer and choreographer, who lives in Barcelona, by the way, was so impressed that she threw a small performance with local kids. And the top, is the outer poster version of Bauhaus Contemporary, depicting one of Arion's photographies. And it's very exciting that um, even after two years, the Bauhaus Contemporary doesn't seem to lose its charm. The Hungarian Cultural Center in New York has just closed the virtual version of the, uh, of the program a couple of days ago, and we have still have some invitations. Right, um, what is the other thing we love? The other thing we love is uh, working with the artistic diversity of the Central European region. In 2018, on the occasion of the Hungarian V4 presidency, we put our heads together with Art Market Budapest and launched the Visegrad Contemporary Festival, presenting art galleries from the region, offering satellite exhibitions, a conference program, and seemingly an impressive yet dysfunctional bus, which is of course a sculpture by the Czech artist Lukas Richstein. The two pictures below were taken on another pretty cool regional uh, program we had. This curated show uh, titled V4 Art Connects presented sculptures, fine art, and video works from the Visegrad region. Okay, um, let's stick a little bit, a little more with the past the birth of new Visegrad photography. Hereby, I'd like to confess to the organizers that I was pretty inspired by your splitting of the symposium into past, present, and future. So I kind of borrowed it and applied it to my presentation as well. All right, so how did the new Visegrad photography come to life? In 2018, we are still in the year of the V4 presidency of Hungary, I mentioned. We were invited to create a photography program somehow in relation to the region. We approached Arion uh, at MoMA with this idea. As an ex moma co-worker myself, I knew the concept would be in the best hands. We came to the conclusion that although the photography past of these countries is very, very rich and the 20th century gave a lot of talented, even world famous Czech, Polish, Slovak and Hungarian artists to the world, we should focus on the future the young generation, the freshly graduated artists who just started their very own artistic life and career. <clears throat> we contacted um, the best art universities in the region, 
with photography educations, of course, and ask them to suggest some of their top graduates from, who, from the last uh, two or three years. In Hungary, our partner institution for the moment at that time. The curatorial concept of this um, first pilot project of New Visegrad photography were built around the theme of worlds constructed by men. This exhibition attempted to shed light on the characteristic features that define a certain Central European approach emerging from the different national particularities, educational approaches, or individual universes of the artists themselves. Right. Um, but coming down from the more abstract concept cloud, let's see some facts and figures. So again, we had four countries in the project, altogether seven participating universities, 15 selected artists, and 31 artworks photos altogether. Between June and October 2018, we organized two indoor exhibitions. One of them is a poster show you can see um, on, the, on the right, and a large-scale outdoor poster campaign in Budapest. Right, so this is a more COVID compatible version of the poster exhibition opening, opening with less people running around. And these are some um, memories of our outdoor program. Top left, you can see uh, David Biro, one of the artists uh, with his work. And bottom left, you can see the version we created to, presented, to be presented at the Szczecin Literary Park Book Fair, which is an um, important um, book fair in, in Poland. You might wonder why I keep saying new Visegrad photography when you can clearly see the title young Visegrad photography here. Well, it just so happened that at a certain point, for some reason, we started to refer to the project as new Visegrad photography. I really can't recall why, um, but it contains the concept much better anyway, so we stick with the new title. And as you can see, um, we had a totally different uh, visual concept back then. Okay, after some time traveling, we can find ourselves in 2019. Well, this is still not exactly present, but closer. Based on the success of the uh, um, success and the experiences, of course, we gained from the first new Visegrad pro photography project, which is kind of a pilot project to this present one. We applied for a grant at Visegrad Fund. I guess you all know that this is um, um, biggest cultural fund um, in Central Eastern Europe in, in, in the V4 countries. And we were very lucky to, to receive um, a grant to um, realize our project. This time we aimed a little higher and we uh, planned to create a cross-regional project. Therefore, Serbia, as a representative of the Balkans, has also been invited to participate with the intention to further expand cultural um, cooperation within Central Europe. We followed the method of our pilot project here as well. The best art universities of the V4 countries and Serbia were invited to join and propose their most outstanding graduates from the last years. This lovely map depicts the participating institutions of uh, the present New Visegrad Photography Project. Some of them are returning um, from the old project and while others are absolutely new. We have on board the University of Arts Poznan, Adam Mazur is the head of uh, photography de department here. He's here with us too. So thank you, Adam, for your cooperation again. We have the Academy of Arts, Architecture, Design in Prague, another Prague school, FAMU. Um, we have um, Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Bratislava. Um, we added two more Hungarian universities to the portfolio, the Metropolitan University and the Kaposvár University while the Serbians were represented by the University of Arts in Belgrade and the University of Novi Sad. And here are the protagonists of the whole story, the exhibited phot uh, photographers themselves. Czech, Slovak, Polish, Hungarian, and Serb young artists, they are ready to take the world. Some of them are still at the dawn of their careers, while others are already uh, having reached professional acknowledgement just um, taking, for example, Antal Banhegyesi as an example, who already won a couple grand prize with his Orthodoxy series, be also selected into the program. But hopefully, all of them will actively form the future of the Central Eastern European photography scene. 
and here my attraction to facts returns. <laughs> um, Shaget photography part two in numbers. We have five participating countries, nine art institutions, universities, uh, 24 photographers, and 46 artwork in the show. Arion agreed to create the exhibition again, while the visuals were designed by Hoynal Kailesha, former MOMA student. Um, the project originally would have spanned over a year presenting new Visegrad photography in eight European cities, the capitals of the participating countries, of course, accompanied by Rome, Vienna, Brussels, and Berlin. But COVID also had a saying in this, unfortunately. So first, the whole uh, program had to be delayed. We could only open the first venue in Prague in September 2020. But complying with the actual uh, pandemic regulations, uh, we managed to realize offline exhibitions as well in Prague, Rome, um, in Bratislava and Vienna. The Vienna exhibition was a, a total success um, because um, at that time um, they could really open, um, open the, the gates of the um, exhibition space um, for the audience and, and as many people could watch it. Unfortunately, the Belgrade venue had to shut down just right after the artworks have, had arrived, so we couldn't even install it, but um, we hope to make up for it later. Uh, anyway, we were really quick to react to this situation and created a full virtual version uh, of the exhibition you're about to see now. Um, in Vienna, uh, the offline and online um, show ran parallel, while in Brussels, Warsaw, Warsaw and Berlin right now, uh, the venues had to decline the offline program, so therefore we went totally online in their cases. So let's see the thing we are talking about now, the new Visegrad Photography virtual exhibition. This platform is called the Kunstmatrix. I don't know whether you have heard of it. Um, this is a... Um, it's a very uh, practical, open tool offering uh, art inventory, art spaces and sales management, management features. Some of them are even for free, so it's really practical. What you can he uh, see here now is uh, the Berlin version of New Visegrad photography that opened on the, uh, opened in quotation marks, of course, opened on the 15th of, of June and um, will be on show until mid-July. So before entering, I'm just gonna show you here that you have a longer description of the exhibition, this time in German and, and, and Hungarian, um, because um, of the Berlin requests, of course. And um, this is the exhibition space um, itself. You can choose from uh, these uh, pre-designed exhibition halls Kunstmatrix offers. Um, they have more minimalist types, they have smaller ones, bigger ones. We have a relatively big exhibition uh, comprising of 46 uh, artworks, so um, we had to choose, choose this, this layout to fit them all in, actually. Right, it would be really lovely to give you um, a complete guided tour, but I'm afraid I won't have time for that. But lucky, lucky thing is that you can always watch it. It's absolutely open and, and um, accessed from, from anywhere. anywhere. Um, in the back of the... Um, Presentation. I will, uh, or no, I will. I will um, send the, the link to the to the Zoom. So um, it, it's open until the mid, mid July. So you can take your time and you can watch this exhibition in your in your whole um, in your own pace. Okay. So let's just quickly take a sneak peek. Um, it's possible to guide uh, within the exhibitions either with the um, with the arrows here or with the help of your mouse, you can get a full 360 degrees view around, um, around the rooms. And if you're interested in one special artwork, you just only need to zoom in. And sorry, I need to find this button. And, um, and clicking on information, you get all the details uh, you want to know about this, this title, um, year of production, um, technique, uh, the ser uh, serious um, name, everything you, you need to know. Right. So this is the ex description um, of, the, of the exhibition, and here is the other part of, of the room. Entering the other room, 
the exhibition continues. It's very important that um, I will I will explain it a little later that these artworks uh, depict the, um, not the original sizes but but the sizes we chose um, to to print the the exhibition material. So what you can see here online is is um, is, is in this size range we have the off, in, in the offline exhibition as well. Okay. Um, Right, um, we'd like to show you our online booklet as well. Maybe some people prefer really slow, prefer uh, scrolling through the exhibition um, more like in, in a booklet way. We have all the texts here, everything related to the um, exhibition in, in English and Hungarian. We put all the artworks here according to the artists, uh, grouped according to the artists and schools. You can see also the map I just showed in my presentation. So it's also kind of very practical and, and easy to forward. Okay, so I'm just gonna show a few pictures of our realized offline exhibitions. This was the one in, in Vienna back in March. And uh, these photos were taken in, uh, in Rome, in the Hungarian Academy of, of Rome, in November, when we could still open an exhibition there. As I said, and um, yeah, uh, we, uh, this time we opted for a more classical framed uh, appearance in three different sizes, not a poster-like exhibition. And as I mentioned before, um, while going around in the Kunstmetrics exhibition, the works you see um, here are not the original ones and not even um, signed or, or numbered um, copies. These are specifically uh, printed for this exhibition, for the new Visegrad Photography Traveling Exhibition, and uh, so that we can, we are we will be able to to travel um, and to transport them for a year, over a year, or, or even over two years. And we couldn't do it if if um, we borrowed um, all these pieces from from the artists themselves. But certainly artists themselves agree to the sizes, the techniques used, so we all know that, that um, this is printed uh, in this way. Um, yeah, let's just go back a little bit um, because I would like to say a few things about the concept. Uh, as you have seen, uh, and, well, not fully seen, but as you could take a short look, uh, the selection process resulted in a really versatile show, both visually and thematically. There are recurring topics such as women roles, uh, for example, but it's really impossible to find a strong thread in an, a one strong thread in the narrative. The exhibition runs on parallel lines, and we, we really love it for it, and, and, and we absolutely think it's, it's, it's a good thing. At this point, let me say two short excerpts from the curatorial concept because I think they really express what we wanted to have with this exhibition. We have collected the finest works of recent university graduates in the field of photography, all or originating from the Visegrad countries, because we feel that our cultural traditions stemming from our status as a buffer zone between clashing empires, as well as our shared historical burdens, lend our art an original character, recognizable in distinctive recurring themes. And the other um, excerpt, over and over again, we refer to those artists of the Visegrad region who have been scattered all over the world and in the last century have shaped the history of photography in their own image. Let us instead finally look at those who will shape the next hundred years. So I think it couldn't be said better. Um, we do focus on the young generation of the photographers because we believe that they have the potential to make the center, Central European photography great again, as once um, said. Right, and uh, a few words about the future itself. The future looks good, hopefully. Uh, we do have uh, plans with, with new Visegrad photography. Um, 2021 and 2022 is a year for the Hungarian V4 presidency again, as you I have guessed um, we, have, we have four countries in the, in the Visegrad group and each year one country takes over the presidency so it's Hungary's turn again this year from exactly from the 1st of July 
And um, on this occasion, New Visegrad photography is off on tour again. We hope and pray that COVID won't stand in our way this time. Um, the first stop is Debrecen, then Bratislava. On both locations, the audience will meet the photos in shop windows. If you come and visit us at Art Market Budapest in October this year, don't miss the works uh, because you can see them live and offline for sure. And another good thing, it's, it's a very good thing actually, uh, um, it's, it's a fresh thing, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary uh, is offering new Visegrad photography as a cultural program for the Hungarian presidency year to all the Hungarian embassies and cultural institutes abroad, all over the world, actually. And some of them, are institu some of these institutions have already expressed their interest in, in hosting the program. Uh, so further ve planned venues include Barcelona in October, for example, Tel Aviv uh, in, October, in, in November during the Photo Israel um, Photography Fair, which is a very exciting project, and uh, New York in, the, in December, hopefully. But they are still to be confirmed, and who knows what comes in uh, 2022, um, but it definitely looks like we do have a busy schedule. Okay, um, about the long-term goals and the long-term plan. We are already thinking of New Visegrad Photography as a long-term regional project. It has to be a long-term regional project. We'd like to continue with it uh, and make a third and then a fourth selection, um, um, uh, for example. We firmly believe that it is possible to direct international attention to the photography trends in the Visegrad region and speaking more broadly to the Central European region by joining hands with the other countries and by building a strong network of cooperating uh, in universities, art galleries, and other forms of art institutions and photography institutions. And by creating uh, a strong brand like New Visegrad Photography itself. So that's why we wanna go on and, and hope it can go on. It's um, logically a matter of financing as well. Uh, it's not a matter of, of, of wish or, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation and that I managed to share all the information that is important. But if not, then please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A section. Before, I'd like to, before that, I'd like to express my special thanks to Attila Ladeni, Director of Edge Communications and Art Market Budapest, Arion, of course, uh, our curator, and uh, Harina Oka Illich, our graphic designer, who we're always there and providing ongoing help during the project. And here goes a big thanks, of course, to all the artists and institutions uh, participating in this story. It was a really great thing to the work with you all. Here are our sponsors and partners. And thank you very much, I think. That's all. Thank you very much, Christina, for your presentation. And um, maybe my first question goes to both of you, to Christina and to, to Arion as well, because uh, it would be good to, good to hear more about the selecting process, because I think that this project-like uh, exhibitions, have, uh, which is including different, um, different institutions, like in this case, this, uh, uh, this, this are not, the, the process are usually not the same as, as in a normal cura curatorial, curated exhibition when you can choose whatever you want. So how was it here, Orion? How did you proceed and what was your, um, your um, points to select? Uh, yeah, so it was very, it was very interesting to, uh, to see, uh, see, see, or see partially my work from, a, uh, as a, as from the audience. Um, well, the uh, selecting, um, process was very, uh, how to say, uh, there's like, uh, uh, kind of like in Hungarian, there's this grass mower, Fünido <laughs> Elf, to, had to be applied in a, in a, in a, in a sense, because um, we wanted to maintain the uh, balance between different countries in the, uh, in the region. So we uh, contacted quite a lot of uh, almost all uh, institutions that have uh, uh, photography uh, in the portfolio. And we, from who we got positive response, we asked them to send their 
shortlist, their selection of the current and previous year's diploma works. So it was usually, depending on the institution, it was like three to five uh, names uh, and three to five projects. And from that, by maintaining that the, the, from each country, there is equal amount or equal number of uh, participants or representatives in the exhibition, we selected, we had to narrow down to, um, to um, uh, two artists from each uh, university and two universities from each country. And, uh, and then, um, uh, so that, 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 that was kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the practical element of it. What I was looking for in the selection process was that I was looking for connection points between the current, I mean, the same year diploma projects in different countries. So like there's one, one photographer who is de dealing with, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like the female gaze. And then I was looking if, if a similar project is existing in another, at another university at the same time. So it was kind of like, uh, uh, kind, kind of like this. Um, and in the first, when it was still called Young, Visegrad photography, there was this, um, I think it was a very strong, uh, how to say, first note that there was this open, uh, open air exhibition, which was on the city light billboards around Budapest. And, um, and, and so th we didn't really want to make a fine art exhibition. We wanted to reach out to the widest, widest audience and, and to introduce you know, on a, on, a, on a similar or equal platform, all these, all these educational institutions, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also a very exciting question, is, um, as you mentioned the city lights now, that uh, Arion always had this doubt about, uh, which is right to have the doubts about that, um, it, that it's, it's not the original works, you know, it's not the, the um, the original size, maybe uh, what the photographers um, dreamed first, but actually some of, some of the artists have never printed their artworks uh, before because they have just uh, finished their diploma works. They they only did it online. So when we asked them, they sometimes they didn't even know. Well, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Let's make it this size or that size. So it was a very exciting thing working with with with, with young photographers. Uh, some of them are absolutely professional, really knowing everything um, what they want and how to how to do it in the photography scene. Some of them are really just you know uh, learning the basics, or well, not the basics, but but learning to to move around in this world. And um, so it was very exciting to um, to see this this project uh, as a, as a kind of a, a museum, um, like a white wall exhibition, uh, and also as a poster exhibition and. Um, I couldn't say which one I like most. The good thing is that 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 we can we can use it in, in, in different platforms. So we don't have to stick with with only the, the poster type. Um, we really plan to to make an outdoor exhibition during Art Market Budapest um, uh, outdoor in in Budapest all over uh, Budapest again because I think it's more important that that a lot of people can see it and 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 the, a wide audience is able to see it in the bus stops or or on the fences um, around, around the city. So I think it has this advantage that we, are, we don't have to stick so strictly with, with the rules of, of exhibitions. So there is a technical problem what we have to solve now, because it seems so that the, that the today participants cannot um, not get back to their, to, with their, ah, okay. So Thomas is back again. We are still waiting for Adam and Alexander to appear. And then maybe if there are no more questions about uh, this special topic, we can, we can uh, reconsider our questions and comments uh, through, the, through the round table discussion. And immediately there is one thing what was, um, what was just um, um, in opposition in two presentation, um, and this is the map. Because it's very interesting that uh, Adam have a very interesting concept about what Central Europe is in that sense that before we used to used to say that Middle Europe or the countries we are speaking about 
are the countries which were not part of the Soviet Union, but what were part of the communist regime. But Adam is also, also attaching to these countries, Lithuania and, and the other, other countries around, which is an interesting aspect, but I absolutely understand its reasons. And on the other hand, in the last presentation, we had a new concept, not concept, but we had a new proposal or something, which is more, I think, about a kind of a brand building and also a kind of a management, art management, which is very, which is which have a very strong contact by, uh, with funding. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, when we are speaking of of Visegrad um, uh, photography, it's it, it, it's about where from you can get the money to to realize such project. And when Adam is is considering what Middle Europe should be, is much more about. Um, a philosophical idea and not uh, and 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 an idea of of, of common history and um, and other questions like this. So so regarding strategies and regarding success, um, uh, what should we do? Where where what should be the right direction? So to, uh, to to look for different kind of sponsorships and to to build up the project from that point of view. Or, 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 or having the more, more analytical art historical ideas. What's your opinion? Um, well, I think um, I might be addressed. No, for everybody, I think uh, it's. Yeah. I, think that no, this... um, I absolutely agree with with this uh, with um, with what you said. That uh, that of course um, you can you can watch it from a. Um, from a funding point of view, and and I think it's it's a wise thing to watch um, a huge project from a funding point of view, so that you have the money to realize this. But I guess um, this well, okay, the Visegrad thing is kind of in, in fashion right now. Okay, so I think it's 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 not only politically, but uh, from uh, the economical from the economical point of view, is 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 a thing that 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 is having a very strong um, say now. But for but uh, this is why we we um, extended this project to with the Balkans because um, we think that we, we can work with with, with cross regional projects. That meaning that okay we can split up Central Eastern Europe to, to smaller regions such, such like the V4 countries, the Balkans, the Baltic countries. But we can always work together as as a cross regional project. And and I don't see why it's. Um, so um, why it's very important to draw the political map or the, the historical map of, of the Central Eastern European region. Um, but I, I, do, I, do, I think it's important to, um, to think as a, from a funding point of view as well, yes. Oh, well, I think, uh, uh, thank you, Christina, for this uh, presentation. I must tell you that uh, it was very inspiring and I would like to add maybe one thing on the side of this, uh, people who are taking part in it, that this is uh, like a superb initiative and this is uh, totally exciting uh, to see how um, this um, very young artists are, uh, you know, networking, how they immediately recognize that uh, it's not only about the university, they like peers uh, from the department, but they out of a sudden they, you know, they go, they travel, they follow also what other people from the from their generation are doing in other universities. So I think it's really fantastic work that you, uh, that you do. Uh, and I'm happy that I'm a part of this. However, there's one tiny thing, namely I work in Poznań, but I, I wouldn't even uh, dream of being a, a, a boss of the photography department because I'm not an artist. And you know that uh, okay. uh, in this art universities, the artists are always the uh, the bosses. So I'm doing the, you know, the theory and the yeah, history yeah. of photography. And also I, I, I try to help with this uh, uh, processes like nominating or curating stuff and like this. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, uh, I'm not an artist myself. So uh, when it comes to this map and mapping, I think this is a, a very important uh, issue. And perhaps, uh, you know, Central Europe is one of these uh, regions in the world that are defined by the constantly and ever changing map. I mean, this is like a joke, you know, to see how many times, you know, the even the capital uh, cities uh, in this uh, region were changing names. So, you know, the Bratislava, of course, is a perfect uh, example. You know, if you try to explain somebody the, you know, the history of the of this city and why it has so many names and, and so on, this is this is uh, this kind of mess that we are having. 
And uh, I think this is uh, uh, also very important to see that, uh, that this is a kind of uh, advantage, that this is really uh, allowing us to work in a very different uh, alliances. And actually that uh, today, uh, even like on the level of European Union and this management of funds that uh, are, you know, um, given by the EU, it somehow supported this sort of uh, regional cooperation. So it's not only about the V4, but for example, in Poland, there is a very strong push towards the Eastern countries like uh, Belarus or Ukraine, and also Baltic countries. And we have also this, you know, the so-called European Union Eastern Partnership, which is very important. And it's also supporting, you know, the um, uh, networking with, um, with this post-Soviet uh, countries. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, it, it may be very differently negotiated and defined and also used to get uh, funding. So for example, we, we know that Erste is having different uh, kind of focus that for example, you know, Scandinavian funds that are interested in, you know, in Baltic uh, region, which from my perspective is also part of this uh, central uh, European experience. Uh, because in Poland is also a very important idea of the Jagiellonian times and Commonwealth, uh, you know, like a kind of uh, negotiated situation between Lithuanians, Belarusians, uh, Ukrainians, uh, and Poles. So, uh, so this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, like a very, uh, very inspiring and very uh, changing uh, uh, map of the of the region, or like uh, still changing. But of course, like um, also telling is to see how it is uh, seen from abroad. So like I showed you this uh, catalog uh, um, uh, with this uh, identity, memory and history, it's done by, uh, it's edited by Italians and you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that they included even Georgia uh, uh, as a part of, you know, the, uh, uh, the central European uh, uh, photography uh, milieu. But uh, my, my favorite perspective is this, uh, let's say East Coast, uh, 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 Jewish diaspora in the U.S. When they see, you know, everything that is between Germany and Russia, as, you know, this, this is, you know, it just it's somewhere over there. I mean, it's like Slovakia, Poland, uh, you know, Lithuania, and it's like one uh, one big uh, block uh, that is uh, considered to have its very very bizarre identity and history. And it's so complicated that almost nobody can get what's uh, what's going on down there without like a very very uh, precise and insightful uh, studies. So we are in the middle of this uh, um, uh, kind of uh, puzzle. And this is like I, like, I, like I said yesterday, very important because there, are, uh, there is a funding behind this. So this is uh, not only about what we think, who we are, but also how, for example, this uh, acquisitions committees and researchers uh, and major collection are structured, even like, you know, uh, grant and research programs, like, you know, JP Getty grants for the uh, Central and uh, Eastern Europe. So they have very specific definition of uh, uh, what Central Europe is, and it's, of course, differing. It's different in France and different in the US. So uh, we have to negotiate this, think what we are, and also see uh, how other people are, um, you know, seeing us, so to speak. Alexander, you, what's your opinion about how we see ourselves? I think that uh, that in Russia the situation is different, but there is also this kind of uh, kind of uh, um, changing relation between the post-Soviet countries around the big empire. And as I see, you were also not born in Moscow, but you were you were you were born somewhere far away, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you mean how how? Yeah, how, how do you see your struggle? I mean, from that point of that perspective. From perspective of Moscow? Yeah, or of yours, yeah, or something. As, as an artist or something, this, this kind of discussion about where we are or whatever. You know, we, uh, we here in Moscow, we also feel isolated uh, as well uh, as you. And, uh, I don't know, we feel like uh, some island uh, in nowhere and uh, it's, I don't know. And it's hard for me to, to hear from you that you feel isolated and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really, I don't know, surprising for me because uh, it always felt that uh, you in Europe, in 
Hungary, France, uh, Belgium, I don't know, whatever, uh, like uh, monolith, you know, like, uh, like it's one world and you, you don't feel that type of uh, borders or and lines uh, in the lines. And uh, it's so interesting, you know, when I'm speaking of with my with some of my colleagues from Moldavia, for example, or whatever, they always say that, what do you want? Two and a half hour from Budapest is Vienna. It's such a close, there, there's no distances in Europe. So, so, so there, there is no, no, no any chance to, no, no any point to speak about isolation. It's so different how we see it. It's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. Ario? Yeah, I would like to refer to the uh, your pre previous question about funding. It's like, uh, and also I would like to connect to uh, yesterday what Adam said about the uh, the uh, the the uh, about the map uh, thing. Is that I was on my way home yesterday. I was thinking about uh, uh, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe it's just an illusion that this Central European photography exists. Maybe we really don't know how to pronounce each other's names, and that there are uh, there are independent photograph small photography cultures that are uh, somehow you know geographically uh, placed next to each other. And uh, but at the same time, I was also thinking that, uh, especially listening to Alexander's uh, presentation, that. It's then maybe that's the that's the possibility or the chance to uh, to de decide if we want uh, 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 Central European photography with a distinct character and maybe if we want it enough we can make something like that and uh, and um, I wanted to bring uh, funding into this because uh, especially when we are talking about university connections or how we connect young artists together for example the erasmus is a great help you know or or there was this uh, uh Tepus before that but now so the, the, there is a there is a in funding there is a limit so we cannot reach out to moscow <laughs> or it was difficult you know although maybe in in mindset or in uh, type of photography or in terms of uh we understand each other but it was just beyond the line where we could get, uh, we could easily fund this uh, these trips. So I think, for example, this situation uh, that we are just looking at right now. I mean, this uh, 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 this symposium is is uh, is helping us to redefine or define the Central European photography, where it starts from and where it ends. Yeah, it. How do you see see this from uh, from the point of view of the Kappa Center? I mean, this, what how is how is your program uh, related to these these ideas? Well, um, I always feel that there are more work uh, than we can bear there to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time I I get a lot of inspiration that what we should do. And I know that there are a lot of tasks um, and we try to do um, a lot of things. Uh, for example, um, which is an important thing is to, to get in contact with, uh, with the different institutions. And um, if we invite um, colleagues um, from um, anywhere in, in the world, uh, it can help um, to, to channel um, the, the, the different viewpoints um, into, um, into a discussion. So um, this is what, what, what I think that um, what we do is um, we mostly exhibit um, Hungarian photography um, in, in two rooms, but there is a bigger room where we also um, invite uh, artists from um, anywhere in the world. So this is what we can do to exchange um, the ideas and exchange uh, the projects. Thomas, I also wanted to ask you, even if you have raised your hand, 
before Adam, Adam is also, okay, so Tom. Yeah, so, uh, no, Adam, Adam first, and then we, and I. Well, actually I was uh, wanting to uh, ask Thomas uh, a question because this <laughs> is also a part of this geography. It's like this MoMA acquisition committee, for example, is, is uh, shared between Central European, uh, you know, collectors and uh, experts and Latin American. So it's, it's, and then it's showing you that it's more about, um, um, let's say the difference between center and periphery that for example, for uh, from the New York perspective, it's very much similar to have Latin America and, uh, you know, and Central Europe as, you know, as similar in some way uh, regions. So this is, I guess, uh, I'm, I mean, my question would be how you think about this uh, kind of uh, connection, like uh, switching between this periphery, peripheries and also like relating yourself, like you said, like to Art Basel, for example, which is like the, uh, the core business uh, for the uh, gallery uh, uh, system yeah. and uh, artwork, like in a, in, on a global scale. Yeah. So, um, uh, so this is my- uh, Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, thank you. Actually, actually I wanted to, to switch with this because because we were talking about the isolation of the Central European, Eastern Central European, and actually it happens with, with Latin America because it's so big, one. Second, it's far, so it's very difficult to, to arrive. And actually with this uh, photographer, Juan Brenner, who, who is with, we're talking about, he's from Guatemala and he's very, very excited to, to be part of a gallery from Europe because in this way he will be, even if it's from Eastern Europe, uh, it, this way he will be more close. And actually uh, the, the switch between these two regions is the multiculturality. So that's why it's another uh, matching point we can say uh, for this. So, um, and the other thing is what I think is that um, all these photography in both regions uh, we can say it's pretty young, so it's uh, it's not so developed like as we can say the Western European or or the American, that I would say South uh, North American, and uh, and well, well we we can say the same for for the Asia region, or even for Africa, but Africa has a very much more stronger hype. I don't know if we, if because the colonizations of, uh, of uh, French, Portuguese or, or England. And, um, but, but yeah, this is the, the, the thing that we addressed. And, and the only way, uh, I guess, to, 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 to have the possibility to show uh, this region is the is the common effort to go out of the region because we we can we can show these shows or these exhibitions in the region and of course it's a big step also to to meet each other to know what we are happening but we again we will stay isolated so if we don't move or to a, a major base or a major platform we will still be isolated. And it's that happens with the South American uh, artwork, arts and, and, and uh, photography, and it's happening with, with the Central Eastern European. Actually, there is in, of course, because the language in Madrid or is in Spain, there are many galleries dealing with South Latin American artists, but there are less in France, there are much more less in Switzerland, there are just, I guess, one in London and there are one in Budapest. So uh, this is the, the idea of, of, uh, of being connected. And actually, I wanted to just briefly uh, connect a little bit with yesterday because yesterday, Susanna asked to, to Judith on how a gallery from abroad can connect with the artists of the uh, Peachy Fellowship, and I guess it was uh, again. Uh, it's 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 again uh, how how these artists are involved in the in no I won't say in the mainstream, but in the in the platforms. If there is no uh, representation, and I don't want to talk as the as I said before, the capitalist galleries who want to the money from the from the 
the artist because unfortunately this is the idea of many curators and many people from the scene that the gallery just want the money. Uh, but if there is no representation of these artists, yeah, how, how this gallery from abroad will connect with them? Because we saw yesterday that the archive of the Peachy Fellowship, it's so strange, we can say. So it's not everything uh, put it in order. Now you are doing it. So it's, it's a kind of, of uh, roads that never end somewhere. And of course, we as a gallery, we can't represent all the Hungarian artists, neither, neither the, the other galleries who are maybe more focused in contemporary art or in, the, in other lines as neo-avant-garde or, 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 or vintage photography. So we are happy if there would be more galleries uh, dealing with contemporary photography. And just one other thing to Adam is the, you, you, you tell something about the, the Books Network tool, which I guess it's amazing. Uh, as we can see it in Paris Photo, it's uh, really amazing, really. And you said that uh, there is this uh, self-published thing, which is also a great effort. And, uh, and, and of course there is these platforms that, you, that people can, can uh, donate and et cetera. And maybe, and you said that, that in this way, uh, the artists don't wait for curators, galleries, et cetera. So, uh, and I want just to, to show the, the, the book of Matthew, which is the, I guess a big, big step uh, on, on that, on, on working, curator, graphic designer, and the artist. Because this is another thing that, that, that the artist should, uh, should uh, know or, or should uh, accept, that's the perfect point, that the artist can't, can't do everything. Can't be an artist, can't be the distributor, can't be the graphic designer, can't be the, the, the sale. So that you need as an artist, and I know it because I'm an artist too, I'm a photographer too, that you need another person, another, another yeah, you can say person that, that help you with, with many things. And this is addressed to you that the distribution, because we know that, that making a book, it's, it's a really, uh, uh, really expensive uh, thing. We, we got like, like um, uh, proposals to maybe to do the, the book of, of uh, Mate. It's around 15,000 found pounds. Yeah. And, but this is because the distribution and that's the main point. Cause you, 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 you won't, um, you won't do anything if you do like 500 books and it's all in your uh, bedroom and your living room and you can't because you can't give it to all your friends and the distribution is what is the main thing and is the most important thing uh yeah i guess it's that thank you <laughs> yeah so maybe i will like quickly respond to this uh of course i didn't have time to go into details but there are like uh, strict hierarchies so uh, also in this uh, photo book business so you know matthias now of course is a superstar and he's like very wisely, in, you know, designing his book and promoting this also, you know, in connection with uh, his show. And I like that, for example, he's uh, having his PDF version of the book available to everybody on his site. And this is super, uh, super cool. And it's also helpful when, you know, students may uh, access it so uh, easily. But it's also a collectible book, uh, uh, you know, that is... Uh, uh, no longer in distribution, which is very much wanted by the collector. So, I mean, there are different levels of this uh, uh, photography uh, world. So these are also this uh, different uh, categories in the contest. So for example, this first photo book award and the major, you know, catalog or like the publication that you may uh, have, uh, 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 you know, published by the major publishing house with this money uh, needed and so on. And of course, it's like a separate um, uh, business, but actually, I would disagree that uh, uh, that 
um, that artists and photographers uh, need to work with uh, with this whole like bunch of uh, people like designers uh, editors and stuff and part I, part of this definition of central european photo book i would say it's also like dating back to this avant-garde times that actually the artists had have had this vision and they they can always if they don't have these people like to help them out they can do it by uh, themselves and this is really uh, like a, maybe not like a benchmark but it, this is also very much what is um, uh, expected from the artists coming from this let's say uh, peripheral uh, peripheral uh, territories like uh, in our case central europe uh, or let's say latin america that they can they have to do uh, more uh, so, uh, so I think this is uh, this is uh, important uh, kind of skill. I would say because you know it troubled me a bit. So this is like to respond to, uh, to Thomas uh, uh, this question or statement. Uh, I, I would kind of discuss it. But uh, uh, back to to what Gabor said that there is this illusion of uh, Central Europe. I wouldn't say there is a, there are many different uh, Central uh, uh, Europe's in a way. So it's a bit different when you look at it from Ljubljana, different from Warsaw or Vilnius or even Kiev uh, or like, you know, Bratislava. So uh, it's negotiated, but I don't think that it makes it, uh, uh, you know, like, um, uh, like a dream, like nothing, you know, like a fiction, like a literary fiction. Because uh, like um, what Christina showed that it's also, uh, it has its already like existing structure. So for example, in this European um, uh, Union, uh, it is visible. Uh, in, I mean, sometimes for bad, like in politics, when we have this, you know, bizarre alliances of Central European populists or like nationalists, but it's, it, it is, it is uh, you know, it is visible. But it's also visible when it comes to the uh, photography world. So uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, for example, Václav Macek, who's the head of and the founder of the Central European House of Photography, right? So for example, this is his statement. Uh, what, what is troubling me is that actually, you know, we are in this position a bit, this is also what is connecting us to Latin America, that we are in these peripheries. So for example, all prizes and all gains and all things that I was showing today are somehow achieved in the West. Yeah, so people can send things to London or to Paris or to LA and get the attention or the money needed to do something or have their work uh, acquired or exhibited and so on. And it doesn't work really uh, the other way out. So we don't have, for example, a major institution or venue or a contest that would be relevant on this scale. So I think th th there are like uh, uh, some kind of um, obstacles or differences but uh, you know, I would also uh, like to have it uh, uh, kind of clear that we are not alienated. I mean, Hungarians are always alienated. We know it. Yeah, like I, I read this uh, Land by Paul, a history of Hungary. They are always alienated, isolated. The, I, I, you know, the Isle of Hungary in the yeah in the cent Central Europe. <laughs> you know what I mean. But the Russian Russians are not alienated this way. Uh, and actually they are changing the maps uh, of today's Europe. And this is the, uh, the reason why they may feel kind of alienated, right? But uh, if you talk to Ukrainians or like Belarusians, they will tell you a different uh, stories of the Russian alienation and they're you know, feeling bad about uh, the state of the things in, uh, uh, in Russia today. So I guess, uh, uh, you know, when you live in Budapest, you, you are not alienated. Come on, it's not like even two hours from Vienna. It's like a forty-minute trip, okay, or something like this. Maybe one hour, uh, maybe okay, maybe one and a half, something like this. But it's not really alienating. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we are like part of this European Union, and uh, and and you know, we cherish this. Uh, uh, and and in Russia, I guess it's really um, uh, very much different. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, just like to, to clear this thing because I think it is important because we, some of us remember how it was when we were not in the European Union, when there was a communist oppression and it was a different kind of alienation uh, that we all uh, uh, felt. And now we are, we are really in a kind of privileged position and we, we can use it for, uh, for, for good, I would say. Thank you.
Thank you for this positive closing because I think it was really needed. Arion, you also want to comment and Judith also. I think that both of you wanted to say something. Who comes first? I, I, uh, I will forget. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry for not being polite. Um, um, I wanted to react to uh, Thomas's uh, comment about the distribution. It was partly responded to by Adam, but uh, in Adam's presentation, we saw uh, Peter Puklus's book, uh, the Handbook to the Stars, and actually, it was the price of producing a photo book, or the price of producing an exhibition in a small local gallery after a residency. And he decided to spend the money of the exhibition on producing a, a book, which actually, uh, just because of uh, a personal, you know, personal will to contact all the curators and all the people who can, uh, and just send the book out and, and immediately it was much more effective and lot cheaper than having exhibitions in Paris and uh, Berlin and Budapest and, and uh, Banska Sanica. So I think it's, um, the book is like a business card kind of, it becomes. Uh, and uh, and uh, I have different experiences. I have experience with the publisher and uh, I have experience with self-publishing. I think self-publishing works better if you do the work behind it. Um, and also, there's this other other thing with the uh, uh, with the Westerners, you know, these book awards and stuff. You go there, and all the books of Mac, they look. You look at it, and you say it's a book published by Mac, and it immediately becomes uh, not that interesting. <laughs> so I'm sorry, even even though the content may be super interesting. But it's 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 a branding. What uh, it's it's a brand, and you are it's Coca Cola uh, in in a way. Um, and I wanted to react to Adam's uh, what Adam was saying, but I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> maybe let's, I let's listen to Judith, and maybe it will it will refresh your mind, Judith. Yeah, my my question is: um, uh, How would you imagine a common platform? to uh, gather uh, all the institutions and um, all, all the, what we were talking in this present um, section of the project. So um, how would you imagine a kind of platform? Um, it, it, it's for, for Thomas. You, you make it. Uh, yeah, 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 because I didn't understood who, yeah. who, who so I, you, I guess you, it was me. You, you mean a kind of a, a database of, of Middle European photography or something? Or yeah, what? yeah, because we have a lot of links. Uh, we have a lot of institutions. We, we have a lot of different um, aims, uh, strategies, and, and profiles um, of, the, of the institutions. So it is different uh, for um, teaching. It's different for uh, galleries. It's different uh, for state-funded institute to work with the artists. So how can, can we imagine uh, a platform or what kind of platform would it be to... to... Well, well, I, I don't think it should be a new platform. So a new website where everybody is. So I, I, were one, I was wondering more in, in more, actually more collaboration between maybe galleries and institutions. So I feel that, that uh, maybe as galleries are isolated in the city, institutions are either. So if there would be more a common effort uh, for, for whatever. So maybe the institution can say, oh, the, there are these artists, maybe you don't know, uh, let's do a meeting with him. Let's try to do something because I, I just like a parenthesis for for the for the festival of art. Uh, there was no mate applying. It's uh, and and I guess there is there is also a misunderstanding. There was both together because because you because the artist have to be or has to be uh, represented by a gallery or should or from now 
should be a, an organization or a photo collective to apply for that prize. So you can't go and knock the door and here I am and I want to apply even also for to be in, in the market. So you can't go to Paris Photo and knock the door and I want to exhibit there. So, and this is the, and, and uh, this is other thing, maybe tomorrow, uh, later afternoon, you will talk a little bit about the future and in terms of on, on the, in the, in the academic way, how the, the universities can give this, I won't say to be like, money focus but we 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 had this experience that that as maybe christina said the the artists don't know which size to be the print or they don't know how, what how much it could be could cost or how it, it should be uh, framed or not uh, oh there is a, a museum glass so there are many many questions that many of the artists uh, and even middle-aged artists don't know about how to present. So that's why I'm saying that that, that could be a, a stronger effort between institutions, and I'm saying galleries or, or founds or, 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 or institution itself and university itself. And that's why I'm very happy <laughs> that I am the only galleries here because uh, it starts something with this. Yeah, I also wanted to ask you, Christina, a question like, from your point of view, how would you define success? I would define success. Um, like from a project point of view. Yeah, because you're also working on, on distributing, um, distributing Middle European photography. Yeah. And, uh, and so what, 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 what the success means, because in this case, Asarian also said that your projects are, um, are also uh, uh, educative in a good sense to, to, to show yeah. and to extend the audience, but still as, a, as edge, as, as a management management company with, with, with your effort to include Western galleries in the art market. So, so from this point of, so from this background, what, what would be the success of middle European photography in general, not just from your, yeah, yeah, your yeah. own company point of view? Yeah, well, the company point of view, I think it's important because it's, um, it's a profit-based company, so it's, it's a private company. But, um, but we wouldn't uh, define uh, success in photography and we don't only work in photography, as you know, so fine art and, and work closely with Art Market Budapest. So in general, in art, uh, I don't think it should only be measured uh, by money. So first of all, um, in the first place, not. But uh, of course, the end is the, the end result coming out from this. It, it, it should be that, that artists, galleries, art institutions, everybody is, is part of this um, kind of food chain. You could say the, the, the financing chain because, um, because that's what, they, that's what they, they, they live from. Um, we believe that, because um, actually I also wanted to ask a question about it, but I also have a statement on that as, as well. And I wanted to ask um, um, Thomas um, as, as a gallerist, uh, because he has uh, he's visited lots of um, uh, international art fairs and, and um, presented Hungarian photography and not, not only Hungarian, but, but their uh, artists abroad, that we believe that, that together um, a, as a region, um, kind of building, building it up like a, like a brand uh, would be more successful than, than only um, Stating uh, only only bringing Hungarian um, um, artists um, to, the, um, to the to the to the art scene, so we think that the, the promotion and, and building a brand is also a part of a success. So yes, that that is our company thinking, of course, and and um, and we are very lucky to have uh, curators and and art professionals advising us on on the, in the professional point of view. So we are not artists. That's a very important um, statement. But we work with artists and and um, and curators who always stays um, always tell us um, the the professional uh, points of view. But we think that um, that branding is a, is a very important question, and I think we we, we are a little back behind in in, in this um, in this respect. 
And uh, for example, this, this very symposium we are organizing, I think this is also a brand. And this is also something, a very strong statement that yes, uh, Central Eastern European photography exists. It does exist. And we have a saying and, and we, can, we can face the so-called Western market as, as a, not a united front because it shouldn't be united, of course, because but everybody should keep their own countries um, particularities and, and own art. But I guess branding is a very, very strong um, feature of, of success, if it's um, understandable like that. And can I have a question to Thomas? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you visited lots of uh, international art fairs and you went there together as well. Um, so what is your, because in your presentations, you said that, that in Hungary, the photography market and, and um, the, um, how people buy, buy photography collecting is, is, um, is a little different. And I absolutely agree with that with you. Then, uh, then abroad. Then, if you go uh, west from here, what is your experience there as a as a Hungarian gallerist? So, um, do they consider you a Hungarian gallerist? This, this is why uh, they are uh, interested in in the artworks uh, that you um, sell, or or just like a gallery from somewhere. How is it different that Hungarians are considered there? I guess I guess it's because. Uh... Yeah, from in in one from in one hand is because uh, yeah maybe in that fair in that moment we were the only Hungarian gallery. That's that's a, a, a make a focus, you know. Even if in that moment we are we are showing a mix uh, mix project like would say a Hungarian and a Venezuelan or or, or Spanish whatever. This is one thing. Uh, the other thing is maybe that. Uh, we are a nice couple, Ben and me, <laughs> and people, <laughs> people engage very quickly with us and to talk and, 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 uh, and to, to make interesting what we are showing. And the other thing is that, that uh, maybe what we are showing, it's pretty different what they used to see. So, and this is the, 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 the good thing that we have in, in our hands as country, as region, that yeah, we are showing things differently uh, because, for example, uh, the the project of Mate Contact, which shows these uh, um, um, army based or army focused uh, uh, camps, there are also these type of camps in, in in camps in UK and also in in uh, Italy or or maybe in France too. But there is no such a way or this way which or, or, or which uh, brings this uh, uh, duality in the images so it's or, or or it's very directly or it's very journalist way but the way Matt is show is the is the it was the is the uh, was the the success of this performance that that he wants the prize, he wants the prize here, he wants the prize in France. He was shown in many magazines uh, from UK to Spain to, to Italy. So it's the way that, that we are showing things or, or actually uh, audience project, human. It's, it's another way to, sh to show things that ha are happening here, which are very different from abroad. And that this is the thing that we have to show. And this is, I guess, the, the success. And on the other hand, which is also part of my, my presentation, is the open minus, the multicultural open minus, which is happening abroad. People from Amsterdam are very, very, very open minded. And the same exhibition, you know, Joel, uh, from Jean France Lepage, here in Hungary, people said, I won't go because I am afraid. It's a horror exhibition. In, in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, there was this mom with her very, very little kid. And she was telling what's the main point of, of, the, of the images that you are seeing in our booth. So it's the open minded is the, and the acceptation. And, and now coming back with Matt's work is the accept, acceptation of our history of the or the region's history 
which may, uh, makes people more open, open-minded. Ario, last comment. Uh, terrible, terrible to be the last to face. Right? No, uh, we will have just, an afternoon session. I just remember, I just reminded myself what I wanted to say, and it's about the, it's about homework. Uh, it's about the homework of the institution or the institutional system. And I think it's uh, uh, what, is a, what is an interesting difference between the West and the East or the Central Europe, if we want, is that institutions, when they, when they are founded or when they are started, they immediately probably look, you know, they have a business plan, how it's going to be documented. And we are still somehow, even here at MoMA, we are somehow stuck in this post-communist uh, mindset of we are doing something and we are doing it for doing it, but we are not documenting the process and we are not making, we're not thinking about a brand uh, from the start. And I just wanted to bring two examples, well, maybe one. Is, the, is that the Kappa Award, which is, I think it's in terms of, uh, at least in terms of the award or in terms of the uh, uh, attempt, it is equally prestigious as a Western uh, or a, uh, like a Western award. But if you look at any Western award, there is a monography at the end. There is a traveling exhibition at the end, and there is there is the co constant communication and presence, which of course we do have with the Kapoor Award. But um, I'm I'm really happy that uh, that the award is going international, right? Is it going, Judith? It's, it's going international, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Because when it when that happens, when Alexander can uh, apply to it. Immediately, these doors are opened. These national, you know, confines are opened. And I think what is very important is that it's doc it has to be documented. And it, what Alexander, <laughs> just taking you as an example, sorry, but <laughs> but what people are, are doing has to be connected to this uh, to this place in the world. So, uh, Mate's success. It's great that it happens in all, but I think if it's connected to all, then it feeds the prestige of all and not necessarily the prestige uh, of, of Central Europe and Central European institutions. Uh, thank you very much, Arion, and thank I'm you so much for, for everybody. No, it's it's fine, and uh, and and still we can we can analyze a little bit the system on the after the afternoon panel, but we I think we all really need this one hour. To, to refresh a little bit and uh, and to be in time because of course we have outsider visitors and viewers as well and they will be in front hopefully in front of their monitor at two o'clock and then <laughs> wanting to see what will be the future and what will come up <laughs> around us so Alexander Adam Christina and Thomas thank you for this morning session and um, and let's have a break now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. So All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So welcome in the future section of the Working Context uh, Symposium organized by MoMA Photography Department. After the very interesting topics came up before in the past and the present section, in this afternoon we will uh, focusing on the tasks we need to do for a better future for the Central European photography scene. So our main question is uh, what shall we learn? Uh, we will start the lectures um, by Claudia Kussel and uh, Zita Sherwari. And the title uh, of the lecture is um, In Between Current Dialogues. The lecture will uh, start by Zita, who is an estate and uh, curator and who lives and works in, the, in Budapest. And it will continue by uh, Claudia Kusa from Amsterdam, who is also a curator and uh, currently lives and, and works um, in Budapest. 
So Zita, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everyone. So I have to share my screen. I have uh, just one picture to share with you uh, because uh, I will talk about an ongoing um, project, uh, which is a joint project with Claudia. Uh, so I, I can't uh, really show uh, pictures uh, of uh, this. Um, but I try to tell you some words about it, uh, but uh, we have mostly questions. Um, yeah, I'm very honored to be part uh, of this um, important conference. As uh, Judith mentioned, um, I'm um, uh, working um, uh, in and uh, living in Budapest, and um, my presentation for this uh, conference is about a journey we started a couple of months ago with uh, Claudia. I'd uh, like to add some information about my personal experience, what led me to her, uh, because uh, I'm uh, uh, working uh, on a book right now. I'm editing a book about the most recognized uh, uh, contemporary uh, Hungarian artists uh, of today. And I realized uh, there is no such an actual book about um, these actors of my field. The last one was published in 2011 by Agnes Beretz, who's a curator at um, uh, MoMA in New York. And uh, it was uh, about uh, painters of that time. It was really long time ago. So beside the book fills an obvious gap uh, aims to summarize uh, the current state of the Hungarian art scene uh, uh, for, for, for an international audience. It's an evident that uh, these books are important tools uh, for change and exchange, and uh, they, they could be maps for international professionals, museum directors, curators, and also for collectors. So showing the present state of, um, of Hungarian art uh, and its actors for the future is necessary. A book like this is a need for all, all the art fields. Um, let's say this deficit uh, led me to Claudia, um, um, as an, who's, who's an international uh, professional in the field of photography, to start a common work uh, on, um, on statuing the moment of Hungarian photography together and to show a snapshot of the moment we are living in and let the future know about one possible past. But how to do it, we were asking. As curators, we have different kind of curatorial practices in our minds, organizing exhibitions, be it um, and collect uh, databases or publishing a book. Well, let's say these uh, from a closer uh, look. Organizing an exhibition is uh, essentially the best way to make artists' ideas public, great for common experience, networking, future development, public awareness. And uh, exhibitions uh, help in the recognition of the parallel developments, but it's temporary. And after a very short time while it lasts, at the end, it stays in the past databases, catalogues, and other virtual platforms connect artists with each other and with the audience, providing access to important information. They are easy to search, to be informed by, and transparent, but usually it grows big to include all the necessary information and cover all areas related to the topic, it's so, and it has to be objective. But book publishing, what may sound uh, retrograde at the first hearing in the century of online platforms and in the era of social media, and it may sound uh, for the second too, the book format related to photography is a very fundamental form. It's an important thing in many of the photographers practice and always a major step forward uh, uh, in, in their career. So this idea seemed the most relevant, publishing a book about contemporary Hungarian photography, because it's a big deficit. There is very small amount of photo books, as we heard uh, uh, this uh, forenoon. 
but uh, we have to put it into international context at the very beginning. The, after one question was answered, uh, came another one, which format? A photo book, a photo album, a zine, or a magazine-like format uh, uh, would complete the aim of two curators to frame today's photography, uh, to, to freeze the moment of a medium for the future. It's a very important question, as if we think that publishing is political. Because what do you choose? A small publisher with simple formats or a huge photo book publishing house with a professional book? And uh, we were asking uh, where to publish this book, how to cover the costs, and uh, with whom to distribute internationally. When we sat down in the evening, after we finished our daily job and carried our children, as we are both mothers, to brainstorm, we discovered the weakness of publishing in Hungary. There is no publishing house focusing on artist books at all. There is no an easy form of supporting book, book publishing. Tendering systems are cumbersome and bureaucratic. And the possibilities for international distribution are also limited and challenging without um, the lack of international uh, professional background. Should we publish a representative book about the most recognized artists of the contemporary Hungarian art scene of today? Should we stay local or go regional? And what are the characteristics of Hungarian or regional center Eastern European photography? Should we show a current state of uh, the practices or use the book as an exhibition space and invite artists to collaborate in the curatorial contexts? Many questions we, we have. What is certain is that we would like to put a focus onto Hungarian photography um, uh, with a book to put a tool in our hands that uh, contributes to the scene international appearance, to have uh, the field strengthen its international relation, but also uh, to start a communication with the local actors and open new platforms of uh, communication. Uh, it's pretty sure that it's not money to be made with um, publishing, mostly to lose it, but it's empowering, fascinating, and exciting to create a book. And the common work is happening through exploration, playfulness, and mistakes. Uh, and the journey we started is probably that interesting, if not more, than the end of the result will be. We will see, hopefully. And uh, thank you, thank you for listening. I wanted to show you uh, this um, uh, uh, common and uh, joint work and uh, the next uh, presentation or the next 10 minutes is for Claudia. Thank you, Zita. Can I will share my screen? This is not what I wanted. So I will continue with the, the same slide uh, that I used. So I would also like to thank you um, very much for having us uh, here in the panel. Uh, I think this symposium is already uh, a great success. And I think we are here with many uh, important actors uh, in this field who, um, who can really uh, make further steps uh, in collaboration and exchange and in further uh, discussing the, uh, the possibilities and strategies to enhance the position of uh, Central European photography. Um, so before I continue, um, uh, our, consider uh, our considerations uh, regarding the collaboration with Zita. I will shortly uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm an independent uh, curator born in the Netherlands from Hungarian parents, and I live in Budapest since four years. So already during my studies and more intensely uh, afterwards, I was involved with many collaboration and uh, exchange programs connecting 
Dutch uh, photographers and artists to Hungary and the other way around. Um, it was also the reason for me to move to Hungary with my family when I was offered a job at an international Hungarian photo museum in the making, which would be shortly realized in Budapest, and that would uh, specifically focus on the region. And this seems like a very promising and professionally challenging uh, project. But soon it turned out that the museum uh, was not going to be realized in the short term and eventually it's still not clear if or when or how it's, it's going to be realized at all. So after this um, uh, adventurous project, I started working as an independent uh, curator still with one leg uh, attached to the Netherlands and with the other one uh, based in, um, in Hungary. Um, Last Thursday, an outdoor exhibition opened here in the center of uh, Budapest uh, at the Madacha Square with an outdoor exhibition of the Hans Eichelboom's photo notes. And uh, next week, uh, another outdoor exhibition uh, will open uh, on tram line 4749, connecting 25 uh, tram stops uh, where um, a multidisciplinary exhibition will bring together the work of 25 photographers, uh, artists and designers from the Netherlands. So in a kind of other situation, but um, I think um, in this sense, this, this way of representing culture is similar to what uh, the Visegrad Young Photography uh, Project uh, aims to establish, but it's starts from the Netherlands, so not, it's not a regional uh, project. Um, before coming back to the, the collaboration with Zita, I would like to address one uh, question in, uh, specifically, uh, which was uh, one of our topics, is uh, how should the institutional structure change to represent Central European talent? I think there are uh, many positive developments. So instead of using the word change, I would suggest to use the word intensify or stimulate representation, exchange and collaboration. And as this question is also an, an immense topic and, and not really fitting into 10 minutes, I would like to focus on a few, a few uh, infrastructural uh, developments uh, in photography and especially photo books as representational forms of expression and mention some initiatives which can be seen as important and successful steps in, in future regional and local representation in photography. I think um, we all are aware that uh, MOME uh, has a very uh, important uh, part uh, in, in, in this question and also the Kappa Center in Budapest. I would say that these two institutions are the ones that are really uh, doing great efforts to uh, enhance this uh, international rep representation. And of course, I won't, don't want to forget uh, the galleries uh, because um, they too are very important in this point. Um, I would like to mention just one uh, example uh, of, uh, of an experience when I was at Paris Photo and I, in, I think it was 2015, uh, when the Kappa Center represented uh, a few young uh, uh, talented photographers and, uh, and which had a, a great uh, spin-off uh, for their works. They were sitting behind the simple tables in the, in the main hall and people were actually queuing to talk to them and to see their portfolios. And one of them was Daniel uh, Solai, uh, who soon also got uh, exhibited at uh, Breda Photo and was connected to the Eriskay uh, uh, Connection, the publishing house, where soon his, um, his book uh, will be published. And uh, I think, um, yeah, he did uh, an immense job in, uh, in fundraising and in promoting this project. But I think uh, this is also quite exemplary in, in how an institution can actually make, an, make a real difference in, in supporting uh, uh, young photographers. And the manilacladi.org uh, was already, already mentioned and uh, 
I like uh, this uh, this platform very much. I think it's very important and it's very functional. Uh, we need these kinds of uh, online platforms which uh, make uh, photo books uh, accessible. It's not in the textile uh, sense I and mean, it's other way of experiencing, but it gives a very uh, thorough overview of, um, of what's going on. So for the future, I would like to suggest that they uh, broaden their perspective and, uh, and collect uh, many, many more books uh, from the region. And although we have already listened to Adam and with great pleasure, I must say, and with amazement as always, I would like to mention the photo book, book uh, the, 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 sorry, the photo block uh, publication again, and its international presentation and the traveling uh, exhibition in this context. I think this book is a very important step in the better uh, understanding of the regional parallels to local stories and it reflects on the importance of the medium of the photo book. And together with Peter Puklus, I have uh, contributed to the section of the Hungarian photo books. And also to me, it would be very meaningful if we could bring um, this exhibition to Hungary. I think the book has filled an, a very important gap uh, and it's also very special in, 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 uh, in bringing together the region and not starting from a, from a, a, a nationalistic uh, starting uh, point. Um, and it also points to the reality uh, from a Hungarian perspective that for instance, uh, the necessary research so far has not been done well sufficiently to process the history of the photo book in Hungary itself. Uh, Peter Puklus and I have started the research uh, and also we started collecting uh, books together, which included far more than uh, the books that are represented in the photo block um, publication. We took a break from the project, but there's a lot of material that still uh, waits for us and I think uh, we should actually finish it. Um, the funding possibilities are, uh, of course, a very important uh, issue in, in realizing photo books. And in this sense, uh, yeah, the possibilities are uh, quite limited, I must say. We see many self-published books um, and there are many zine-like books also that Sita already mentioned. Um, but the funding possibilities, if we all agree upon that uh, the photo book is a very important medium in representing uh, the work of uh, photographers and artists, then uh, these fundings uh, possibly should be more accessible, should be more easy uh, to gain. And we also obviously need more money to make projects uh, possible. What we often see is that the books are uh, turned in a kind of giveaway present, and this really devaluates and limits it, the possibilities of the book and goes straight against the goals. As it is, uh, especially now, uh, very difficult to predict uh, anything regarding the future, as we cannot fully oversee the damages caused by the past period. And also we are facing the constant uh, regional political tensions. The examples I mentioned seem fundamentally important considering looking towards the future. And from a personal viewpoint, I would see enforcing collaboration on institutional levels, on exhibition and publications as one of the main things. We need an international approach uh, when it comes to exhibition programs, local exhibition programs, residency programs for artists and uh, curators and other specialists and collaboration with international publishing houses and graphic, graphic designers, collaboration between galleries as was already mentioned. Um, and one of the conditions to bring uh, the work to the outside world, I think it's also very important that we uh, show much more uh, of what's going on outside. So we have the internet and we are all very well informed about um, seeing the work like recently or now in Budapest of, of Wolfgang, Wolfgang Thielmann, for instance, or um, yeah, Hans Eichelboom in, in, in an uh, outside uh, exhibition. I think it's very relevant also in educating um, the people um, in what photography can be. And, over and, and about what's going on and how to, to relate to, uh, to photographic works. Um, and maybe to end, 
about the platform that uh, Judith already uh, mentioned. Uh, we have uh, two photo festivals in Hungary uh, here in Budapest, which um, are mainly focused on a local audience and uh, following examples, uh, successful examples in Poland or uh, uh, like Orban Vida in Croatia. I think uh, here locally we need a, a festival that attracts uh, an international audience and reach out to them both uh, from the local audience as well, but um, it seems like we are, um, somehow stuck on this island uh, when it comes to, to this question. And uh, I think uh, we need this kind of exchange also here in Hungary. Um, the, co the collaboration with Zita is still um, in process and um, it has not been crystallized uh, uh, at a point. So we are not really able to say very um, final things about it, but uh, from a desire to see certain works together, uh, certain approaches, uh, certain contexts, uh, seems like a, a very important um, motivation and also to support uh, young photographers in this sense. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to finish with this. Thank you very much uh, for your notes and uh, for your suggestions and uh, also for the presentation. So my first uh, question is, um, um, have you made um, any decisions about uh, this, uh, this photo book? Because you, you mentioned a lot of different options. Mm -hmm. So do you have some decisions? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we mostly have uh, questions uh, about this uh, future project. But, but we see it's a need and um, uh, we really would like uh, to show uh, the um, most important actors uh, and um, uh, we would like to show the most important artistic practices um, uh, from, um, from this scene. I, uh, can I? <clears throat> so we have seen this title on your slide in between dialogues, right? Uh, could you explain a little bit more? This would be the. This is the title. How you you call your project? What kind of dialogues you mean? Well, I think uh, we refer to this process we are a part of at this moment, and uh, um, and questions like should we uh, uh, start from a local uh, uh, point or should we. Uh, uh, think of a, of, a, of a publication that um, works from a regional uh, context, for instance. And um, yeah, so these, the dialogues are, are mainly referring to all these open ends we still have at this moment. Hmm? Are you on? Are um, in the beginning of the lecture, there was this uh, uh, question of whether an archive, whether a book, whether an exhibition. And I, uh, I suggest that it's not an or, uh, don't put an or in between these. So I think an a book uh, very well works in an exhibition context and, uh, and the book as an online uh, Material, or if it's if it's uh, supplemented with an online archive, it 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 becomes even stronger. So I think uh, it's I know it's more money and it's more uh, effort, but it's always I think worth the uh, the uh, worth the extra audience and the extra extra uh, uh, input. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it wasn't or. It was just different curatorial practices we can use uh, um, uh, helping uh, to the scene. Uh, and um, both or uh, all the three I mentioned, and there are many more, um, are really useful tools and uh, important uh, platforms. Um, yeah, uh, the exhibitions with their um, actual appearance uh, helps uh, to connect the artists directly to the audience 
and uh, it's uh, it gives uh, the uh, the possibility for for communication and dialogue at the very moment. Uh, databases are uh, crystal clear usually, but they are a little bit uh, too objective uh, to me and uh, we, why we decided um, the, um, to put the effort into publishing uh, a book or a, a book like or an, in, in an edition uh, was um, that it could be my or our uh, personal point of view about uh, the local or the regional uh, scene and um, uh, and it could be subjective and more, let's say, lyrical. So, we, yeah. Uh, Adam, can, I, can I ask uh, something to uh, Claudia? Just very, very. It's very yeah. short. You had a. Uh, you had a. You mentioned this um, that the uh, uh, that the photo festival has to step out to to attract an, not just the international exhibitors, but international audience. And uh, it, it's very uh, exciting to me what would be needed for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the festival um, content wise should be relevant uh, mm -hmm. also to an uh, international audience. We see that uh, uh, mostly uh, there's one main exhibition which is uh, addressed to uh, an international known name and for the rest it's mostly local projects that are uh, presented and uh, I think it would be much more um, relevant to, uh, to attract uh, um, and also an audience with works that um, also have some connection to, uh, to, to the international scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as as the question of you did of what what could be a next step or where can we work with joint uh, efforts? I think uh, a platform of a, a festival is quite a, uh, a successful model, as it has proven in many other countries. So I think there's a lot of potential to to work from that. Okay. Thank you very much. We will continue this uh, in the round table section. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Zita. And um, uh, our next uh, lecturers will be Mark Proust and uh, David Campbell. Mark uh, will start the presentation. Uh, Mark is a visual story editor and photography curator. And the lecture will be uh, continued by David, who is an ed educator, researcher, and writer of photography. And um, we are de delighted that you are here. So please keep your lecture titled The New Business of uh, Photography. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Thank you. And thanks for, for, for having us uh, during this, uh, th this conference. Um, I think we're a slightly different uh, position because uh, what we've been doing and what we are going to do is not focused on, on photography from Central Europe. Um, but I have done a research on business models for documentary photography specifically. And together with David Campbell, we are continuing this uh, research and basically a, a second chapter to that research. Um, what I will do is I will give some, um, I give an overview of what the research that I did entailed and then David will take over and, and we'll look at our future uh, research, which we have already started, but is supposed to take off basically after uh, the, the, the summer. Um, even though we have not focused on Central Europe, I do think it's relevant and important to, to share what we uh, have researched and what we will research because we hope actually to provide models uh, models that can be used by photographers, institutions, educational institutions, and, and the document and then the photographic industry uh, beyond merely the practitioner. So uh, it's not to just share experiences, but to actually provide models that can be uh, reproduced. Um, let me start my presentation uh, and, and share my screen. Uh, it's always a bit of a technological challenge. But I hope you can now uh, indeed 
uh, see, see my uh, uh, see my screen, see my uh, presentation. Um, as I said, I did a, a small research, uh, which was concluded about um, eighteen months ago. I, I did a, I pres presented it in Amsterdam, actually right before the Corona crisis uh, hit, and it's called "Tell Your Story." Uh, that was the book, a new role for photography in the changing market. And it was supported by these organizations uh, and organized by the Forhana Foundation in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and what I did is I looked at, at different um, ways on how photographers have made their projects sustainable. And indeed, it's mostly focused on documentary photography. But again, uh, I think this is these models can also be applied and used in other types of, uh, of, of photography. The first um, model that was that I, I uh, researched is the collective model, and I looked at the Noor agency based here in the Netherlands. I'm based here in uh, in Amsterdam, and so is Noor. It's an international agency, um, and I'm indeed I'm showing you a few photographs from the agency and and from the projects that they've did, um, but. The, the NOR agency, um, it's not a traditional model that they merely represent photographers, but they are actually take a very active role in how they represent the photographers. Uh, the NOR agency aims to build larger cooperations and actually their traditional market, which is the, 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 the market for, for uh, print publications, um, is actually only one part of their revenue model. What they aim to do is to build larger cooperations, larger projects that entail sometimes even several photographers, like this project uh, that they did for the Carmagnac Foundation that included two photographers, Yuri Kozirev and, and Kadir van Lohuizen. And part of the projects are funded indeed by print publication. So they publish their work in magazines uh, uh, and in newspapers, but they also build larger cooperations and, and try to get funding from different parties, parties that are actually involved with the story they want to tell. Not only do they provide the visual components to publish in, in, in the magazines, they organize events such as lectures, book publications, exhibitions, and all the, the whole project together um, uh, uh, brings in money to produce and to pay the photographers. So they actually have moved on beyond the traditional model. That's one way that photographers are able to actually still create an income within documentary photography. Another project that I uh, looked into is Before They Pass Away by Dutch British photographer, Jimmy Nelson. Uh, it's called Before They Pass Away. It's a project um, uh, that, that has, uh, that, uh, that's a few years old right now. And basically the photographer, Jimmy Nelson, started this project by uh, getting an investment from a, uh, from, from a, uh, a private investor. Uh, the private investor, Marcel Buchhorn, is a fairly well-known, in, in my context at least, uh, 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 investor. And he uh, put 400,000 euros in this project in order to be able to produce the work. And, and the tagline, or let's say the, the, the premise of this project, is quite nostalgic yet urgent. Uh, um, from, from his own uh, website, the creator visited isolated people while they still exist. And I think that the, the eventual title of the project before they pass away um, kind of reflects that too. So he looked at non-Western peoples, uh, visited them uh, and, and created these amazingly, well, aesthetically very beautiful uh, uh, photographs uh, of um, these peoples in their traditional uh, clothing and in, in, let's say in, in the context in which they, uh, they live. And I think what's, what's interesting to see in this project is that visually, or, or let's say story-wise, it taps into uh, pre-known conceptions of what we have a, of, of people living in non-Western societies. Um, but the revenue model um, that, that he created is fairly interesting. He created publications uh, in print media, uh, such as magazine, but also a very wide range of consumer products, such as postcards, uh, various book publications, uh, print publications, uh, but also just you can buy the actual prints. But the, 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 the print publication, he didn't, didn't just publish one book in one edition. You can buy uh, book publications ranging from 15, 20 euros to 6,500 euros. And that includes a, a, a prints and a small table where you can actually put the book. But it's interesting that he provided products that people 
can buy, consumers can buy in a whole different price uh, range. Another project that I researched was uh, and, and, and is Everyday Africa, and they actually use their intention or their message as, as their business uh, model. Started, you may know this Instagram account, it started as a Tumblr feed, in fact, Ch started by two uh, American photographers or American journalists working in uh, Africa and West Africa. And they started to, to, to fill um, their Tumblr and later in it, their Instagram account with images from Africa because they wanted to change the perspective on Africa. They were doing jobs for, for, for the media on the one hand and uh, for NGOs on the other hand, only photographing either happy children at water wells or uh, conflict and drama photography. And that did not correspond to what they thought actually uh, West Africa represented. So they started this uh, Instagram account. By now they've got some 40 photographers um, um, uploading images on this Instagram feed, and they've got uh, around 400, more than 400,000 followers on their Instagram feed. And now, obviously, the photographers are not actually getting paid uh, to to deliver these images. But Everyday Africa has kind of evolved into an organization called the Everyday Project, where with a lot of Instagram handles, Everyday uh, North Korea, Everyday Iran, Everyday Climate Change, and they use photography to change with with the aim to change perspectives. Uh, uh, on societies, countries, and with the with programs running for for high schools and communities, um, they actually get funding to create projects using the photography created by all these photographers. So maybe the photographers are not getting paid for their input, but at least there is a business model. There is a pro uh, project organization that um, uh, has hired, I think, a project manager in New York. They've got a small office in Nairobi, Kenya, with a community manager and a project officer. So there is an organization that actively uses the message, the intention of uh, uh, the photography to build uh, to build a business and, 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 and to share the message that they want to share. Another a model that I looked into, or another project that I looked into, uh, is by a Dutch photographer, uh, Bruno van den Elshout, uh, and he created a project called New Horizons. Um, it was a maker, Bruno, who wanted to visualize his definition of freedom, tranquility, and space. Uh, and he did this by creating a series of photographs consisting of hourly pictures taken of the same horizon, for the duration of one entire year. So he literally started on the 1st of January, midnight, uh, 2012. And he had this computer with a camera set up on a, on a hotel uh, uh, facing the horizon. And he photographed this same horizon every hour for the entire year. And he started spreading this message of, here is a new definition of freedom um, around to his audience, to the people who were basically uh, let's, I mean, this is a short presentation, so I'll be a bit uh, <laughs> direct, but people stuck in offices who, who were kind of wanted to, to get out and break out. And he was delivering this message. I'm providing you with this new definition of freedom and just enjoy this ever-changing, never the same view of our horizon. And if you want to be part of this project, just join me. You buy a set of postcards, come join me. Uh, during a 24 hour horizon observation. So he actually organizes events where they sit on the beach for 24 hours and they share the experience of looking at the horizon. He created an amazing book, uh, which was quite expensive to, to, to produce, but because he already was able to, 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 to commit to a large number of people through newsletters, through um, social media postings, through lectures, through other kinds of meetups, people actually pre-bought his book and he was able to to, to create the book in, in an edition of 2012 because that was the year he, he took his, his pictures in and 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 um gather an audience but also provide himself for an income this photographer um was able to produce the exhibition the book uh, but also get an income of uh, um, uh, or a turnover um for himself of 5,000 euro, euros on average a month for the period of three years. So he's really able to make a sustainable project and a sustainable living out of 
just this message. Here's a new definition of freedom. And if we provide it in this way, if, we, if, if you join me on this journey, here are actually the photographs that represent that journey. Of course, he was uh, partly inspired by, by the Sochi project. I don't know if you know this. It's a fairly well-known project by, by Rob Hornstra and uh, Arnold uh, van Brugge, two Dutch uh, journalists, photographer and a writer, who went to uh, the, um, in, in the lead up to the Olympic Games in Sochi, Russia, Russia uh, uh, looked at into the social political situation of Russia. And they created a whole crowdfunding campaign um, for people paying various amounts of money to and, and, and whether they would get books, they would get uh, the um, uh, updates on the project throughout a whole long, quite a long period of time. Interestingly enough, though, uh, 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 Rob and Arnold actually did not make any money creating this project. All the, the, the money that they received through this crowdfunding, which was some 75% of the entire cost, the other part was funded through foundation grants. And they, uh, but all this money went into the production of the project. So they were not actually able to gain income from this project, but they were able to produce this project. However, production of this project gave them such a lot of credibility that after that creating new projects and bigger projects actually became easier for them. For Rob, for example, it's fairly easy right now if he puts up a print from this project on his Instagram account and he makes a sale out of it. It's a fairly easy sale because people know who he is. Uh, people have a lot of trust in him and it's also easier for him. It was easier for him to start up his new project called the Europeans, which is now due to the Corona crisis, a bit delayed, but he still is creating the project and they launched the first uh, chapter of this project last year at the Breda Photo uh, Festival. So even though they didn't get any money, it was a, a strong investment, according to Rob himself, to that to 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 build his own credibility uh, and and allowed him to build on that. Uh, there is one more project that I would like to share, and that's the the story as the business model in a project called Borealis. I'm actually involved. Uh, in this project also as the, the, the story editor and the curator for this uh, photographer. But here's a project that builds on the value of forest for people. He, this is a photographer who feels that we need to kind of be aware that forests are really important for our general experience. And uh, so he created eight stories in four years in the boreal forest. He had gained, just as Rob Hornstra, recognition with a previous project called Nomad, um, but he actually actively used this recognition to, um, uh, to build this project on the boreal forest. And it's, his, his tagline was a little bit, if you see that, that uh, if you consider the Amazonas the lungs of the world, they're actually the left lung, and the boreal forest is the right lung of the world. It's that important in CO2 uh, capacity. In any case, he was able to get people to subscribe to his project. So a bit of a crowdfunding campaign, but people paid an average of 10 euros a month during the duration of four years. And after each trip, you would get a small souvenir and a small print. You would get a beautiful wooden cassette where you could gather all these souvenirs. And at the end of the project, you would obviously receive the book and a nice print to complete the special edition of the book. He was able to sell 180 of these subscriptions during the creation of the project. Because of his credibility uh, through the Nomad project, he had also been able to create connections with a newspaper that, that published all of the, 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 the projects right after they were finished. So they had regular uh, newspaper publications. Uh, they had connections to the Dutch forestry agency, Staatsbosbeheer. They actually sponsored the, pro, uh, the project just as a sustainable bank in the Netherlands, ASN Bank, who have a, 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 their, their proposition is make, to make sustainable banking. So for them, the, the, the message of the project, that the value of the forest came very, was very close to their personal, to their, their own business model. For them, it made a lot of sense to sponsor this, uh, this project. Here are some images. Okay, to, to wrap up, a few conclusions that, that came out of, of my research. And I think for practitioners, these are the conclusions. And it's very important to have a clear storyline or a very clear purpose as to why you do the project. 
because this purpose or this storyline will help you create first clarity in the story, but it will also help you to get a partners and it allows you to reach new networks, people who don't follow you because you take pretty pictures, but they follow you because you actually have a story to tell. Your income will have to come from multiple sources. It pays to, to treat project as projects using multiple outlets, not just make a book, but make a range of books. Develop products based on the purpose of your story. For example, the Borealis project, of course, he sells books, he sells prints, he actually sells trees. There's a story that he did in Scotland where you can, where they are regenerating the boreal forest. You can actually, when you buy a book, you can also buy a tree, which will then be planted in Scotland. He is now actually organizing workshops where he takes photographers along to teach them how to portray trees. When you publish your story through a media outlet, the, the, the media outlet doesn't actually is they, they want a story that's ready to be published there shouldn't be too much work you have to actually deliver the story as a photographer some conclusions for the industry i think that the crisis of documentary photography the so-called crisis of documentary photography is actually a crisis of distribution models and in the, let's say uh, 10 20 years ago photographers had to deliver uh, a different product than they have to deliver today before uh, they delivered the building blocks of visual essays, which the editor would then create. And right now, it's really the photographer is supposed to deliver the actual story uh, uh, without, and the editor just has to adapt it or adopt it for its uh, medium or its distribution channel. And if the buyer is a consumer, they want a range, it, it makes sense to offer a range of project, products in different price ranges. 10 euro postcards, 20 euro book, 50 euro book, uh, 150 euro print, maybe up to a million dollar print, I don't know, but to, to, to offer product, similar products in a whole price range that that, so that people in various uh, spending uh, capacities can also can commit to the story that you're telling instead of merely buying beautiful prints. Okay, there's a lot of information in a very short time. Uh, if you're interested, you can go, you can use your uh, phone um, uh, on this QR code uh, and you can download, lo download the book uh, for free. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to David. I'll stop sharing and I'll ask David to uh, take over. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, first of all, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Let me bring this up. So I just want to talk about what we're doing with the new research project, which builds on Mark's earlier work that he's outlined there. And the overall objective is to see how the value of visual work is being determined and to identify those business structures and practices that can support this work. So again, it's really important to emphasize that documentary photography and photojournalism is our context. Uh, and the, the things that we're looking at may have some value from for some other areas, because we think these things are not in silos. There's quite a lot of overlap between these genres of photography and other genres of photography. But the key question, we have kind of three key points of focus for the new research, uh, and which we want to have a, a global view on. And, and as Mark says, we want to kind of come up with cases and examples uh, from around the world, not to come up with a single model, not to come up with just the one thing that's going to solve the problem, but to show the wide variety of ways in which people are supporting and funding and distributing and publishing work. And I think that's what Mark has demonstrated very well in the, in the research to date, is that there's a huge variety of models going on uh, beyond the traditional editorial market. And actually, we need to get a better understanding of that um, out to the world. But we think there are three kind of focal points um, for the new research. The first one is to articulate the purpose and relevance of documentary photography as a practice and photojournalism as a practice that should be valued. So there's kind of a moral imperative there about should be valued. And I think it's very important to say something about that, because sometimes I think this discussion and debate goes off the rails here because sometimes makers of work think they put a lot of effort into the work, which they clearly do. It takes a lot of skill, which it clearly does. Therefore, it should be valued. 
but that's not how value actually works. Value is something determined by the audience and the community. And it's up to makers and storytellers and photographers in this context to actually be able to get the attention of the audience and the community and demonstrate that the work has value for them. That requires a connection with the audience and so on. So value is not something that can be asserted by makers. It's something that has to be um, appreciated by the audience. And that's an important inversion, I think, to uh, a lot of ways this uh, discussion normally takes place. And when that happens, you kind of lose that moral imperative, which is basically within journalism. What happens is that people say, this story is important, it must be valued, therefore you must pay for it. But it doesn't work like that anymore in the new media economy because you're competing for attention with so many other things. People are prepared to spend a lot of money, they're prepared to spend their time when it's of value to them. And you need to understand the audience and you need to appreciate what the value for the audience is in those cases. The second focus that we have uh, for the research is to think about which channels and platforms are important for publishing, circulating, distributing documentary work, photojournalism work, uh, and connecting with the audience. And here, there's, there, we draw no distinction between the digital and the non-digital print or other. It can be any of the platforms that have been discussed in the panel so far and maybe some that we haven't even thought about, and all those ones that Mark has identified uh, from the previous research. But some will be more important than others, and we're interested to find out if there is a tendency towards one or more platforms um, and which ones those might be. The thing about this issue of channels and platforms is that we currently have both greater diversity in terms of platforms, but as a result, also greater fragmentation. So we have greater diversity because the traditional gatekeepers have been challenged, particularly through the way in which the, the internet has kind of profoundly re-altered the economics of distribution and publication. But once you've got rid of the traditional gatekeepers, particularly in documentary and photojournalism work, then there has been fragmentation and it's hard then to automatically connect with a predetermined audience. You have to find that audience. And this is a theme that I think is coming through is that knowing who your audience, identifying the audience, knowing who your audience is and finding the best way to connect with and engage that audience uh, is one of the fundamental tasks. And then the third focus that we have in the research is to think about the business models and practices that can really support sustainable creation and production of visual stories in photojournalism and documentary photography. And the key word there is sustainable. Um, there are lots of examples. Mark's earlier work has shown the wide variety of ways in which work is being funded and so on. But the question is, are one or more of these going to be sustainable over time for a, a wider number of people? This also, I think, requires a very clear eyed view of the past that doesn't romanticize the past in documentary photography and photojournalism because there is this tendency sometimes to look back at a golden age it's linked to the question of value a tendency to look back to a golden age and say oh people used to value the work tremendously magazines used to pay for it. everything was extremely well funded and now it's all ruined and yes that is true there used to be bigger editorial budgets but that was actually something that lasted only for a very short period of time. And there is always for uh, particularly independent storytellers and photographers, there's always been the need to have a diversity of sources of income and indirect sources of income, maybe from commercial work to support documentary and photojournalistic work itself. There's nothing new in that. So here we also, we have to have a clear eyed view of the past so we can understand what the present situation is and what the future situation can be. And you know, unfortunately, or realistically, certainly within Western Europe and North America, it's always been the case that journalism has never paid for itself. Journalism has always been subsidized. It's been subsidized by advertising. That's where the money came from. And it's the collapse of an advertising model that has meant uh, been the key driver behind the collapse of the editorial market. Um, that's not coming back. 
there need to be new sources. Mark's identified some of them, and we hope in this research to be able to identify others as well. So we want to leave you with one provocation to think about for the discussion. And that is that we think that it's the case that the future of documentary photography depends on entrepreneurs in photography, photographers acting in an entrepreneurial way, being able to reach a sustainable audience by platform specific productions. And so that may also mean that the story operates across different platforms in, in different ways. And what we hope to identify are the parameters of those productions how they can be sustained and then the value that's created in the process. As we go forward, we hope to hear from people. So here are our contacts for that. And uh, we look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And, um, are there any questions from the audience? From us? I just wanted to thank you very much because I think that it was a really, really very useful and, um, and, and inspiring presentation about changing artistic behavior, telling that, of course, we had, we had this debate in the morning that if, uh, if an artist should, so, so how, how multi-sided an artist should be, like uh, have, to be, have to be his own a producer, his own graphic designer, his own the mar marketing people, et cetera, et cetera. And in a way we said no, but in another way we said, we said yes also a little bit because, because it doesn't work without that, of course. And I think that, uh, that what you announced here that, um, that, uh, that market have changed and, uh, and customer behavioral have changed. And this, this also, it, and it's, it's, it's not, a, not a question of, uh, of positive or negative things. It's a fact, it's just a fact. And I think that um, that on such forums like a university, like an art university, whatever it is, like photographic or non-photographic, we we who are teaching the students, we also have to prepare them to these new conditions and not and not 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 blaming the world by using the romantic idea or either idealism of, of of being an artist. This is something new and this is very challenging, I think. And then and uh, Arion can tell that in the moment. For example, the mentioned uh, Daniel Salai, he is also absolutely uh, went through this kind of processes and others as well to find find their own own business models to get 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 ahead. And I think that this is, uh, in a way, this is a must now. If I can quickly react to that, uh, Salt, I think indeed photographers need uh, different skills. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to do, be able to do everything by yourself. Right. I think one of the clear things that, that came out of my research was that if a photographer has a very clear purpose and a very clear idea him, him or herself of what the story should is not of but actually is about, it becomes easier to engage a designer, a marketeer. It's also uh, skills that you can share uh, with others. And, and the other thing is uh, that, that uh, 20 years ago, photographers needed different skills. Um, I remember in, well, I don't actually remember myself, but uh, to be a successful photojournalist 30 years ago, you would have to be able to smoke cigarettes, drink beer and be in bars until uh, 3 a.m. Um, that was a skill at those in those days uh, and be a male 40 year old would probably help as a skill at those, in those days too. Now, those skills are, ne are not as, as essential, but there are other skills. So in that sense, the, the, the world has, uh, has changed and that's in some cases good. Uh, and, and, but in, in any case, it's, uh, it is change because it is change. Yeah, and I really just wanna thank you for that comment and really wanna underscore that point about, it's not about whether it's good or bad. This is the situation now, have a clear eyed view of the situation now, which, and it's also constantly changing. So it's not like we've, gone from one period to another and we can identify that we're in a period of constant change um, and that clear-eyed view and not being romantic about a past that may not have existed anyway and the need to teach students about that and prepare them for that that's an absolutely crucial point and that's something that we want to do in the research also is connect to university programs and education programs to say here are these examples here are these 
the ways it's already being done now that are different. Um, so it's not enough anymore, particularly in documentary and photojournalism, to prepare people to go off to work in a magazine. That's just not going to fly as, a, as, as the start of a viable career. It may happen at some point, but you're going to need a whole lot of other skills too. Marion, you wanted to ask me. Yeah, uh, I was, it was very interesting, but I was, uh, as, as a photographer, I was, I felt troubled <laughs> when I was listening to, to, to you, um, because I was, I'm, I'm thinking that the, in a, in a, in a class at the university, we've got maybe 30 students who have different, different, uh, I mean, their best qualities are different. And now what, um, it's, it's not that we, we need different, uh, uh, how to say, different abilities for the photographers, is that we see those photographers who have a different set of qualities. But those photographers who are choosing the camera because they are shy to build a community around them, around their projects, they still exist and they still work. They just don't get the attention that much. And I think it's, um, yeah. So I, I totally understand that. I think what you're doing is like super useful, but I think there are, there are photographers or students uh, who, who, have to who cannot step out from their bodies, you know, to 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 meet uh, uh, meet these requirements sometimes. Yeah. But uh, but we well, also yeah. heard from the lecture that, that the industry itself, like the art industry, also changing and it creates new companies, like companies like production companies. But you mentioned this like node or something like that, and I also heard about from other territories like fine art territories that they are in some. Some new groups of curators or economists or whatever who who just dedicate themselves to have this kind of artists who themselves they can't step step out to the stage but they have help to connect them with this new new needs of the market so i think that this is also part of this whole whole process yeah i think i think what i first of all i'm glad we disturbed you um because that's the start of good thought is to be a little bit disturbed um you can disturb us too uh, and that'll be productive. Um, I think it's important to understand that where I think there is a tendency in this discussion sometimes when you start talking about business models and market and so on, that you end up with a kind of a neoliberal vision. And then it's all about the individual doing everything, which is kind of what the previous comment was suggesting. Um, but I think a lot of the examples that Mark showed, for example, they're actually collectives. Um, or they're individuals working in partnership with people and so on. So I think that the shy person behind the camera um, still has a great chance of success if they collaborate um, or if they come together with people. So I wouldn't want this to be uh, a sense that we are advocating the creation of like um, neoliberal individuals who are entrepreneurs and who do everything themselves. We're talking about a social practice here, um, and it needs to be collective, collaborative, um, and communal in many cases. All, all the, indeed, all the projects that I did research, and, and it was not a point I, I, I made specifically also because of the limitation in time, but uh, they are all cooperations. And, but the cooperations are not built on the, the, let's say, the social skills of the photographer, but they are built on the, co the purpose of the project. And I think that is a skill even for people who are introvert or, or, or let's say shy. Uh, and and I, I can very much relate to that being an introvert myself. Uh, I'm not building cooperations built on my, uh, uh, my personality, but on the causes of what I try to say. Uh, so I think if that, and then it actually becomes a skill that is easier to teach than not being shy. But it's 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 the, the the challenge of being able to identify your your purpose or the, the 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 let's say the core of your story or your message or whatever you want to call it, um, because it, it is built about around cooperation. This is, and of all the projects that I've I've done, and there's a few more in 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 the in the research uh, uh, report. 
none of them is a one project, one photographer working on their own as an individual, because I think it's it's um, not feasible to to expect that from anyone. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we will continue it later and uh, for in the round table. Um, Michael, I wanted to say something. Yeah, just super quickly. Uh, I just wanted to say that I would actually have loved to heard all of that when I was at my university uh, doing my MA because uh, it was a very short MA. It's, it's just a year in the UK, but uh, still, I think it was very much based on the practice, which is amazing. But I think we were all extremely unprepared to get into the real world, whatever it is. And uh, we got out and one month afterwards, um, the whole world was struck by uh, a pandemic. So it was literally the worst time to graduate. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that this was very helpful to listen to for me personally. But uh, I also agree and understand with all the other points. That <clears throat> made. And Adam, uh, quick note, you also have yeah yeah i mean um thanks for these presentations i was wondering if we uh, do need this uh, kind of uh, prolongation of this uh, model let's say like the business model or like you say uh, ent entrepreneurship which is uh, um which is kind of uh, problematic i would say and when i think about this uh, for example honstra uh sochi project this was um I don't think it would be actually possible to do it uh, uh, today because it's so like kind of quasi-colonial, like post-colonial thing that probably many people would simply reject this. So um, I guess this model is somehow, um, uh, you know, cancelled, like, you know, my students would say it's that they don't need this, you know, they just don't want to see, you know, white men, middle-aged um, explaining uh, and documenting the world and selling you know the prints uh, even though the topics or the issues may be may be important uh, or like uh, you know um, discussed but basically it's not the way they they would like to proceed so uh, i think that we can observe that for example it's also important that uh, there's a whole generation of female photographers who are like uh, proposing a whole new uh, way of uh, uh, of working, like um, let's say um, grassroots kind of collectives, or like uh, uh, things that are not for sale, uh, or are uh, or are kind of making a temporary alliances or like coalitions to have some things done. But basically, it's not really like the documentary model that uh, um, that you, that you were like talking about. So I wonder what would be your answer to this question. Because it, it looks like kind of trying to save at least some parts of you know of this ancient uh, uh, regime or you know like the past uh, times. Uh, uh, so um, uh, you know this is my like a uh, big question mark when it comes to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, presentation about like business models for uh, for today or for future. So uh, in, in, I would say that my uh, Mihaela, that it would be good for you that you didn't actually hear this at the academy or the university because you can produce some new models or like uh, have some whole new, um, you know, um, uh, setup uh, or like the vision of what you can do without like uh, uh, trying to, uh, to get, uh, you know, the remnants of this glorious past of documentary. So I think the documentary as such is, uh, is, is kind of contested and uh, specific, specifically in this uh, business model. I think it's kind of over. So at least in Poland, I can observe this, that we have this grassroots movements of, you know, uh, protests on the streets, archive of public protests, anonymous photographers, uh, you know, like uh, giving things for free or rejecting, you know, uh, agencies to, uh, to sell their work and, and, and stuff like this. So it's... Uh, it's like a huge change, I think, that was happening the last, uh, let's say, two, three or five years. And I guess not only in Central Europe, but also around the, uh, the globe. But this is this is definitely not about saving something from the past. I mean, I tried to be very clear about that by saying that we do not want to have a romantic view of some golden age in the past. 
um, that's been the problem all along is actually there's too much of that romantic view. So we're not interested in saving that. And I think Mark demonstrated very ably with all the examples he gave that we're talking about business models, plural, that are happening now. And they're very different. There's a wide variety of them. Um, and, you know, I think that the relationship between how value is determined, how um, the, the project is supported, and then the, the other questions about the politics of representation that you raised um, in projects, you know, they're linked in some way, but I don't think they're linked in a tight way. The, these are not models that are just for white middle-aged men. These are models for creative practitioners who, who want to work in, in collective and new ways. And I think that they're, they're open to, to anyone to adopt. So the lesson from the Sochi project, Mark knows does project better than I do, but the lesson from the Sochi project would not be about, you know, a, a white colonial perspective. It's about crowdfunding. Now, if, if a feminist collective wants to produce a cloud crowdfunding strategy, then there's nothing, nothing stopping that. Um, so I wouldn't make this distinct, they wouldn't make this tight linkage between kind of the politics of representation in forms of documentary and the business models plural that we're talking about. Okay. I mean, uh, maybe romantic was a wrong word. It's like a, uh, becoming pragmatic out of romantic. This would be the uh, my reading of uh, what you say, like, um, you know, so it's not about romanticizing, but like, um, you know, finding a pragmatic way out of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I would accept that. I ask, uh, Adam, did you make that linkage with, uh, you know, the middle aged uh, white men because of the examples that were shown in the presentation? As in like the photographic project? No, I mean, like, basically that the whole uh, like a discussion that we have now, it's about a certain model of, uh, or like a vision of photography. So for example, you accumulate certain capital, like a bit symbolic or like, I don't know, economic, uh, find followers, you know, do something, mm -hmm. then uh, produce a certain, uh, you know, like um, a vision of some topic that it may be like a Ponte City or it may be Sochi, whatever, you know. But basically, you go somewhere like Edward Burtynski, for instance, you make some things. So basically, you exploit, in a way, some areas or some, yeah. let's say, topics or like uh, trends. So, yeah. for example, you know, Borealis may be about, you know, Anthropocene, um, climate catastrophe. So we know that it will kind of sell. Yeah. And then you do this uh, with some like sharing things uh, uh, with others. So I guess. This is something that, for example, like in today's art world, but I think also in photography world to some extent is, is contested or it's no longer um, you know, accepted, I would say, or cherished maybe. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. We are on a delay, so I would like to welcome uh, in the conversation uh, Attila Horeni, the director of the Institute for Theoretical Studies at MoMA. And not alone, we are very curious of uh, why do you think that there is no royal road, that uh, this is the title of your lecture. So I would like to give you the floor. Thank you, Judith, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Can you hear me all right? And I must say, I think um, just this previous discussion demonstrated that there is no road royal road, actually. There is just not one royal road. Actually, probably there is not one road to wherever we want to go. And one of the questions I'm going to talk about is where exactly we want to go. That is one, that is something that we need to decide. And then again, um, how do we get there? Is there a way, what sort of ways there are that would help us to, to achieve our goal? So this is what I'm going to talk about, I'm trying to share my screen. Um, yeah. Okay, hope you can see it all right. Um, so um, my position is that on the one hand, I'm, I'm a teacher, I, I teach here at, at MoMA, I teach um, um, art history and some aesthetics as well philosophy of art, sometimes philosophy of photography, 
So this is one direction that I'm going to speak from. And then, um, but I'm also uh, um, quite frequently member of boards and, and kind of like curator in various foundations. So I need to think about art and about photography from an institutional point of view, an institutional framework. So that is also something that, that perhaps defines me. And also, um, I'm a regular visitor, not every year, but a fairly regular visitor to Paris Photo. And that also informs you know, my understanding of, um, of um, what I'm going to talk about. And so um, um, I gave, I mean, it, it, it looks a little like um, an academic presentation that I gave actually three or four uh, parts to it, uh, but don't be afraid. So first I'm gonna talk about the question itself and, and also my choice of title. And subsequently I'm gonna talk about what mass mastering photography is or I understand it from two direct from two different angles from the angle of photography and from the angle of institutions and and uh, finally I'm gonna talk about um, institutions a little bit and um, obviously not knowing beforehand what um, what others would talk about um, I didn't know how much I'm going to sort of tap into their discussion and, and, and kind of connect to them, but it will turn out that I do connect to many, on many, many levels and to many, many parts to what has been said uh, already. Uh, perhaps one difference is that my view is not so much coming from one or a few um, sort of projects, looking at one or, or, or a few projects themselves, but it's a more kind of like universal one. But on the other hand, it's, and, in, and on, on the other hand, it's going to be fairly local. So I'm not going to be talking about East or Central European photography and how to represent it on a, on wherever, on the world stage perhaps, but much rather about Hungarian photography, especially when it comes to the institutions, yet some of my examples will not be Hungarian photos. I tried to illustrate my, my, uh, my talk as well. Um, and so, um, you know, the question is, nor were your roles, how do we represent photography on, a, you know, on let's say on the world stage, how do we uh, get photography, get a photographer, get a group of photographers, get a genre, whatever, out and make it kind of like known. And one of, I mean, I brought this, um, this image by Miroslav Tichy. Um, I was, it was probably not this one that I saw in, at, at, at the Paris photo uh, occasion, but it, it was something else. This was actually uh, <clears throat> exhibited in, in, in 2010 at ICP when there was a huge Miroslav Tichy exhibition, roughly hundred photogra photographs were exhibited by Brian Bellis. Um, it was probably something else that I saw and was really, really um, surprised to see its price tag, it, it costs like 10,000 euros. I mean, these are very, very bad um, um, copies, artworks basically, yet these are individual pieces. Um, not very easy to see them. Most of them are blurred, obviously, because he used very strange self-built cameras and also because he developed them, the, the pictures, the images themselves, in, um, in a very rough way, both consciously and out of sort of, um, you know, not caring that much. And he produced like thousands of such images in the 60s and 70s, 80s. Um, and uh, he was pretty unknown until a point when 
basically after his death, he was discovered. And so his example, I think, shows clearly that it's just impossible to figure out a way to achieve a certain stardom, a, cert a certain um, being known, a certain fame. He was absolutely careless, and yet he made it to Periphoto, to ICP. His images cost, obviously, the reason for this is his special way of life, way of living, and the way his, his really uh, autonomous way of creating images and way of living his life, his being an emigre uh, in his home country, um, Czechoslovakia, gave sort of uh, certain stakes, gave certain depth and weight to the images that he produced. Yet this is not something that you can uh, that you can mime, you can emulate. It's just not something that you can follow. It is something that happens and happens to some and does not happen to others. But as I understand, one of the questions that was given to us, or at least given to me, was how do we, how do we, how do our students, how do our photographers, for instance, in Hungary, make it to become um, part of, um, of the book uh, uh, by Charlotte Coton, Photography as Contemporary Art. But we can also ask ourselves, how do we make it into uh, contemporary photography by Elizabeth Coton? What is the way to make it there? Is there a way, is there a, 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 a possibility? And this was by and large the question that Ptolemy, King Ptolemy, as Euclid, Euclid wrote a book called Elements and it was about geometry and it was fairly complicated and long. And so Ptolemy asked him, is there a more simpler way to learn mathematics and, and especially geometry? And then uh, Euclid answered, well, there is no royal road to uh, geometry. And this is what my title uh, implies. There's no royal route to mastering uh, photography, no royal route to mastering geometry, no royal route to mastering photography. The question is what is then, what mastering what? what? What does mastering photography mean? And I'm bringing this image here that was um, shown just a few weeks ago at uh, Fuga, which is a uh, gallery in, um, in Budapest. And the exhibition that was shown in the context of was the private collection of, um, of uh, Arpad Balaj and Andra Dénes, which is a huge, huge, huge contemporary art collection that also has a number of photographs um, in it. And this time it, it was only the photographs that were exhibited or at least some of the photographs that were exhibited. And so this piece was also exhibited there and um, as I was told by the curator, another curator, but by uh, Arpad Bolaj, who uh, is the owner, one of the owner of, of, of this collection and of this image done by Little Warsaw, I was also exhibited. Um, he had to sort of um, get into a kind of like a quarrel with a, um, an art critic, whom journalist, who was talking about this piece as a photography. And he was talking about, Arpad Bolaj was talking about this piece as a work of art that happens to be photography. Now there is a huge difference and this is what I will try to show because the question is what is it really that you want to master photography or photography as contemporary art? So you can be a good, Photographer, once you learn the techniques and you can, you know, photograph as a pro. But there's also photography as art, which is art in the sense as sculpture is art and as in the sense that painting is art and also drawing can be art and, and, uh, and so a number of other things can also be art. This is one such medium 
that, it, that, that we can also call art. It's mostly like studio art in the sense that it's, it can be very nice, it can be very decorative, or it can be very sort of thoughtful. It is photography as art, but photography can be fine art as well. And, and between art and fine art, it may, it may not be the, the correct term that I'm using here now or the most plausible. Here. Nonetheless, perhaps it will be understood what I'm trying to say that photography as fine art is something that is shown not in a photography exhibition, but in a fine art, in a properly kind of uh, fine art exhibition, in a fine art museum, in a, in a, in a uh, in a um, fine art exhibition. And then obviously there can be a, th a, a, a fourth step here or a fourth category when we talk about photography as contemporary art. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because between fine art and contemporary art, there might be a difference as contemporary art nowadays is used as, um, as, a, as, a, as, as something distinct. It's something after postmodernism Contemporary art has its has its own sort of uh, uh, values, own sort of uh, qualities, and I'm going to come to this in a moment. So there's an here's an example by Richard Evidon for photography, simple as a pro when you're a professional photographer and doing advertising work or doing photojournalism, for instance. Uh, on the right hand, you can see Albert Zander's um, image from uh, 20th century people, a huge, 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 and extremely interesting um, body of work, consisting many, many sort of portfolios, um, looking at, at, at different parts of basically German society. Uh, and it was documenting, as you all know, it was documenting um, German society. It was not a photojournalist, um, way of looking at things, but it was going beyond that. It, this is something that I would call photography as art. And here we have, and, and, and I chose obviously Zander and, uh, and Becher and, and uh, Burski as, as a lineage, uh, starting with, with Zander and coming to uh, Becher as uh, Düsseldorf. Uh, school of Photography is two most important um, teachers or professors, and Andras Gurski, who uh, is one of their uh, most famous uh, students and pro probably the single most, one of the, well, I wouldn't say the single most important photographer currently, but one of the more important photographers at, at, at this point in time. And uh, especially if we consider photography as contemporary art. So what I'm saying is that um, Ben and Hila Becher became not just photographers, but rather artists, conceptual artists. Their work was conceptual art that had its medium as photography. And basically since they started working and also since um, various uh, happenings and performances, uh, or, or environmental uh, art pieces were, or land art pieces were photographed. And then these photographs were kept in museums. That's basically um, the time since uh, we can talk about photography as fine art photography within uh, fine art museums and not in photography collections and photography uh, museums or, or, or galleries. That's basically the point when they started thinking along uh, the problems and questions of contemporary, then contemporary art that was basically conceptual art, various conceptual art and, and also some of uh, minimal art and post minimal art and so on. And uh, coming to Angas Gurski, they took, I mean, he took uh, basically the lead of, 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 of the backers, yet, um, he and the other uh, students that, 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 that he was studying together with, like Andras Strut and, and others, um, changed the whole story and made it a lot bigger. It, it was still kind of like documenting something, yet documenting what just lost there. And the image became 
a huge, huge, huge spectacle that was also a panel, also working like a panel painting. Uh, definitely needed huge collections, not just private collections. Most of these images are housed in huge um, um, museum collections. And so, um, in a sense, the image itself, the work of art itself changed because it became part of what contemporary art is. So I'm saying is, that once we try to teach our students, and that's actually one of the perspectives that I'm talking from, we want to teach our students how to master photography. We need to ask ourselves, photography as what? What do we want them to master? Photography as a pro, as a, as, 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 as a good photojournalist or a good advertising um, person, ad, ad photo person, or we want them um, to work in fine art, or we want them actually to be able to understand what contemporary art is, um, and, and, and be working within that context. And the thing is, and for the first two options, you need to understand photography, history of photography, and contemporary photography really, really, really deeply. That's basically um, what I believe we teach uh, at, um, at, at our both, uh, both our, our, our photography programs, um, the history of photography and contemporary photography. What we do not teach them though, is um, what contemporary art is. And one of the things, and what fine art is, and the history basically of 20th century art and 20th century, um, and, and, and 21st century art uh, contemporary. And I believe if we wish them to, uh, to achieve you know, fame, if we wish them to get into that context, what, um, what fine art is and what contemporary is, we need to help them understand it really, really uh, deeply. Uh, this is one very short introduction and I'm, I'm almost ashamed to bring this up, but it's a very good, book actually that tells, that teaches you what actually uh, contemporary art is and how it works. And I just uh, pick out a few, a few um, sort of important qualities that contemporary art is, uh, can be categorized with. It is almost always globalized. It, it, it appears almost always in financial centers. It works in BNLs and art fairs. You cannot have contemporary art without these, actually. It is almost always using huge spectacles. So if you want to become a, contempor a, photographer, uh, a, a contemporary artist as a photographer, you need to have some sort of spectacle. It always applies, I mean, contemporary art always applies various media, most of the time mixed media, and it always thinks in, in installation, almost always thinks in installations. And if you think of that, if you think of the move, for instance, just um, earlier, I think Claudia mentioned Peter Kukush. Well, the way he is working now is, is really thinking in, in uh, installations and in mixed media. That's the way he kind of like came closer to becoming a contemporary artist and not just a contemporary photographer that earlier he was. It is almost always autonomous in some ways, even though it needs to be sponsored, it needs to be financed because it's extremely, uh, extremely expensive. It needs to think out of the box. So it needs to think, needs to find ways that are not the same as the ways that, that were going on earlier decades. Uh, and most of the time, they, uh, these, 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 these works are activist or political. And I'm coming to the third point part of my, my, my talk, which is mastering photography when it comes to institutions. What we need, again, still, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from the perspective of, of educating our students, what we need to do, and, this, and for this reason, um, the talk, um, um, that we just heard by Mark and by Dave was really illuminating because it not just helped us or not just uh, showcased us for us 
the need to, un to help our students understand the way various genres, especially the documentary genre works, but how it is financed, basically. And this is on, on the other, you, you, can, you can talk about it as, a, as an institutional question and how photographers, how, uh, um, yeah, how photographers can kind of like hack institutions, hack the system and introduce new or newer models um, into, into the system. So in that sense, uh, their talk uh, really connects to both of my points. What I'm trying to, or what I would be uh, saying, or what I'd like to suggest here is um, that from the institutional point of view, contemporary art is, as I said, is globalized and it needs money. Um, because it is done, most of the time it's done in biennials and art fairs. It needs a, a very strong gallery system. Also, in some occasions, um, state run sort of sponsorships and foundations. And it also have to be spectacular, spectacle, uh, which again needs sponsors. So all this is something, all this is a, um, all these are sort of add to the condition that we are in presently or has been in uh, or we have been in for the last uh, two decades, perhaps three decades, that our students cannot excel simply by understanding how to take photography, how to take photos, how to make photography. They cannot excel simply by understanding what others do as photographers, but they need to understand the system that surrounds them. They need to be able to connect to that system, either in a way, either as hacking the system, as introducing new ways, or as uh, using older ways, the gallery system, for instance, but they need to understand it really, really deeply. And this is something that, it, that I believe we are very little able to do uh, here um, you know, at MoMA or in, or in Hungary. The reason I'm we're very little able to do this, I'm gonna talk in a minute, but again, I wish to emphasize, it's not just the gallery system itself. They need to understand how galleries work, how museums work, how uh, art newspapers work, how other types of like photo books and other types of publications work how biennials and art fairs work. So they simply need to understand the various steps they can take and how sort of the logic behind those steps, what is the logic if there is one? What is the logic behind those steps and how they can connect them? But there is a huge problem here in Hungary. I would say that uh, Again, I'm, I'm repeating contemporary art, contemporary photography, most of the times globalized, it happens in financial centers, gallery systems, sponsors. I'm, I, I could repeat everything here. This needs an institutional framework. And this is something that we're very much in need of in Hungary, both when it comes to photography and when it comes to contemporary art. Um, my example with Little Warsaw's um, piece was that even, or the reason I wrote it up was that even a, an art critic and a collector cannot decide whether a piece is a photography, is a piece of photography or a piece um, is a piece of, of, of contemporary art. If they cannot decide it, if, if, if there is no sort of mutual understanding on this issue. That means that there's no mutual understanding, no common understanding of what the boundaries of photography is and what the boundaries of contemporary art is and how they overlap at times, obviously. Sometimes they overlap. And if that is not the case, then how could, what could we teach um, to our students um, um, 
in order them in order for them to excel um, in these fields. If the institutions are not um, uh, well worked out um, in this theoretical way, how can we help our students? But the institutions are not well worked out, or at least, or, or, or actually there's a huge absence of such institutions uh, on kind of like on the building level as well. So if you think of what, institu what, 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 what galleries, what museums Budapest and Hungary have for contemporary art and how they show contemporary art, you can, you can realize it is very, very, very poor. There is just no such spaces. And it's the same with photography. It's just what Claudia was talking about. I'm not going to repeat that. And due to the absence of these, due to the absence of a properly working institutional framework, there is not much you can teach. We can teach the ideal state, or at least the ideal states. But there's not much in, in that sense, the work lacks the context that it would need in order to have a meaning, in order to have um, a quality, in order to have sort of a point um, in time and space. Um, so no royal road, that means that there's not one road, there are many roads, but presently, I'm afraid in Hungary, um, it is absolutely the individual um, um, working that could help certain persons who are knowledgeable enough in um, the way the art world works outside this country that can sort of make it to a certain point. But unfortunately, uh, that is just not something that can be taught. And that is just not something that can be sort of uh, reused as a knowledge by others. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Athena. Um, it was um, very inspiring and um, we knew that uh, we have a lot of tasks to do, a lot of jobs to do, but um, now you clarified a lot of fields of, uh, of what we have to do. Uh, we only have a little time for questions or comments because we are on a little delay. So is there any question or comments? It was very interesting. I mean, this uh, I absolutely understand your pessimistic vision, Attila. And I absolutely see so, but on the other hand, I feel that this is a contradiction between these facts and the other fact that we are teaching. And on the other hand, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I always uh, think that, that uh, from our side, there should be some wise advices for the students, which uh, somehow liberates them to do whatever they want and to approach the system as they want, because it's not our pessimism which define their future. It's their solutions which define their future. I just want to tell you one very funny example. Once when I was a young curator, I met uh, by chance um, uh, a then famous curator, Barbara von van der Linden, who was one of the curator of the Manifesta exhibitions. And I was asking her like a kind of a student from a student position, what should I do to be a better curator? And she just told me, watch another thousand portfolios and then be a curator. And I think that this is the wise advice because, because through such a process, of course, we get, in, we, 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 we get in much more involvement in the whole system and we understand all of these problems what, uh, what, uh, what you also raised, but if uh, I, raise such a mountain in front of a student, then I think the better she or he gives up because it's, it's impossible to solve this. It's yeah, just- I mean, a student, yeah, of course, one student cannot solve it. One, one school cannot solve it. And then you could say that it's, it's like a huge mountain. 
that's just unsurmountable, and and that's just that. But it's but but then again, it's it's just not true uh, because once we start talking about this, once we once we start teaching our students all all this, um, they may come to a point where um, they start kind of something grassroots, what just was mentioned earlier, and start their own sort of ways. And then we may hope that at one point they will reach a level where they will be in a position to decide in certain cases and start sort of, um, you know, um, start to have sort of better institutional institutions, better institutional frameworks. So we can help them um, in that direction. This is one thing. And the other thing is that um, 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 what, for instance, Peter Puklus's example shows me is that if you are uh, diligent enough and, um, and talented enough and, um, and do learn your lesson in terms of how fine art works, and how various institutions work outside the country, you may be able to enter that world. This is basic, and 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 there are a lot more examples, I would say, in in contemporary art. Not so many in photography, but in contemporary art, not photography. A lot more such examples. So it is possible, obviously, but these are individual examples, and so what we cannot give them is a road, this is the way you can walk. Because that road is just not built. In other countries, such roads are built and then questioned and, 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 and deconstructed and reconstructed and all sorts of directions there are. If, if just one thing, um, uh, Claudia mentioned, I think, um, or, or no, it was Orion actually who mentioned photo festival. Thing is that in this country, there has been like three or four different kind of like photo festivals, photo months and whatever. And they competed against each other on the same budget. It was the same National Cultural Fund budget that they were competing against each other. Unless we can come to a, um, an under, it's in a, a small country, honestly, it's a small country. Couple hundred photographers really were competing for this whole story. If we are able to sort of decide on certain principles, certain institutions, certain directions, the other similar thing is this: is this sad story of uh, photo museum. Unless we have a museum, unless we have a canonizing space, it is just very difficult to understand the role, the output, the quality of one or two or whatever um, pieces or artists or whatever. It's just not, you know, it just, it just cannot be measured in that sense. And you cannot jump or just very few can jump from Budapest to Paris or from Budapest to Berlin or from Budapest to London or wherever. It is, unless it is in that sense, built and structured here in this country, it is very difficult to, to go further than that. It took like 40 years for the people, painters in the 60s and 70s to make it out there, Bokim and others, as you know. It took 40 years to, to make it there. And obviously it was uh, the last five to 10 years that, that uh, private money worked so much, so badly to achieve this goal that we did achieve it. But apart from that, it's just, it's really um, individual achievements that, that can have no, no goal, no, no, no roads, no directions, just, just, just chance, some knowledge. Thank you, Attila, and, and please stay with us. Um, we will continue in the round table, but, um, now I would like to um, give the word um, to our last um, lecturers uh, today, um, Mati Gabor and uh, 
good as Gabor Arion, who are artists, photographers, educators at the uh, MoMA Photography Department. And uh, I would like to highlight their work as the curators of the symposium's online exhibition that you can check uh, on the site. And uh, their presentations um, we are related to their work at the um, at moment on this um, exhibition, as well as um, um, professionals. So first, I would love to ask uh, for Matthew Gabor's presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabor Mate. I'm a photographer, a teacher, and head of photography BA program at Moholina University of Art and Design. As a teacher and a photographer, I often notice that intensive influences have a great impact on the visual language and style of young photographers. As a result, most of them just want to be similar to their peers and follow trends. My lecture will offer a solution on how to be independent and perhaps influential by understanding the underlying philosophy in the photographic process. So, what should we learn first of all to be independent and autonomous? My answer is, first we have to learn to rule the apparatus of photography. Apparatus here meaning those material elements which take the role in creating a photograph. These elements are light sources, light manipulating objects, and light sensors. In this presentation, I will focus on the role of different light sources by presenting some photographs of the exhibition belonging to our work in context symposium. I will try to explain how illumination influence the messages of a photograph or a whole series. Now I share my screen. Okay. So, sunshine. Most of us like sunshine. It has a positive influence on our mood. This kind of light can ease our pain, and it's also used to treat depression in some cases. It's obvious that Andras Stornozzi showed us something positive about healthcare in the dark days of lockdown. I think in this photograph, it's important that the doctor's head was illuminated by sunshine. First, it's quite unusual to see a doctor wearing a mask in natural, direct sunlight. Due to that, this photograph becomes a bit strange. Also, the sunshine can be connected to some happy days, holidays, reminds us positive feelings on a hot summer day with a clear blue sky. The sun is not only the most powerful light source we know, but can also be an object, the symbol of understanding. But too much of it can also burn us quickly. Andras is taking photographs about other iconic elements, COVID-19 pandemic, like washing cans, also under the almost clear blue sky, illuminated by sunshine. And I think it gives a unique interpretation of this topic. Flashlight from the camera gives another impression to the images. This light source was mostly applied by photojournalists because this is the best tool to freeze fast moving objects and to document reality as it is. And so it became a kind of symbol of objectivity. Joffrey Shivak appears to want nothing more than to document the disappearing world of the Hungarian countryside pubs. By using a flash gun, she gives us a vision that can only be seen by her camera. This room becomes almost like a crime scene in this illumination. This photograph about the bars of this curtain could remind us of prison grip. In this case, the flash gun enlightens the foreground 
makes the pub triumphant but also mysterious, like in the most commercial photographs. And the whole scene becomes a bit ironic. So we can clearly see the conscious selection of a light source makes a huge impact on the interpretation of the project. Try to imagine how much this image would be different if it was illuminated by flash gun or direct sunshine. What impressions does this soft light give to this hand in gloves full of keys? Most of the natural soft light formed under heavy dark clouds on melancholic rainy days. This soft light is a bit different due to the warm tones, so it's more like dawn or dusk. Tota Gable is portraying capitalism in a symbolic way and reflecting on its values and prices in her project. So in this symbolic image, the light itself gives a hopeful and hopeless impression of this peaceful moment with the threatening presence of peace. She is not as consistent in applying the same kind of illumination like the artists I presented before. She also uses hot sunshine that in this case cuts the body to pieces due to the heavy sharp shadows. In this photograph, she uses completely human made artificial lights, fire and flesh. As we can see, the sun is excluded from the scene. Strange. Some people say there is nothing new under the sun. A new church or a layout of a new church gives a cold, melancholic impression due to this foggy day soft light condition. Beyond the existence of this strange solution of drawing the floor plan of a church in the field, this melancholic atmosphere expresses Antal Banhegyes's opinion about the church building projects in Romania. The conscious choice of flash gun not only highlights this set of interesting road signs, but also, like in the case at the Hungarian pubs, makes the image mysterious and threatening. No mystery at all in this sunny photograph. The priests are not in their ordinary space, not in their ordinary illumination in the church, like we usually used to see them. As we know, sunshine illuminates everything bright and clear. The effort to create a holy atmosphere by wearing special dresses is useless because sunshine can shed light on secrets and reveal the truth. In the night time, hard lights usually create deep and dark shadows. Some parts of the images remain invisible. This makes us uncertain and uncertainty in induces fear. Not only the long nails are frightening in this photograph, but the light itself, or more the lack of it, makes the scene frightening too, because we cannot figure out the situation itself. We could feel a bit unnerved, unhangy. Roxana is also applying different kinds of light sources just to express our present days that became grotesque by the tension between our nostalgia and our desperate desire for a utopian future. Sometimes she uses colored lights that can be seen in modern cities, entertainment places, but not at all in nature. Or making monochrome black and white images. This kind of light doesn't exist. So that is one of the reasons why most of photographers use black and white to make a kind of abstraction or sometimes just following trends. In this series, the reason to use black and white images is not only to make abstraction or create anachronistic nostalgic mood, but to make the scene scarier and more grotesque. Yes, scary, because when we see a black and white image, 
we unconsciously remember the weakness of our sight. In low light conditions, usually at night, the human eye senses reality in black and white due to the fact that our color sensors in our eyes do not work in low light conditions. This is called the Purkinje effect. And that is the proof that we are not night creatures. Despite nowadays we love to go out at night, genetically we feel uncertain and have fear in low light conditions when the world appears black and white to us. In some of the photographs about the world of the Hungarian motors built in the 90s, Honor Redling was making self-portraits with a simple flash gun. Beyond documentation, this slide here recalls the aesthetic of snapshots. Also recalls the curiosity of a paparazzi. Sometimes she illuminates a scene with the warm early morning or late afternoon sunshine. But some other photographs were created in the virtual space with virtual lights. This virtual illumination can also recreate the atmosphere of sunset or dawn. All these experiments and the variety of different lights and visuals has an aim to express her ambivalent relation with our cultural She's thinking about how could we face or accept our cultural heritage that we would rather wipe from our memory, made of color TV, queen beds, and exotic dreams. And now I stop screen sharing. And summing it up, all in all, these examples from the Working Context exhibition are a clear illustration on how illumination influences the message in a photograph. And by knowing these effects, we can have a better chance to release ourselves from the empty, fashionable influences and create our own visual language. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Um... I will talk about something uh, something different than uh, uh, Mate Gabor. Um, looking back at this last uh, uh, last two days, I feel somewhat intimidated uh, being the last speaker at the symposium after listening to all the exciting lectures. Um, I was thinking, what can I add that has relevance without repeating what we heard already? Um, I kind of feel like I'm here to talk about the weather, uh, the unnoticeable and the gradual shift from the pleasant to the unbearable in our atmosphere. Um, first of all, lately we hear more and more about the responsibility of photographers and the shift in ethical, uh, yeah, so we hear more and more about the responsibility of photographers and the shift in ethical norms the privacy rights and so on. But there is less talk about the role of reckless photography in maintaining democratic values. I mean, photography practicing freedom of speech. Depicting the world in its gruesome conditions probably cannot be done without offending someone. But being offended is uh, way too easy. To endure being offended is a reasonable price to pay if we are not the beneficiaries who'd rather hear only silence. Uh, and I, I just, I just uh, look back to, uh, refer, refer back to uh, Alexander's uh, presentation. Uh, so I, in, in, my, in my abstract, I promise to argue for photography as a conscience of society. So this is what I will uh, do. The photography department of MoMA uh, at that time, MIF was founded in 1984, and the first bachelor diplomas were given in 1988, and the first masters in 1991. Uh, that coincidence in time with the fall of communism in Hungary is at least interesting, or at least interesting to me. 
I asked the question, would it be possible to educate professional and autonomous photographers without simultaneously causing the fall of an oppressing political structure? I don't think so. I honestly believe that photography is the art form of democracy. Maybe this has to do with the medium's special relationship to reality, which I don't really want to uh, uh, go into detail with right now. But it's hard to imagine an autocratic or a, even a totalitarian regime with a thriving photography scene. And here we should not be confused by the sporadic examples of artists who in the 70s and 80s secretly used photography. Um, the photographer, I think, is an eye opened wide for trouble. And, the, and uh, the troubles are the last thing regimes want to be exposed. When I say that the photographer is the conscience of society, I mean this, that his her central, central responsibility is to show the cracks and tears in the fabric of society. Yeah. The purpose of photography is not decoration but to search for truth, even when it is unbelievable. Uh, it's a quote, not my word. Uh, I want to bring to the table a problem that we at the school are more often confronted with lately. Uh, and this problem is called self-censorship. Um, and it's not by accident that I show Beda Kincho's work uh, while I'm talking. A growing number of students are confused. They come to me when they are interested in a topic that has a possible political edge. And they ask whether it is possible or is it tolerated or allowed or supported for them to work on this topic. What makes them think that it would not be okay? They are afraid to compromise the university or their studies. Maybe their work wouldn't be valued for its own merit. Uh, but it would be valued for the side it takes. They think that their friends or family would be offended if they found out about it. They consider that they may not be able to exhibit at galleries that avoid critical or political art. So I think quite a few galleries. Fear of being intimidated by commenters, gallery goers, critics is also part of their uncertainty. These fears can be treated. But we see students who don't even ask, just instinctively discard their non-conformist ideas. An artist is either a revolutionary or a decorator. Social media is massively pushing young and pliable talents towards the latter. We have to deliberately counterbalance this tendency. The university is taking pride in their autonomy, are able to protect the ability of students to ask uncomfortable questions and to propose unusual solutions. There, I mean, the students, uncertainty is a danger. It comes from the conditioning they receive from the media, social media, even lower education, GDPR, misinterpreted rights movements, and fashion camouflaged as morality. Let me bring here a few examples of silencing. Uh, I took this example, most of them from the artists who are exhibiting alongside this symposium. Yes. Kora Sun is a Chinese student who studied in Budapest with a state scholarship. In her diploma work, which is not the one which is in our exhibition, she attempted to follow the demolition and redesign of the old quarter in her expanding hometown the title of the series was Hometown Redesign. As a Chinese citizen, she found it risky to be critical of government decisions. And at times she felt that uh, she's pushed to criticize her own Chinese identity. She often mentioned during consultations that she has to return home someday uh, and some things better not be too explicit or nobody knows who's listening or, con or, or online conversations. Uh, Balázs Túrós portrays Roma people. This image from his diploma project photographed in 2017 was supposed to be 
in a catalogue of a photography fair in Hungary. I received a call from the organizers that another image should be selected for the catalogue. For some time during the conversation, I thought that the problem was with the kiss. Although it was never made explicit, the person who called me didn't say it, but the real problem was that the kissing youth are obviously Roma. Fun fact that another photograph of another artist was also put aside for the same reason, except that photograph was taken in India. You eventually stop thinking about what good message an image can carry and start to think about the problems, the controversy, the criticism it may generate. And the key word here is, it may. While I show this image of Gabor Baksha, the uh, Baksha series, Monodirectional Dialogue, I would rather like to mention the work of a classmate of his, Gergő Goston. For two years, Gergő documented the reconstruction of stadiums, uh, a uh, process that was taking place at the time all around Hungary amidst severe opposition from the left. He was literally scared to select the images that underlined his political views. He wanted to remain impartial, neutral, and uninteresting. In the end, his fear turned out to be realist, as the photo book containing his photographs was rejected by the football club that ordered it in the first place. Even so, he refrained from shaping uh, criticism out loud. They rather did not see the documentation of the reconstruction at all than to see it through the eyes of an autonomous artist. There are no restrictions, there are no guidelines, but there are consequences. Noemi Sechi and Andrea Sturi just recently photographed the local community of young Jewish girls. Last month, they were shocked to tears by the response their work generated when it appeared in a picture gallery on a news portal index uh, in Hungary, which is quite big. Racist trolls attacked the girls with near, nearly death threats. Noemi was in fear for her subjects. What damage her images may cause them. She felt that by unpublishing the series, she can protect her subjects. Andreas Stornuzzi has spent the last two years at hospital COVID vaccination sites, places that are nearly inaccessible for photographers. Earlier this year, Andreas took part in a civil initiative to take maskless portraits of doctors and nurses working at COVID-19 wards in order to use these portraits at the wards to help person-to-person -person bonding between patients and the staff. We saw the success of such experiments around the world. Yet again, a phone call from higher ministerial, ministerial levels uh, stopped and forbade the project that earlier got the green light from hospital directors. This suggests that any other project needs or will need the highest confirmation. We see less and less room for private initiative and less time uh, on my part to talk, so let's, let's wrap it up. Negative experiences are a necessary part of an artist's life. We at schools have to convert these experiences to, uh, so these make our students uh, or the future artists more durable, louder if needed, and better navigators. It's a hard task, as self-censorship does not avoid teachers, especially when they are photographers as well. Cancellation or cancel culture uh, is getting stronger. It is equal, if not worse, than state censorship because it does not appear in the form of higher power that has defined outlines and policies. Cancel culture is disguised, is disguised as the voice of the public, which it is not. Every form of silencing, intimidating independent thought, I mean, int intimidating independent thought, sorry, Ghosting critical voices is a new tool in the hands of dictatorship, not a dictatorship that exists, but a dictatorship that will exist. The responsibility lies in not what we say, but we, 
what, but in what we refuse to say. Not what we photograph, but what we miss to photograph. We know that it costs when our conscience is silenced. Bad things happen. When society silences its conscience, that's even worse. As a colleague of mine, Miklos Gujas, often says, if current morals and laws were active throughout the history of photography, then about 90% of it wouldn't have been photographed at all. Let me remind you of something that Short Petrani mentioned yesterday regarding the documentum gatherings. Uh, the officials, so what he said was that the officials of the regime are watching, but they don't understand photography. They are worried because they know what photography is capable of. So um, I think we need to organize more of these intercultural gatherings like this among photographers and theoreticians and invite new voices and different viewpoints. We need to break down the walls between photography cultures in the region to help and support each other. We need to educate the next generation of photographers to dare the system of silencing and not just governments, but all kinds of silencing. We need to be less polite and more honest to, to regain the trust in the photographer as the conscience of society. Uh, there was a thought reinforced in me uh, by the lectures today uh, and uh, yesterday, which I can only summarize this way. We need to document, 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 and share, share, share. <laughs> okay. Or uh, I, I uh, have, a, have a poet who I don't like, but there is a quote which I really like of him, uh, Attila Jozef. And uh, the quote goes like this uh, in a not the best English translation, unfortunately, so sorry about that. You know this well, the poet never lies. The real is not enough through its disguise. Tell us the truth, uh, which fills the mind with light because without each other, all is night. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm sorry if I was two minutes late or longer. <laughs> thank you. Fine. Thank you very much, uh, Orion. Um, thank you. Um, any questions? Because uh, I have one. That uh, what is your uh, experience? Uh, how many students um, or do the students uh, leave uh, the country after they uh, finish their BA or MA uh, studies? Um, it's a very good, very good question. I, um, I think it would be the best if, uh, if, and, and don't get me wrong. So I think it would be the best if everyone would leave for a time to look around. So I think it's, uh, in the, in the old, old days, I mean, old days, like uh, centuries ago, people, when they finished the school, they had to go to see around in the world. And I think it's uh, maybe because of the language barrier and whatever, I think it's not enough, not enough students. And even during their studies, it's not enough students who are uh, going into the world or outside of Hungary. Um, who is staying uh, after five, seven years of trying to make it in London or, or New York, many return. So it's, uh, I would say from every, every year we have uh, in the MA, we have 12 uh, students. It's about four who, uh, who take a longer time abroad. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um... Why did you ask that? You did. What was your? Um, I asked. I asked that it um, it uh, just um, stuck in my mind, and I'm uh, I'm sorry that Alexander is not here. Uh, I was just wondering that uh, we are talking about a lot uh, of uh, Central European photography, and uh, 
in my generation uh, from my high school um, classmates nearly 90 percent of them has uh, has left the country so only very few people stayed in hungary and um, i i when i was in the uk i met a lot of uh, polish and uh, slovak um, students and and um, friend, i met friends there so this is this is a question that uh, why they are leaving and why they come back or why they uh, do not come back and uh, this is why I was also um, asking Mihaela the same that uh, will she stay or will she go back to the UK so this is I think a tendency that uh, a lot of students um, a lot of young people has just um, leaving the country but, but I just agree what Arya said that uh, that if you want to know more about the system that you have to leave, leave and you have to have another perspective because if you don't have this other perspective then you can't uh, have a clearer view about the problems or about the um, solutions so I, I i was also participating in different scholarships after my university years but i have not left the country in that sense yeah. i think that there is a there is a difference between the ones who who wants to get a kind of postgraduate experience or to, to just have, um, have any kind of uh, assistance on the side of an artist or something like that abroad, but then they will figure out how to, how to continue their careers uh, and they are coming back. And the other ones who definitely decide to leave the country because of existential reasons and to try to to, to start their career on a field where they don't know at all and where they do not have any kind of networks, which I think is also a very hard, hard uh, part. Audio? May I respond to this? It's... Um, um, yeah, no, I, later, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I cease to respond. Uh, Adam and Michaela, because uh, yeah, you are so we we can hear some some Polish and uh, and and uh, uh, Czech or Slovak uh, Slovak uh, opinions as well. So what, what what is the case in your countries? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to, to thank you, Gabor, for this very brave uh, presentation. Uh, However, I think it's not the best ending for our meeting. Uh, and I hope it's not like, um, I mean, it's super sad in a way, but also I kind of admire your frankness uh, presenting this kind of acts of self-censorship and also uh, this um, situation, uh, I guess, uh, is not only um, within the university, but you can feel it in the institutions, right? Like uh, uh, around the, the Hungary. Uh, so I really appreciate that you, uh, uh, you know, that you said about these things that openly. Uh, however, I would I would add uh, maybe one thing because I think this is also very important to somehow uh, divide these two moments of let's say canceling uh, uh, certain projects because one on the one hand we have this let's say. Uh, like in Poland, um, um, the culture that is under political pressure and uh, many, especially um, uh, those institutions who are run by the ministry, uh, they are simply, you know, you know censoring um, uh, art, like in the 80s, almost like under communism. So, of course, this is uh, once you do something against the, let's say, government or the uh, conservative politics, you are immediately on the blacklist. So you won't get any grants from the ministry, you won't get any shows, you won't be able to uh, go to even uh, V4 residences and so on and so on. Uh, no acquisitions to museums, uh, stuff like this. But this is like a part of, let's say, political situation with a kind of state, uh, populist state censorship. But the other thing is this uh, cancel culture that is coming from the, let's say, um, liberal um, or leftist kind of, um, uh, you 
you know, like um, perspective or I don't know, like a situation, like the, the condition that you don't want to be violent, you don't want to abuse your power. So this is, for example, I mean, uh, first I have to say that I didn't want to sound harsh, like, uh, uh, you know, criticizing this uh, white uh, middle-aged man because this is me myself. So I'm, I was kind of talking about canceling myself in a way. Uh, so, uh, so uh, sorry, Mark, if, if I kind of, you know, sound, sounded like, uh, like that, but I didn't want, it was just like an opening of a discussion because this is also concerning me uh, and myself. So uh, uh, this was this cancel culture that I was kind of briefly mentioning, uh, you know, uh, when I was talking about, uh, for example, Rob Honstra, that I remember when I was a curator at the CCA in Warsaw and we were about to exhibit this. And we finally did exhibit the uh, Sochi project, but majority of the, cult, uh, of the curators uh, of the venue were against this because this was like a kind of, you know, look at this Russian kind of joke uh, done by somebody, you know, from the West, uh, kind of confirming certain cliches also very present uh, in Poland, uh, kind of Russophobic, um, and so on and so on. So basically this is this moment of, let's say, cancer culture that um, that I think it, it is important and should be debated, you know, so you don't want to have, uh, for example, students uh, or like even photographers uh, humiliating others or, you know, or like violating their kind of uh, safe zone. So I think in, in this respect, uh, it has to be negotiated and it's definitely one of the most important things to be discussed, not only in uh, today's photography, but basically in culture. Uh, but it's a bit different than, uh, than this, you know, harsh state uh, uh, propaganda system that is trying to uh, cancel all uh, dissident votes uh, uh, coming from, you know, let's say they call it uh, in Poland, you know, leftist, feminist, uh, uh, liberals who are anti-Polish anti, anti -Polish government. So I, wanna, I wanted to say only these uh, uh, two uh, things. Uh, and uh, and once again, I'm uh, sorry if you know. Don't get me wrong, Mark. Uh, and uh, I mean, like mm, both of you, because I was trying to be quick, but it kind of concerned me, and I didn't want to like um, uh, be negative about this. I was just uh, wondering myself how it looks like from your perspective, because I remember these discussions. I was creating Marta Rosler show at the very same time as Rob Honstra was in the town. And, you know, uh, Rosler is like representing totally a different view. And she was like against this sort of kind of documentary and was already like 2013 or 14, something like this. So I think that this, this kind of model of, um, let's say documentary work uh, has kind of, um, you know, in my opinion, it, it, it is uh, questionable. So this is why I was uh, trying to be direct, but I didn't want to like, uh, be picky or negative in any way, okay? So, um, uh, so this is like my disclaimer uh, to finish this sort of, uh, uh, you know, statement uh, in this point of a discussion. Thank you. Orion? Yeah, I, um, yeah. Um, it's it's it, two two things happen simultaneously. I'm just I'm just saying that the the students as young individuals. They are experiencing both uh, both directions, both influences here in Hungary, definitely. So it's um, sometimes you know sometimes it's uh, easier to 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 uh, uh, to convince them of that you can put that picture in the catalog. Who cares? Uh, but there, um, um, the um, so the cancel canceling ideas within the heads. Of artists, young artists, is is happening, and it's not uh, not happening here in Hungary. It happens everywhere, uh, maybe not the not in the same direction, and that uh, I see it on the debate. So when I mean not on this debate, but on the debate with the students sometimes, um, and then uh, I wanted to react to uh, uh, to Judith's. Uh, 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 question a bit that um, there was one of you mentioned that uh, I think Attila mentioned Attila Horányi mentioned this that it's a uh, Hungary is a community of photographers of 500 photographers right it's a small it's a small business 
And uh, those who go abroad very quickly recognize that uh, in London or in Berlin, there are 10,000 photographers, the best photographers from everywhere, and they have to compete with those 10,000. And uh, from Budapest, New York is closer because you only compete with the other, <laughs> other 500. So it's uh, sometimes it's, uh, especially today, it's, uh, you don't really need to go or leave your family behind or whatever. You can be in New York at the same time and in Budapest at the same time. Okay. Oh, yeah, it was good to hear your opinion, not just about this migrate, mi migration, or, uh, because also before you were working in the Museum of Photography in Rotterdam, so you, you, you have another perspective on this and also a perspective on the near past of this migration of, of artists and photographers. Of course, from a point of view of Hungary, Netherlands is a very, very popular place to go. Many young photographers think that that is the place where they can really, really learn how, how the market and the system is, is working. Is it true? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's quite harsh to to see that uh, it almost becomes immoral to collaborate uh, on Hungarian pro uh, projects. So um, the, the two exhibitions I prepared, um, at some points I really had to convince the importance of, uh, of artists being presented here. And uh, I think this is quite problematic if we start to talk about, well, enforcing collaboration and exchange. This is something that's, uh, and of course, during the last days, the situation has become more edgy even. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, this is a very uh, strong reality we are in at the moment. And what about the students? So after graduation, which are the more, most popular uh, geographical direction they go. Do they see East Europe? Mm, I don't think that East Eastern Europe or Central Europe is, is that much uh, their, their focus. And I'm really uh, curious about the experience of uh, Kata Gaibo who returns this summer from The Hague and what she has to, to say about this, uh, this, this, this experience uh, over there. Um, I will, I will um, tell you a bit, uh, Carter Gable's uh, question a um, bit later, but first I, I would like to ask uh, Michaela, uh, am, am I right or do I remember right that uh, in the UK you, you, you said you didn't uh, learn too much about uh, Central European photography? Is, is that right that I remember well you said that? Uh, yeah, it was definitely more focused on uh, on uh, uh, the Western Western photography. So I did uh, my MA in uh, documentary photography and photojournalism. So the first half year was very much more about, uh, let's say, the the classical photojournalism. But we very much also discussed the, the current uh, themes that concern ethics in photojournalism and, uh, and ethics in documentary photography and uh, stuff like that. But it was much more concentrated on, uh, on the Western side, yes, for sure. Or uh, if we're talking about Europe-wise, even there more France, Germany, Italy, still more to the West, I did have a few uh, Polish classmates. I did have, um, I did have another fellow Slovak classmate. Uh, funny enough, which I totally didn't expect to have. Uh, but uh, I think we we really tried um, at some point uh, tried bringing in uh, photographers from Central and Eastern Europe, either to speak at uh, symposiums or just to learn a little bit more about about their work. Uh, which we managed to. I mean, they were really, really open to that. Uh, but I think they're not very. Uh, it wasn't. There wasn't a strong Eastern European community in our uh, in my class or in our uh, uh, in our MA. So. Okay. Thank you. So. Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, is that 
uh, when you say how many students go abroad, actually how many students come from abroad? That's, uh, I, I mean, Eastern Europe, uh, like the uh, Slovakia and Romania, and uh, even uh, Serbia uh, or Russia, they see who the best. <laughs> so it's, uh, for, for example, for a Romanian photographer, uh, Budapest is a is a interesting step. So and they are when they are in Budapest, they are not at home already, and and they and they move forward to wherever they want to go. So that's also a, an element that we didn't uh, mention. I, I I completely agree with that, and I think for Slovaks and Czechs. Uh, even mm, I was thinking of, depending on how long I stay uh, and last in Bratislava, not that I, not that I wouldn't want to, but um, yeah, it's, it's complicating, complicated like always. But uh, I think for Slovaks, uh, a lot of people go to Prague or Opava, uh, either to study photography or then continue their careers. Or Vienna is always an option because it is extremely close. The art scene is amazing uh more opportunities more galleries so yeah but budapest is definitely definitely another one on the on the list mark and david i'm wondering what what do you think or how would you comment this 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 migration tendency in art field i think it's not just uh, characteristic here in in middle europe this is uh, contributing somehow to this new new system or this is a necessity this is a must how, how far should an artist think in the global, global aspect when creating a project or how uh, or, or you was, or, or you believe that locality mm -hmm. is a kind of an authority for the artist? What do you think about it? Um, I think it's two things. I think like Mahela said that, you know, in education, so I'm currently living in the UK, um, experience there in the US and Australia and Netherlands and so on. I mean, it's, it's very much that that education is Western oriented to uh, a pretty common canon of photojournalism and documentary photography. Uh, so that's point one. Point two is, however, in the practice of it, I think there is kind of a global visual economy. Um, and we've seen much more uh, work by local photographers, indigenous photographers, um emerging both independent work but also you know actually in the big news agencies as well if you look at agence france press or reuters or whatever they rely on local photographers in their locations which which then raises the interesting point actually and that's why i think it's a global visual economy is that those local photographers are then kind of inculcated or interpolated into a visual language that's global for those news agencies and they're localness or the indigeneity doesn't necessarily transfer into their visual representation of certain events and so on. Um, and then, then the third thing is that there is a much more conscious effort to um, find and acknowledge uh, indigenous photographers. So again, from Mark's presentation, the Everyday Africa project, for example, and, and things like that. I think that there is a uh, in South Asia, for example, the Chobi Mela uh, festival is extremely significant. Um, and these have become international things. So you have the Western canon, you have a global visual economy, which, which is interpolating some local photographers into it. But then you have a recognition of greater diversity as well. But there's much more work to be done on the third point. Okay, hey, I, I would love to uh, mediate a question of Kata Geiber, who's a talented photographer and also a, uh, uh, one of the artists of the exhibition. So Kata wrote, hello everyone, thank you for the thought provoking discussions. I have noticed that you very often use the language of marketing when talking about artworks, branding, target, audience, industry, business. I'm curious uh, how you see this kind of marketization taking over the art world, especially in the field of photography, which is uh, highly linked to commercial world. What are the downsides of uh, such marketization? So uh, this uh, goes to Mark and, uh, and David. 
Um, well, I think if you look specifically at, at, at the art market, it's already extremely commercialized. Um, uh, any, any art, if you go to any art uh, auction, uh, the, 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 I don't know what the prices of, of, of how they are created. It's, it seemed, it, it's supposed to be an open market. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, outside influence. But I'm not saying that, uh, and I think David said as well, it's not our aim with our research to show that we have to go into a liberal capitalist economy, but it does, the, 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 we have to establish, I think it makes sense to establish value and to, to uh, learn from and to use the terminology of marketing, of branding, not because they, as, as, as goals in themselves, but they, they can be used as a means to an end. And the means is, or, or the end is to, to, to reach, to actually reach an audience. And the, the, the ideas and the concepts behind marketing, behind, behind branding, by understanding how a market functions, that there's not just an audience, but that there are customers, that there's influencers, that there are intermediaries, that there are, um, um, uh, promoters of work, all those roles, everybody plays a different role within the market and to understand which channels one can use to more effectively reach one's own market is not a bad thing. I, I, I don't think marketing is bad necessarily. I don't think branding is a bad thing, um, I, but it's not a goal in itself. It's a means to an end. And I think if you know why you do it if you have a very clear idea of why you tell the story if you have a strong narrative if you have a strong purpose marketing and branding and 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 using these kind of concepts can be a, a great tool to more effectively reach your goal i hope that answers the question any more comments then um daniela you wrote a question I, um, I also have a question. Um, it's a little bit related to the previous topic, which is, uh, which was about the narrative that uh, practitioners use. And uh, my question is, um, uh, do you think in your personal opinion to, I will ask all lecturers if you want to respond, um, is there a responsibility for practitioners to follow a certain kind of maybe a central European narrative uh, when somebody is making work about uh, like historical matter or or do you think uh, if it if it is uh, if it is possible even to differentiate and do you think is there a responsibility I think I guess that's my question. <laughs> begin yeah you. okay so it's i think it's a very important very inter interesting question because of the fact that um that they are insiders and outsiders and we are we are in this case we are speaking of the insiders so it means that we who are central europeans i'm not an artist uh, we if, if we should we should follow uh, the central european narrative but i would but I would, um, how do you call it? But I would, um, but I would say like, um, smile on each other and understanding each other without words. To see an image from Slovakia's past and, and smile that, haha, we also had the same kind of qualities in a bus stop or whatever, on a clothing or whatever, on the countryside here in Hungary. So we all kind of, we all know together what happened. It's an inside narrative. And this is very, very interesting how, how you present this kind of things outside the territory for an artist who is who, who is not, not uh, who has not grown up here or for a specialist who has not grown up here. What I experienced that of course, basically they, an outsider see like uh, humor, see irony, maybe see some kind of bitterness or, um, or uh, uh, uncivilized civilized communities on these photographs. And, um, and the, re the responsibility, I think, is not 
especially the insider or the outsider position, but I think that the responsibility is how we communicate these projects, how we tell the story to be precise in what we would like to say with that. I think that that is the that is the point, and this is how I, how I also experience, experience it many times that that if I have to explain about an artist who is very much inside the, the local Central European communities, I have to describe it more detailed than to each other to make it absolutely clear what the artist or what what the artist would like to say or what I would like to say with with participating that artist in certain certain situation. Yeah, maybe maybe I will follow just okay. like I give for the others. I may add something to this because I, I think this question is uh, very important for the end of our uh, conference and it's kind of like bringing us back to the uh, beginning of this uh, whole project. And of course, this question is in a way very important and very ridiculous because if you would like to ask this question in the United States, uh, to the photographers in the class down there, if they have to be American uh, in their photography, it wouldn't make sense. They are all having no problems with doing uh, things uh, concerning, you know, the American photography and American uh, identity and the problems that they have in in the United States. Same would be, I guess, in uh, in those you know major Western countries. But this identity of Central Europe is very shaky. It's very uh, kind of, um, you know, overshadowed by other, uh, let's say, stronger cultural identities. So there is always like these negotiations or, or this kind of, of feeling insecure. Uh, and, and, and I think this is important to work with this and to somehow try to uh, find your own way to, uh, to be uh, this, uh, not only Hungarian, but maybe like European or ce Central European photographer. So this is what I wanted, for example, to show in this uh, several of projects of um, uh, people who were studying, for example, in uh, the UK or in Germany or, or in Sweden and were coming back to, uh, to Central Europe to see it from anew. Uh, and this is, like a, this is like an important moment that they realize that this is their, uh, let's say, um, hometown or like uh, in case of uh, Hanslova, you know, the village. And this is really something very authentic and, uh, and then it makes sense and it's becoming also a, a sort of maybe not universal but more universal um, uh, experience. So, um, uh, uh, so this is like I, maybe how I would answer this, uh, this very important question, you know, that you know, this is something that you have to work with, uh, with this identity. I, I would like to also add one more thing concerning this teaching and this universities and this East-West uh, canon thing, because I think this is also important that the problem is not that in the UK or in France, they don't teach, you know, Ukrainian photography or Polish or Hungarian photography, because, you know, of course, why they should do this. The problem is that the photography, for example, the Hungarian photography or Ukrainian photography or Lithuanian photography uh, or Czech and Slovak photography is not taught uh, in a proper way uh, in here. So the people are, you know, studying this, let's say, Charlotte Cotton, but they don't know what, you know, the other photographers uh, from their, you know, neighboring countries uh, are doing. So uh, basically, you know, I was trying to change this uh, curriculum at my university and we simply trashed uh, Charlotte Cotton, which is a brilliant example of this, you know, Anglo-Saxon, you know, post-colonial kind of dominating narrative. Uh, overarching the whole, you know, new canon in a way, in a, like a very politically correct way. But basically then you see all the gaps, you know. So then you can see also, for example, what the Hungarian photography is or what the Ukrainian photography is and how it is standing out of this, uh, uh, let's say, Western uh, oriented uh, canon. So I guess this is also like uh, for us a sort of, a sort of task to, to invent or to to construct this sort of uh, narration uh, about the, the countries or the, the, this region and the history of this region, also photography, what it would be like to have this sort of canon uh, and not written in other like places or like capitals, but um, in here uh, and somehow uh, something that we would be negotiating and uh, discussing uh, a bit like we do in this conference so, you know, uh, I'm not a Hungarian, so I'm, a, I'm an optimistic uh, kind of uh, 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 person. And I'm very happy that Hungarians being always pessimistic organized this uh, 
uh, uh, this event uh, and pushed us to, to, you know, to think about uh, what we should do. So, uh, Gabor, I wouldn't, I wouldn't surrender. I wouldn't give up, and I wouldn't be, you know, depressed. But I would uh, treat this as a kind of Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, thinking yeah. about your work and Peter and uh, Kleniansky and other Hungarian photographers and uh, Gabor Oz and what uh, what you are doing as a, as really, you know, it makes sense. And you know, the Hungarian photography is such a great lesson. You know, with these people, it's not a problem that the Hungarians are moving out. Look. All the great photographers from Hungary were moving out at some point. It's not a problem, really. So, you know, but this is, there is so much of experience uh, that we can discuss when it comes to this photograph. So I wouldn't like finish this conference with like saying, oh, Hungarians are leaving, you know, it's <laughs> such a bad uh, situation. <laughs> there is a censorship and uh, nobody wants to publish us. We don't have a museum. We don't have festivals. What we should do, you know. It's not like this. Look at the history. This great photographers from the Hungarian neo avant-garde. They were establishing their own private network, doing kind of some is that uh, underground things. You know, the same was um, uh, in the twenties and thirties when the these avant-garde guys were trying to do some commercial things, uh, uh, which are now considered one of the you know best examples of art of the time. So you know, let, let's stick to this. Uh, so I really think that uh, there is a, a lot of positive energy in this um, uh, in this uh, uh, conference and this question like the the one posted by Daniela, it may sound like pessimistic, but it may be like a you know like a task, like a challenge. What what it is? So I'm asking you, what does it mean to you? You know, to be a, a Central European photographer, or how? What kind of narrative you are doing? And like looking at those guys that we are like uh, showing uh, yesterday and uh, and today, I think there are marvelous examples of people who uh, can present like uh, really interesting stories, um, and they are like embedded in this in our sphere. Let's say Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, or Ukraine, and they may represent their agenda and also represent uh, like a new vision of photography coming from this uh, particular uh, part of, uh, of the world. Uh, Adam. Was it, was it positive enough? This was positive I'm, enough? I'm super optimistic, okay, Adam. So <laughs> if, you, if, you if it felt pessimistic, then uh, I probably pronounced yeah, the yeah, things kind wrong. Of, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, okay. I felt this, you know, this Budapest spleen. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I was thinking about this uh, uh, Daniela's question, and uh, and what do we do? We consider uh, Central European photography uh, outsider photography when they come to photograph here uh, the border fences, or th does it become Central European photography, uh, which the author is of course not wasn't born here, but the topic is uh, connects the project here. Or you as a, uh, 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 from, uh, I think you're from Russia, right, uh, Daniela? Uh, is this so? just half Russian. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's, um, it, it is also, I think it's also also, also a question if, if someone from here is doing uh, another topic, why wouldn't we call it? So I think it's, uh, um, it's only, it's only the, uh, what is interesting, I think, is, uh, is that is if there is a characteristic and I don't, and I don't uh, really uh, feel that the topic or the story that we want to show has to be uh, I think there is a, there is enough cultural uh, uh, how to say uh, value uh, in the way how we look at the world that it makes it Central European and it doesn't the topic I don't I don't think that it has to be Central European. Attila, please. I'd like to comment on what Adam said, actually, because it reminded me of uh, 
not, not, not being not just being positive because it's always good to be positive. And uh, honestly, you're absolutely right. We have reasons to be positive because we have all of us, I think, who, who do teach have interesting students and um, they can do interesting work and um, they can collaborate within the European Union, uh, within this region, within V4, whatever, uh, in various ways. So it's, it's, it's already sort of um, uh, cause for, for, for being sort of positive and, and, and forward looking. Also, what you were mentioning concerning trashing Charlotte Coton, I would trash actually Charlotte Coton anyways, because I, 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 I not just because it's, uh, it is um, post-colonial in, in many ways, yet tries to be very um, sort of, um, yeah, civilized. But at the same time, because it is so superficial, it's just not digging deep enough into what really is photography as contemporary art. It's just very, very superficial. So I was just bringing it up because I thought it was something that, you know, pops up everywhere. But I'm absolutely in agreement with you, you know, in the direction that we should, we should um, follow actually your countryman's Piotr Piotrovsky's idea concerning uh, a horizontal art history regarding horizontal history of photography, understanding of photography that would not look at Paris or London or Berlin or New York or whatever as the center and would define itself as a periphery, but would rather concentrate on horizontal sort of connections um, so not look up to Paris, but would look at the same level to Prague and to Bratislava and uh, or Vienna or whatever, and would try to show how much influence these spaces, these locations actually had on art that was produced in um, the canonized local uh, localities. This is a work he was doing uh, while he was alive and, and, and is still, I think, in the air. It is something that needs to be done. However, it needs, um, it's, it's not, not something, yeah, on the one hand, it is something that we can always do like such a collaboration, but if it really wants to grow, it again needs to have some background, institutional background. It needs um, strength. And on that side, I am sometimes a little pessimistic. But true, we need to do this. And we need to uh, work out our own uh, networks and our own understanding of our own history and show how much, how, how important it is and how different it is from the canonized narrative and also how much the canonized narrative gained from this. But at the same time, it is, yeah, the question is what exactly is what we want to achieve? Because when you re were referring to um, people in the 60s and 70s who were politically unable to produce work that was shown sort of publicly, and we're making like uh, Arpul and Galantai, you know, um, and having this um, various postal flu fluxus art type of things. Yeah, but that was um, because there was no, um, uh, no possibility, whatever, of showing their own works. It was just because there was a serious political um, um, depression basically in these countries and, and, and they found ways to again hack the system and, and, and do something. Had this not been the case, they would have liked to show their work actually in Vienna, Berlin or elsewhere. So it was, 
Besides, uh, um, because of not having proper ways to show works, it was something that was um, that was um, that was helping them. But as artists, most of them, I suppose, would have liked to go over this sort of horizontal networking thing and become individual artists, because in some ways it is within this. Um, Western tradition that we are individuals and we try to grow ourselves and, and become, you know, indistinguishable. And this brings me to my last point, which is trouble is that the art world itself is pretty much a Western uh, invention, like it or not. We cannot really have an art world that is not emulating basically the way it works in, in, in Western countries. We can do all sorts of things. We can collaborate all sorts of ways, but in the end, it is really the way um, it was basically invented. Well, perhaps sometimes starting in the 1910s and 20s with the gallery system appearing, but really after the 60s and 70s, when there was money that went into this whole story. And it just can, you cannot just take it out of the, 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 the picture as yet. So you can think globally in many ways, but once you want to make it, and I'm, I'm consciously uh, not saying make it what, but you try to make it, that is, you try to be successful, you just cannot elude, you just cannot avoid um, the Western art world. And that is, that comes actually with centers, financial centers, and peripheries. So, and that, that is, I believe, um, the balance, the bigger picture that you need to see. So on the one hand, it is great to do autonomous work, you know, in your studio, in, around you, show it in various ways, okay? It is great to have the region come to see your work and you go to see their work, it strengthens the region in many, many ways. But in the end, um, when you think about making it, at least, and, and I know very few artists actually who wouldn't want to make it, you know, internationally, it's just almost impossible uh, to discount this Western art world. And that's the, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the dilemma here. Uh, so maybe I will briefly take this uh, comment. Uh, thank you for this. I think this is super important. And of course, uh, Piotr uh, was a friend of mine. And this is actually why I work in Poznan uh, down there. And he's like, um, his heritage and his uh, influence is still in the air. So, uh, and of course, like Magda Radomska is working with me. So she's like uh, also writing about uh, Hungarian art. Uh, and, and this is this connection that we kind of, uh, I think should somehow announce, uh, uh, but you know, basically, I I, I think you are you are right, but the, um, yes and no, because uh, if the guys were if the artists of the sixties and seventies were forced to do this uh, and somehow couldn't uh, cross this uh, uh, you know iron curtain in a way, uh, uh, but basically this these connections were, uh, were 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 true, they were authentic. So this is what actually made them very interesting and inspiring because they, and it's very much like in Latin America in, in the very same time, they were kind of alternative network to this, you know, uh, London, Paris, New York system. And this is also showing how this art world, and I agree that this is this Western modernity, uh, you know, kind of system representing this, uh, you know, achievements or uh, failings also. Uh, but now it's it's very much redefined, like Piotr was redefining this. So maybe uh, it might happen that the centers are no longer that important for the for art and for culture and so on. And you are trying to find a whole new model, especially now, like after even this uh, lockdown and uh, the COVID, you know, when you cannot travel the, the system of this big uh, uh, art fairs, biennials, you know, it's, 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 it's collapsing, right? So, uh, so this is, I think, also the moment uh, of reflection, and it might not be uh, like it used to be uh, in future. So I think this is also why this horizontal perspective and also like trying to find this uh, authentic um, contacts and connections, like uh, 
like we have this history of the sort of meetings like in 80s, 70s, but also in, you know, 30s and 20s. So this is like the whole history that is uh, kind of uh, unwritten, but it's slowly we know more and more about what happened. So this is, this is I think, very, very important point. Uh, and I'm happy that you, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Piotr. This is, this is really brilliant. So thank you for this. And I, and I would be, again, like, uh, uh, like he was writing that this it makes sense and this is not only about history of art but it also is opening um, a certain perspective for this uh, new time so to speak uh, with the new definition of the art world and photography world uh, uh, included so uh, thank you for thank this you. once again thank you Attila and thank you Adam and uh, Mark you just yeah yeah just one, one thing um, it, it's 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 uh, it's not a direct response to anything that's said, but uh, I've worked a lot in West Africa. I was uh, art director for a photo festival in Lagos, Nigeria, and I actually started a photo festival together with a group of people in, in Ghana in, in, uh, uh, th throughout the country. And due to COVID, that has all kind of been cancelled, but at least we had one edition. And um, uh, in, in a way, I think the, 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 the sense of not being part of the center uh, and not being part of, of the West is, is, is a sentiment that is obviously very strong in, in West Africa. And I had a lot of photographers coming up to me and say, how can we work with for Western media and, and, and also a lot of Western organizations saying, how can we get those, for those photographers to work for, uh, how can we reach them? How can we make those photographers connect to Western institutions? And through my experience working there and, and, and setting up well, wor working with, I didn't set up myself, but working with these organizations when, when they were starting, I noticed something very different, very, very interesting. And that's when we started Lagos Photo, it was not the point to create an audience in Amsterdam or in, 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 in London. What we were trying to do is actually create a local infrastructure or let's say a national infrastructure for visual culture. And, and the photographers that we worked with, 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 with Nuku, in, in Accra, where we worked with, with photographers from, from northern Ghana, from Tamale, but also from, from Accra, of course. We never told them, now try and go out and, and, and connect to the New York Times or, or try to convince The Guardian. No, create your own infrastructure for visual culture. Start a festival. We started a festival. And, and especially in Lagos, where the festival has been around now for, I think, 12, 13 years, you actually see that, that this infrastructure is being built. There are no museums for photography. There is not even a, a governmental system to support the arts at all. There are no cultural institutions. There are no. There is actually nothing of the sort. But starting with this festival helped create and help nurture local talents, local initiatives. And I think the the, the experience in, in in Bangladesh, where Shahidul Alam started first Drake Agency and then Pachala or the other way around, I don't know the exact order, then started the festival of Chobi Mela. Again, in, in Bangladesh, there's a thriving group of photographers, of videographers, of storytellers. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, just very interesting to see that, that if Attila says, oh, we don't, we don't, have, the, we don't have the institutions and, and the global art market. Yes, it, I, 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 I agree. And I, to a certain extent, I can't even judge. But when I hear a, a photographer from Accra telling me, Mark, I don't want to work for the New York Times. They pay 150 a day. Why should I work for them? I just find my own client here. And they actually create books. They find their own audience. There is a thriving art market in Accra. There is Ga Gallery 1957, which is tremendously successful. And then, sure, they also join into the international system of, 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 of art fairs and all that. But their main market is not in New York or in Amsterdam. Their main market is in Accra, is in Lagos, is in, in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire. They are actually creating a, a local infrastructure for visual culture, for lack of a better word. And I think that's a very valuable experience uh, that, that I was luckily and, and honored and, and to, to, to be kind of you know, part of in, in, in a very small way. Um, but I also, I mean, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And, and obviously in the Netherlands, we have a lot, we, we've got, I don't know, the, the, the most photo museums per capita or, or something like that. But obviously people are complaining about the, the, the financial system here too. 
because the finances are limited and, and photography doesn't have a role in governmental uh, uh, policy, culture was completely ignored during the entire COVID crisis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not comparing any of these situations, but I think it's important to notice that it's also up to the actors not to look abroad because that's where the future is, but to very much create your own culture and your own network because that's where uh, that's where the actual solution uh, might actually be. Anyway, that's just one, something I wanted to share. Thank you very much. This is uh, very, very nice. And I would like to um, thank all the lecturers uh, and the contributions uh, for today. And uh, before I uh, give the uh, word to Joat and Darion, um, I, I also would like to uh, thank you the management work for Coin of Eva and the Fabric team and the, the technical support for Akos Zaison and um, for the communication uh, to Arion and uh, Greenback Daniela. So thank you very much for helping us with uh, organizing uh, this uh, symposium. So um, last uh, conclusion by uh, Joat and Arion. Oh, I would I would give the word to Arion because he's the is the Mome, it's from the Mome side. I also just would like to thank for everybody for, for this enthusiasm and all, all this effort, what you did it's very hot weekend for us. And I think that it was meaningful as far as we, we concluded already yesterday. Marion, last words for you. Well, I hope that, uh, I hope that there are opinions and, and, and sentences that are stuck within <laughs> and uh, and we can continue uh, right now as we uh, yesterday successfully started the symposium we already decided that there's going to be a next one uh, and hopefully not 10 years ago uh, 10 years later but uh, but maybe in the coming semester and for that i would like to uh, first i would like to ask to all the all the presenters and all, all the all the all the everyone from the audience uh, but I would like to ask you, the presenters, to, to think about who would you discuss the subject or the topic of Central European photography further. So who should we open the gate for? Who should we invite for the next symposium? And I think it's, um, it's somewhat imitates what George Petraini was showing with the documentum uh, uh series that there is always one more one more uh person to include and 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 at the end hopefully we will have a, a big enough community that we are uh how to say we can find our way uh and we don't have to knock on the neighbor's door <laughs> I don't know if I said it right or not, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, was a, it was a real uh, pleasure and honor to listen to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Shame Seeing you. Beer <laughs> I'm sorry? It's a shame we cannot drink a beer together now. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, really. Virtually. Next time, hopefully. Cheers. <laughs>